one, part one, and this chapter is titled, A Star Pupil. The author begins by saying Chris was born on May the 16th, 1985, in Fayetteville, North Carolina. Chris being the second child to Ronnie and Cindy Watts, and Jamie, his sister, being the first, was six and a half years older than Chris. Um, it goes on to say Chris always idolized his dad, who was a very quiet man. Ronnie was well reserved and very quiet and just a man of few words. He's just a simple man. Ronnie and Chris was very close and they went to basketball and football games together all of the time throughout Chris's high school and elementary years. And they even went to more than 200 NASCAR races together, including the Daytona 500. Ronnie taught Chris how to work on cars and then soon learned that Chris had a very natural talent for mechanics. And then Jamie, on the other hand, she was more like her mom. She was outgoing and more social, and so Chris took after Ronnie, being quiet and shy. In school, he was very athletic, and he played in sports and won very many trophies. And ironically, his parents still display his trophies in their home until this day. Ronnie always was Chris's biggest fan. He was always on the sideline at all of the sporting events that Chris had a part in. Ronnie was always there cheering him on from the sidelines. Another person in Chris's immediate family that he was so very close to and had a really tight bond with was his grandmother. And that was his grandmother on his mom's side, his maternal grandmother. And she would pick them up from school when Chris was still in elementary and of course Jamie was in high school. And Jamie was one that it take her a long time to get out to the car. And of course Chris, him being in elementary, he just ran straight out to the car and he's ready to go home. But then there was Jamie, who kind of stayed behind and had to tell all of her friends bye and, and all that before she actually made it out to the car. So, while Chris and his grandma was waiting in the car on Jamie, um, his grandmother would, like, quiz him and give him tests on the state capitals. And it wasn't long before Chris had memorized, you know, all of the state capitals in America. And she had started working on mem him memorizing the capitals of Europe as well, which he had almost completed that as well. So him and his grandmother had a very tight bond, and she was kind of like a mentor to him and a tutor to him during the times that they just spent together and just to kill time and have a little fun, she would quiz him on things. It goes on to say when Chris was 14 is when he started at Pine Forest High School and said when he started there, he became pretty withdrawn and depressed to begin with because um, the other classmates there, they kind of just ignored him and kind of looked at him like he was awkward. There's a simple fact that he was so shy and withdrawn and he never spoke to anyone. Um, they just kind of ignored him like he wasn't there and that kind of put him in, into like a withdrawn state. His sister Jamie actually said that he just never went out anywhere. He never went anywhere, never went out with friends, and the only thing he ever did was just focus on his grades and cars. Chris ended up taking a class in automotives. His instructor's name was Mr. Judy, and Judy called Chris his star pupil. In an interview, Judy also said it's really hard to find a more perfect kid than Chris is. He was always very quiet and introverted, yet he was extremely polite and courteous to everyone. He said he had a bowl haircut and he wore braces and he was kind of tall and gangly, but he had like this encyclopedia knowledge of automobiles and NASCAR, everything, mechanics. Chris would spend many hours in his bedroom just reading and studying about nothing but NASCAR and mechanics. His instructor said he had a photographic memory. He could recite anything that you ask him about NASCAR straight from just his memory. Mr. Judy also noticed that Chris was very isolated. And, you know, within those years, he, Mr. Judy, you know, I'm sure would see the teenage kids and their crushes and, you know, everyone trying to hook up with everyone, but that wasn't like that with Chris at all. He said... Chris never even spoke to a girl or had a girlfriend, even though he said most of the girls, and he saw it and heard it himself, they all had huge crushes on Chris. But Chris was just so shy and awkward, he didn't even acknowledge it. And Mr. Judy also said, you know, I always wondered about that. He said, I would look at Chris and I would just wonder what was really going on in his head because it was like all of the wheels were spinning, but Chris was just there by himself. There was one girl he did become close to in high school, Brandy Smith. Brandy says that he was always so gentle and smart, saying most of their talks was only about music and stuff like that. She also said she was sort of an outcast at school, and 
Chris just seemed to understand her. He never judged her, and they were friends from the very start. Also, one of the members from the football team that Chris was on, and we will just call him Lance, Lance said that he had never seen Chris get uptight or the least bit angry. Even when the rest of the whole team was upset, mad, discouraged, disgusted, Chris was always the one that was just always laid back and easygoing. He never complained, and he was quoted saying, quote, he would not hurt a fly, unquote. Chris's photos appeared frequently in the high school yearbook under many various tech and accomplishment headings. One was about cars, where he was asked, quote, is American cars better than foreign cars, unquote. And Chris answers by saying, quote, American sports cars, because Fords are made in America, unquote. Ronnie had bought Chris a Mustang that he was driving back and forth to school. And this Mustang, Ronnie and Chris worked on together, and they kind of done it like a project, and they fixed the car up. And so that is what Chris was driving back and forth to school, was his Mustang. And the author that goes on to say that everyone said Chris was just a great kid. He never caused any trouble, or he never rebelled at all, unlike Jamie, Chris's sister, who did rebel as a teen. Jamie says she often wondered herself if there may be something wrong with Chris because he was just so obsessive and in serious control of his anger. He just never got mad. And Jamie went on to say, to be honest, I honestly thought Chris was autistic. He always had to have everything in order, from the way he ate all the way to the way he said his prayers at night. They had to be in a certain order. And it was very hard and almost impossible, she said, to hold any kind of conversation with her brother unless it was something to do with cars. It goes on to say in 2003, Chris and another student in Mr. Judy's class went to Winston-Salem for a competition in a North Carolina state auto competition. They had to do hands-on work. It was not just book work. This was a hands-on competition. There's a photo of Chris working on an engine during the competition while being interviewed. And Chris said in the interview, when I was a kid, I went to car shows and my dream car is a 1969 Boss 429 Mustang. Pine Forest Group finished third place in the competition. Later that year, in May of 2003, Chris graduated school at Pine Forest. His yearbook photo, he is wearing a black tuxedo with a bow tie. He was too shy to even ask anyone to the prom. So, one of the girls that had a crush on him asked him to go to the prom with her, and he accepted. Chris actually won a $1,000 scholarship to NASCAR Tech in Mooresville, North Carolina. His teacher, Mr. Judy, said, that kid will go far. He has everything going for him. He also said that he told Chris, if I've ever had a student that is going to be successful, Chris, it is you. Judy also said, I was positive I would read about him one day being a crew chief of a NASCAR team. That summer, in 2003, Chris left home for college at NASCAR. He was 120 miles away from home for the first time in Charlotte, North Carolina. His parents would pay his rent until he got a job and he got on his feet. His mom was quoted saying he had to buy groceries and car insurance and things like that. Chris got a part-time job at a Ford dealership in Mooresville and roommated with another NASCAR college student named Richard Hodges. Okay, on a side note, Richard Hodges was given a interview by CBI about, you know, Chris's characteristics and such when he knew him because they were roommates for um, two, three, four years. So Richard knew him, you know, pretty good. So... And we do have that interview on the channel, and I will link it at the end of this. I do have some photos in it that you may want to look at, but yeah. Richard said, quote, he was straight as an arrow. He was very dedicated to his work. Chris wasn't the kind of guy that went out and partied while the rest of us were out almost every night drinking and just having fun. Chris would just stay in his room studying. He was very reserved, and he didn't just walk up to people and start making conversation. He never really just tried to make friends. Jamie also moved out around the same time Chris did. She got married, though, and now Ronnie and Cindy had an empty nest. Chris rarely went and visited his parents. He was dedicated to his school and, and his job in Mooresville. Meanwhile, back at their home, Chris's dad, Ronnie, was falling apart. Ronnie had been so used to spending all of his free time with Chris and attending everything together with him. And now Chris was gone, and he rarely ever even visited at all. Ronnie and Cindy barely ever even seen Chris. Ronnie was lost. It was like he had literally lost his best friend. When Chris left home at 18 after graduation, he never went back. 
Chris said, quote, I just never went back, and I think that hit my dad real hard. He was so used to me being there, unquote. Chris goes on to say, he is my hero. He's my best friend. During this time, Ronnie secretly began using cocaine just to numb his feelings, his feelings and depression of not having Chris at home and the emptiness of missing their friendship and time together. Cindy actually started thinking that he was having an affair because Ronnie was spending so much money on the drug. Cindy even asked Ronnie, quote, do you have another family or something? Because we should have money in the bank, unquote. Ronnie finally confessed that he was addicted to cocaine because of the deep depression he had when Chris left home. Cindy said, quote, it completely shocked me because I trusted him. I put him on a pedestal and I thought he could do no wrong. I guess when Chris left, he just could not cope. And Ronnie does not talk about his feelings or let them show, unquote. Cindy called Jamie, Chris, and Ronnie together and they had like a family meeting. Chris said he knew something wasn't right as soon as he saw his dad. His dad had lost weight and his face showed the weight loss as well as the depression. And he learned that his nose had been bleeding all the time. Chris asked his dad to stop, and Ronnie said he would, and he did. Cindy said, he just quit. He stopped right then and there. In 2006, at 20 years old, Chris graduated the NASCAR Institute with honors and started work at Mooresville Ford as a service technician full-time. He was making really good money, but his heart and dreams were still to be with NASCAR. So, he sent off many applications to NASCAR. He only got one interview and that went to a dead end and nowhere. Chris remained employed full-time at the Ford dealership and he bought a 2006 Ford Mustang. Even though he had those dreams of NASCAR and they had not happened yet, he continued to work at Ford and he never complained. He bought a toolbox and started buying tools for it. During this time, he met a girl and he started his first ever relationship or what he thought may be a relationship. But she was just getting out of a bad divorce. Chris had never even brought her to his own hometown to meet his family, so they never had the opportunity to meet or see her. The relationship ended when she stopped contacting Chris and just started going out with someone else. Chris said, quote, I was like, oh well, nice to know I was a rebound, unquote, but still showing no anger or resentment towards the girl. Later on, Chris's cousin, Nicole Kennedy, told him that he should friend the girl that she worked with, and her name is Shanann Rusick. She went on to say that Shanann was also recently divorced from a very bad marriage. Chris finally got up the nerve to send her that friend's request, but it was months before he would even get a reply from it. It's titled, Very Insecure. And it starts out by saying Shanann Catherine Rosek. And how Shanann actually got her name was from the popular group that was actually in Woodstock in 1969 called Sha Na Na saying she was born January the 10th, 1984, in New Jersey. And then about two years later, her little brother Frankie was born, and that completed the family. There was Nell, Frank, Sandy, Shanann, and Frankie Rusick. Shanann was very outgoing. She was vibrant, charismatic, um, extremely intelligent, but she was very sickly, meant very much of her childhood. And... She was like constantly needing some kind of medical attention. Her dad said when she was a baby, they had to take her around to many different doctors because she always had like migraine headaches. Her dad said she even had to visit even brain surgeons and they had her on some really strong pain pills and even had to take shots for these migraines she had as a child. In elementary, she went to a school called Number 11 Lakeview and her and Frankie always had a really strong bond with each other. And Frankie is quoted as saying, quote, we were pretty close. She would tell me things that she wouldn't tell our parents, unquote. But at school, Shanann had a very low self-esteem, and she was bullied a lot, and Frankie would always defend her. He was always coming to her defense because she got bullied quite often in school, and she was very insecure. And then some years later, Shanann finally came out and said, quote, people were mean to me. They picked on me, and they said really bad things to me and I was never the popular kid at school, unquote. It was around 1999, and Frank and Sandy moved their family to Aberdeen, North Carolina, where it seemed like the work was going to be better. Um, Frank started his own, like, a home improvement business, and Sandy went to work in a beauty salon. Sandy was a very good beautician and hairstylist, and she hoped that one day she could open 
her own salon. When Shanann was 14 and a freshman at Pinecrest High School, Shanann actually took a class of Matt Francis, that was the instructor's name, and it was a theater class, like a drama club. At the time, Matt Francis was 25 years old, and so the students actually looked up to him because he wasn't old. He was even closer to their age, and he had a deep passion for drama and theater. And that class is what changed Shanann's life and whole outlook on life. She started gaining confidence. Her self-esteem got so much better, and she actually started making different friends, new friends, and she just, at this point, had a whole new set of friends, and they all shared the same love of theater. Matt Francis, the teacher, which I also have his interview, at, and I'm going to link it at the end of this video as well, he is quoted as saying, when I met Shanann, she was very shy, insecure, and really didn't have any friends. With all the odds stacked against her and her feelings and self-image, she was brave enough to jump on up and sign up to take that class. He said there was like 40 students in that class, and soon, even though Shanann was very shy and kind of withdrawn, she had to actually prove herself in that class of 40 students. And with her being with this group of people that was so much more outgoing than she was, but when she started realizing that all of these other people actually did care about her, he says that's when she started to thrive. And then Shanann became really close with Colby and Claire, also students of the theater class. And we were just friends all throughout high school, Colby said. He said that Shanann was really one of the sweetest girls you could ever meet. And even though Shanann was getting active in the acting and the whole drama scene of the theater, it wasn't long until Matt Francis noticed and realized that Shanann's actual talent was more so towards behind the scenes. She was amazing at the way she decorated and fixed the scenes up for the plays and such as that. She just had an amazing knack and talent for decorating. They would just spend hours and hours working on things and through all this and spending so much time together, Shanann and her drama teacher, Matt Francis, became very close. Her friend Claire is quoted as saying that Mr. Francis just connected with her on a mental ability, whereas I was just more like a classmate. And Shanann was seen in Matt Francis's office many, many days after school, and that is where she would open up to Mr. Francis about her terrible home life. She had told um, Mr. Francis that her parents were going through a terrible, bad divorce. And although the Rosicks never did divorce, they're still married and have been married for almost 39 years. Matt Francis said that Shanann told him that she kind of felt alone and she really didn't get any attention from her dad that she really craved and wanted. He goes on to say that he believes there was a lot of hurt and frustration in her parents' divorce. And Colby, Shanann's other friend, also knew about Shanann having problems at home. Colby said there was a lot of problems, and he didn't really want to come out and say that Frank wasn't a good father figure, um, he said, but Shanann did spend a lot of time at his house, and he said, that I'll just put it to you that way. I don't want to say that there was problems, and she needed a father figure, but yeah, she was at my house quite a lot. Colby said that their softball team that Shanann was a part of um, after school, they would just kind of hang out or whatever, and Shanann was always like the mother hen of their team. She was always the responsible one of everyone and tried to keep things in order and in line and everything running smoothly. But another thing is Shanann also missed a lot of school days. She was absent quite a lot due to the medical problems she had, which she stayed kind of secret about. By her sophomore year, they were in the drama class, they were planning the play, Little Shop of Horrors, and Shanann was just busy and fixing everything up and making sure everything was in order, and Matt Francis said, Shanann was my rock. She was even the stage manager, and she was always helping the tech crew, and she was amazing with all of the actors. Shanann actually was viewing and looking at her whole theater group as like a safe haven. She would work late and stay late hours just painting on the sets. Francis said that they had a lot of fun during those days and Shanann was notorious about running up to Backyard Burger and getting everyone dinner and bringing it back and there was one time when one of the students actually spilt water 
on their pants and they were kind of self-conscious about it. So Shanann just took water herself and poured it all over her crotch and that got everybody else laughing and so Shanann done that so this other student wouldn't feel awkward for having water on him. And before it was all said and done, everyone, all of the actors had water poured on them somewhere. And Shanann just didn't want this other person just to feel singled out and being the only one with the water on them. So she actually made a joke of it and everybody ended up with water all over them. When Shanann was a junior in high school, she also helped um, with the yearbook that year. When school was out for the summer that year, she found her a part-time job at a pizzeria in Pinehurst, North Carolina. That is where she met Morgan. Morgan was actually two years uh, ahead of her in high school, and her and Morgan became really good friends. Morgan said she had saw Shanann at school, but she just seemed so shy and withdrawn, you know. But she said when they started working together, Shanann just opened up and they become really fast friends. And she said Shanann would spend the night with her sometimes. They would go bowling. They talked a lot. They would go get their nails done together. But it was also during this time that Shanann was seen and known to be spending a lot of time in Matt Francis's office. So much time and seen together so much that the principal actually came in and was like, what's going on with this? And so the principal just stepped in and said, no, we're going to send you to a actual counselor because Matt Francis is not a counselor. We're going to send you to an actual counselor. But Shanann didn't do that. She just continued to go see Matt Francis, who she took as her very special confidant. Francis is quoted as saying, she just trusted me, unquote. And Shanann knew that I really did care. Shanann did not trust guidance counselors, so I would just listen. And then in 2002, Matt Francis actually left Pinecrest High School and got married. At the time, Shanann was 18 years old, and she wrote him a very heartfelt letter saying that she would never forget him. You, I have on the channel that I'm going to link at the end of this, that letter is actually read that they're referring to here. And she actually told him in the letter that he had been like a father figure to her, even more than her own father was. In Shanann's senior year, she started dating another high school student named Leonard King, but it was like a such a fast, whirlwind kind of relationship. And by the time Shanann graduated, they were already engaged and planning their future. And then it wasn't long after she graduated that her and Leonard King did get married. Her friends were like thinking she was just way too young to get married and she needed to wait and see more of life before she actually tried to settle down and get married. But Shanann, once she set her mind to do something, she did it. So she did. She went ahead and got married to Leonard King. After they got married, Leonard joined the Army, and Shanann started college. Um, Leonard actually joined the Army as like a financial means to pay for and go to law school. And both of them took out large insurance policies and made each other the beneficiary. And they took those policies out through USAA. It wasn't long before Shanann just dropped out of college and she just picked up a job selling cell phones. And within like two years of their marriage, it started going really bad. Years later, Shanann was quoted as saying, I never got to finish college. I was in a bad relationship and I quit college and got a job. So he could go to law school. But in 2006, Shanann became a manager of a cell phone company in Fayetteville, North Carolina. And this cell phone company was owned by a Lebanese guy. And she continued this job for a few years, and she actually eventually became his bookkeeper um, at his new place of employment and his new business called Dirty South. And this was like a custom wheels and automobile company, and there was like two businesses the man owned in North Carolina. And this, this Lebanese guy, he had a pretty big clientele of famous people like rappers and football players. But Shanann was putting in a lot of hours and she was actually managing both of his businesses, the cell phone company and Dirty South. And these two businesses that she was managing that this man owned were 130 miles apart from each other. But the man had given her or set her up with a custom fitted Cadillac Escalade for her travels in between each of the stores. Later on, her husband, Leonard King at the time, um, he was quoted as saying that after she started managing Dirty South, she just 
stopped coming home at night. She just wasn't coming in. And where he had asked where she had been all night and why she did not come home, she would refuse to tell him. Leonard said that they did go to several counseling sessions uh, to try to save their marriage, but he said Shania just was not interested in them saving their marriage. So in 2007, her and Leonard uh, went ahead and got a divorce, and Shania moved to Charlotte, North Carolina, and she ended up enrolling in a psychology class at Queen's University. And Shanann is quoted as saying, I went through a very awful time during that divorce. That relationship took a lot off of me. That divorce literally took everything from me. I had to financially start all over again. And at this time, Shanann was just 23. So finding herself in a situation like that, just getting out of a really bad divorce and pretty much having to start all over again, it just kind of withdrew her and all of her insecurities that she had as a child just came rushing back at her. Shanann said all the doubts and all the fears and all the bad things, they just came flooding right back at me. I was not happy. Then Shanann decided to build a house and so she started looking everywhere around Charlotte for land that she loved to build a house on. She said her goal was to buy a house and then later resell it as a a nice profit. She said she was just sick of paying someone else's mortgage. And then, on November the 30th, 2009, she signed a $309,000 mortgage to have an immaculate mansion built over Lake Wiley in the Belmont suburb in Charlotte. And then for the next three months, she supervised the building of her new home. Shannon was 25 years old when she built her first home. And it wasn't just any home. It wasn't just a starter home. It was literally a mansion. She later said that was the biggest accomplishment she had ever done because she did it by herself. She said, I did it by working my tail off. Once the home was built, she bought the top of the line furniture. Uh, she custom built her kitchen. And then later on, her brother Frankie estimated that it was during this time that she had her home built that Shanann was making about a half a million dollars a year herself. Frankie said during this time she was very wealthy, she was doing very good, and she was very business savvy. He said that his sister was very pretty, but she could talk the talk and walk the walk. But not long after Shanann moved into her new home, she started getting sick. She noticed that her hair was falling out, and she had lost 20 pounds in a month. She went from a size 6 all the way down to a size 1 in just one month. She said, I was feeling extremely horrible and it was to the point that I did not even want to get out of bed for days. She finally took herself to many doctors and she was determined to find out what was wrong with her and why it's like her entire life she was always being hit with some sort of illness that would prevent her from being the person that she wanted to be. It was just always something would come up and stop her and she didn't even feel like getting out of bed. And then finally in May of 2010, Shanann was diagnosed as having lupus and fibromyalgia. And they were helping her with um, things she needed to do and uh, information about the lupus. And then for the next couple of months, she was trying to find a doc doctors and get a second opinion because she just really couldn't grasp that that is something that was wrong with her, something that was like incurable and something that she would always have and there was no cure for it. So she was seeking a second opinion in hopes that this diagnosis was wrong. But she said that all of the second opinions did confirm that it was lupus. And then the prescription drugs that she was given for the lupus and fibromyalgia, she said that they were pretty hard drugs and they gave her like flu-like symptoms. Like she just, the medication made her feel bad as well. It was at that time that Shanann just quit Dirty South and she told the Lebanese guy that she was working for that she was sorry, but she just was not able anymore to manage his stores. She said she just told him, I'm done. I can't do this anymore. You just don't understand what's going on in my life. Then in 2010, when Shanann was at a very, very low point in her life, she, was, she actually received a second Facebook request from a guy named Chris Watts. And this time, she went ahead and replied, thinking, Oh, why not? 
I'm probably never going to meet him anyway. And so she accepted that. Chapter 3 is titled Courting. Two weeks after Shanann accepted Chris's friend's request, they went on their very first date. They met up at a theater, but this wasn't just any theater. It was a very classy. This theater serves cocktails and very eloquent gourmet meals during the movie. Chris, thinking it was just a regular theater like a Cinemax, he just wears a regular t-shirt, camo shorts, and DC like the skater kind of tennis shoes. And Shanann had really dressed up and got very high class, high maintenance look for the special occasion of her first date with Chris, whom she had never met, and it was almost like a blind date. Later on, Chris said, quote, I didn't really know what I was getting into. When I walked up to the door, I saw there was a doorman, and he was wearing a suit and tie, and I was like, oh God, this isn't good, unquote. It seemed like neither of them had any chemistry between them. Um, when Shanann turned around and looked at Chris, she was actually like kind of thrown off, you know, from his appearance, dressed like basically like a teenage skate boy. And she actually told him, she said, maybe I should just keep talking to the bartender. Um, Chris also was so nervous um, that he didn't even really eat anything. His nerves were just completely overpowering him. And he also said that Shanann was just like chowing down, you know, eating her dinner. And then she looks at him and she's like, God, you eat like a bird. And after the date, Shanann was kind of iffy if she wanted to see him again. But like a few days later, Chris called her back and he asked her if she would like to go to a Kid Rock concert with him. And she was like, yeah, sure. Chris just said that he was very persistent trying to pursue her. And when they got to the concert, Chris was so nervous about the second date that he actually forgot his ID. And he had to run all the way back to the car and get and because it was so hot that day, it was like sweltering hot. By the time he got back from getting his ID out of the car and he got back to where Shanann was, he was just soaking wet with sweat. But all in all, they had a great time at the concert. They both enjoyed their sweat. And she actually agreed to see him again. And then in late August, when they went on a trip to Myrtle Beach, that is when Chris finally won Shanann's heart. And what did it is on the way back, Shanann was having a pretty bad lupus flare-up. And she said for three and a half hours, she just laid in his lap on the drive back. And he rubbed her head and he had to pee so bad, but he would not move because he did not want to disturb her or wake her up because she had went to sleep. And at that point is when Shanann decided, Chris is truly the man of my dreams. While they were dating, Shanann went ahead and went back to work at Dirty South part-time because she was having to pay for her living expenses and pay her mortgage and such as that. So she did go back to work there part-time. Also on the side, she was doing photography. She was trying to start up a little photography business of her own. She was doing like weddings and child photography, family portraits, and things of that nature. Her friend, Amanda Aikman, said that Shanann was so creative and talented she took an entire day to do a photo shop for her and her little girl. Eventually, Shanann just placed an ad in the paper. Um, she was looking for work uh, being a nanny. And it didn't take very long before she got the phone call of someone interested in her becoming their nanny. Gina Dietz said that when they interviewed Shanann, they realized that she truly loved children. And they were very impressed with her. So they hired her right on the spot. Gina was a nurse, and she was also pregnant with her second child. Um, she went ahead and she hired Shanann, and Shanann was looking after her 18-month-old son several days a week while she worked at being a nurse. Gina said that Shanann was a wonderful nanny to her little boy, and it didn't take long before they all had a really tight bond with Shanann. And Gina said close to the end of her pregnancy, she was unable to work much at the hospital, so she was home most all of the time. And Shanann was there as well, helping with her little boy. And she said it was during that time that her and Shanann got really close and learned a lot about each other. Shanann was in a lot of pain a lot of times, and she was having some bad side effects from all the medication that she was having to take due to her lupus and fibromyalgia. But Shanann said she always put on a fake smile. So, with her doing that and always trying to be upbeat and make everyone else happy, 
there was few people that even realized she was sick herself. Shanann was starting to feel like she was becoming pretty dependent on Chris because Chris was always there at her beck and call. Any time she called or needed anything, Chris never questioned. He was right there. He enjoyed doing things for her. Um, he even take her medication, and he would separate them into the different days into these flip-top medication compartments. So her medications would be separated by the day, and she wouldn't have to open each bottle one by one. They were all just there ready and waiting for her when she needed them. Shanann said, I dragged him to a colonoscopy. I dragged him to a rheumatology appointment, and I even drug him with me to my spinal tap which was absolutely awful. And I just ended up falling in love with Chris. That is what Shanann said. It was around fall of that year, and Chris ended up moving into Shanann's home with her. And he was helping her to share the expenses in the home. He had saved up $11,000 while he was working at the Ford dealership, and he gave that to Shanann as sort of his room and board and to help her and, you know, just just overhead prices of everything to pay his part. And then she started introducing Chris to her friends, and they seemed to all be very impressed by his dedication and the way he would just jump when she spoke. Or it's like he knew what she wanted before she asked. Like, he would say, do you want some water, honey? You know, and she would be like, how did you know? You know, he was just... He made a point to make sure she had everything she needed before she needed it. And that was really impressive to her friends. On November the 10th, 2010, Shanann made her very first post on Facebook about her new relationship. And she posted a picture of her and Chris, and she titled it, Me and My Baby. And then a few days after that, Shanann decided they should have a cookout and invite both sets of the family, his side and her side, so they could all get to meet each other and get to know each other, and they were going to have the cookout at Shanann's home. However, this barbecue did not go well, and Cindy later said, quote, We went over and had dinner at their house because Chris had asked us to. Shanann's brother and her dad were very, very nice people, but her mom was just very outspoken. I didn't, I just did not feel comfortable around her. And Cindy also had all kinds of questions and wondering how could her son's first real girlfriend at only 25 years old live in such a luxurious mansion and have all the finest things when she only had a part-time job. Cindy said, Shanann's house was absolutely unbelievable. She had the absolute best of everything. How can she afford that? Unquote. And Chris's sister, Jamie, she was also very questionable about the lifestyle Shanann was living. She was thinking that maybe Shanann was living above her means. Jamie said, I mean, for a 26-year-old, that is a very nice house. And was it really on the up and up? There was just like so many questions and we couldn't even pretend that we didn't want to ask them, unquote. And Shanann's parents were pretty well aware of all these suspicions and questions that the Watts were having. And so that did lead to a lot of tension at their very first meeting. Shanann's mother, Sandy, said, quote, that they were floored when they saw her house. Shanann was a hard worker, and she wanted to eventually sell and make a profit. She comes from a family of contractors, unquote. After the cookout, Shanann and Chris took Jamie and both fathers and just gave them a tour of the house, but they left the two mothers out back by themselves to talk. Sandy said it was just me and Chris's mother, and Chris's mother leaned over to me and said, Was your daughter married before? And I said, Yeah, just like your daughter Jamie was, unquote. And then Sandy said that, Cindy told her that she did not think that her daughter loved Chris. I knew she was going to be a thorn in their marriage, Sandy said. So from then on, every time we had cookouts, his mom and sister were very distant. 
They were not accepting us, and they made it known, Sandy said. At the time, Jamie was pregnant with her second child, and she said that they just wanted the relationship to work out for Chris's sake. She said, when we met her, we wasn't sure, but we would do anything to make Chris happy because he was very happy with Shanann. Chris and Shanann's first Christmas together, they celebrated at Shanann's parents' house in Aberdeen. Chris's family was really missing him because this is the first time in his life that he had not spent Christmas with his own family. Shanann posted many pictures of her and Chris onto her Instagram of their holidays together, but she said she was in pain throughout the majority of it, and you could see the pain in her face, she said. She was having bad lupus flare-ups. They also rang in the new year with Shanann's family and her brother Frankie, and she also posted many photographs of them bringing the New Year's in together onto her Instagram as well. And she kept captioned the photos, this is our first New Year's together. In February of 2011, Gina Dietz and her family moved to Broomfield, Colorado, just weeks after their new baby daughter was born. And by this time, she had gotten a very tight bond with the family, and she'd grown so close to them that they considered her a part of their family. But, so far, the Dietz still had not had the opportunity to meet Chris. Shanann drove them to the airport, and she was making plans all the way there to go and visit with them soon. And she had put on her Instagram, I'm really going to miss you guys. And Chris promises me a visit to Colorado very soon. Shanann did stay in daily constant contact with Gina. And Gina continued to tell her, that the Colorado air and everything so fresh up there would be so good and so beneficial to her lupus and fibromyalgia. And being that Gina was a nurse, Shanann did listen and was taking in what Gina was telling her. And Gina even brought the idea up to Shanann that, hey, y'all should just move here. It would be so good for your health. Okay, that is the end of Chapter 3. Okay, on a side note about Chapter 3, Gina Dietz, the nurse that Shanann was a nanny for, many people has always wondered why CBI or FBI did not interview her. And I wondered that as well, because they are the actual people that, you know, got Shanann and Chris to move to Colorado, as well as Chris lived with them for like six months before Shanann was even able to sell her house in North Carolina and join him in Colorado where he was living in the Deets basement for the engagement. Chris and Shanann were actually doing great while they were living in North Carolina inside her home. Um, they, they ended up being in a, a very good routine. Um, every morning, Chris would get up and go to work, and Shanann would working part-time at Dirty South and still running her photo, you know, her photo business, being a photographer. Shanann was the dominant one in the relationship, but Chris was more than happy to just go along and whatever she wanted or whatever she said needed done or just whatever, he was more than happy to go along with it. And he thoroughly seemed to love their balance and the way they did things and the routine and the lifestyle they lived. Shanann had like a fiery temper, but Chris, he was like, Chris was more like a blank canvas and he never displayed any sort of emotions, really not happy, sad, mad anything. He was just like a blank canvas and just pretty much done what he was told and he liked it that way. So here she was with this real big personality and here Chris was and he didn't even have a personality. So it's like they just, it just worked. They, it was like a perfect fit people thought. They thought they were a perfect fit. Now at the beginning of August, Chris and Shanann just got them a home. They rented and this house was located in Ocean Isle Beach in North Carolina. And Shanann's parents joined them. Chris finally got up the nerve to propose to Shanann. So he bought an engagement ring and his plan, and he wanted to propose to her on the beach. But before Chris would ask Shanann to marry him, he traditionally went to Mr. Rusek and asked him, for his blessing in asking for Shanann's hand in marriage. And Frank happily 
gave Chris his blessings, and the Ruseks were so happy to welcome Chris into their family. Sandy said, quote, They were so in love, and they were a great team. Unquote. And then that Thanksgiving, Chris and Shanann flew to Broomfield, Colorado, to spend Thanksgiving with Shanann's friends, Gina Deets. This was actually the first time that the Deets ever had the chance to meet Chris, and they were really, really impressed with him and how he seemed to be so dedicated and in love with Shanann. Gina said that he was very doting of Shanann, and he was just very attentive to her, and she could tell how much he truly loved her. But she also said that Chris was very, very shy and seemed very introverted. But she said that Chris just loved her kids. Her husband, Charlie, was doing a little bit of remodeling in their home, and Chris wasn't even asked. He just immediately just started helping him. She said he just got on his hands and knees and just started helping her husband put in the hardwood floors throughout the whole bottom part of their home. And while they were visiting with the Deeds, they both decided mutually that they just wanted to move to Colorado because they felt like it would benefit her lupus and fibromyalgia. So they went ahead and they called a realtor, and this realtor just started taking them on tours of available properties. Chris just remained in Colorado, and Shanann came back to sell her house in top of the Lucians, and then she would come back and join Chris in Colorado. But when Chris told his mom that they were going to move to Colorado, she was absolutely horrified. Cindy said, quote, Colorado was Shanann's idea. Why would she want to leave and take him all the way to Colorado? Unquote. Shanann and her mom were really busy getting together the engagement party and trying to get everything ready for that. And so they decided to include Jamie, Chris's sister, in on the arranging the party and they asked her to mail out some invitations and for her to order only and strictly gluten-free food. When it came the day of the engagement party, it was a complete disaster. Sandy said that all of the food that Jamie ordered all contained gluten, and Shanann could not even eat anything. And most of the 80 invitations did not even go out. Jamie denied this, saying, quote, I sent out the invitations. I may have missed one or two, but everybody was there. The engagement party, it was terrible. People were mad. Shanann and her future mother-in-law, Cindy, had a huge fight. And that was because Cindy accused Shanann of turning Chris against his own family. Cindy said, quote, I did not want to be there, but we went, and I was cordial and polite. Things like that happen in families, unquote. And then, after the engagement party, at what is said to be at Shanann's instigation, Chris broke off all communication with his family. He completely stopped taking their calls and told them all just to leave him alone. Cindy said he wouldn't even talk to us anymore. Shanann was very controlling and Chris was in love and there was no talking to him. And it frightened me for him. Chris's sister, Jamie, just wanted to repair the relationship with their family. So she reached out to Chris Jamie said, I was trying to open doors and I wanted to mend the fence because we wanted to go to his wedding. But I couldn't get a response from Chris. He was completely ignoring all of us, not answering our calls, not answering our texts. He just was not speaking to us and he had stopped all communication with his family. So I couldn't make those amends so we could attend his wedding. And then years later, Chris actually speculated on why he actually turned his back on his family. He said, quote, I blew up on my family to a point to where I even told them I didn't need them anymore, but, and that was because I have Shanann. I cussed my mom out. I don't know if Shanann coached me to do it. I don't know. Or maybe it was just complete and total rage, unquote. Okay, that concludes chapter four. We will move straight into chapter five, which is titled Moving to Colorado. In April of 2012, Chris quit his job at Mooresville Ford and moved to Broomfield, Colorado. He moved in with Gina and Charlie Dietz, and it wasn't long before he had a really good job at Longmont Ford because he was easily given the job 
when they looked at his resume and saw that he was a master mechanic. Gina said that Chris lived with them for six months before Shanann was able to move from North Carolina and come and join him. Chris was saving all of the money that he could for his and Shanann's new life and future together while he was full-time employed at Longmont Ford. Gina said he was just putting all of his money in the bank. Gina said that Chris was very soft-spoken, kind, and helpful, and she was really, really impressed by how Chris was so attentive and helpful and bonded so well with her new baby daughter. And Gina said that she knew one day that Chris was going to be an excellent father. She said that Chris even became like a third parent to her little girl. Because whenever her little girl got sad or sleepy or upset, she wanted Chris. Although Shanann was in North Carolina, she kept in constant contact with Chris. And she wanted him to go ahead and take an online class. And she also made sure that he was not being unfaithful to her while they were apart. Gina said that Shanann wanted him to work towards a degree. And she had him doing classes while he was living with them. And then on April 22nd, Gina's husband, Charlie actually videoed Chris doing a presentation in their kitchen as part of his, like a rehearsal for what he was going to have to do as part of his class. And Chris titled his presentation as Relationship, Deterioration, and Repair. And since he needed an audience to do this presentation in front of, um, the Dateses had some of their friends come over and act as an audience for him to do this presentation that Charlie recorded. Chris had notes written down in a notebook and he also was displaying it on a PowerPoint presentation on the computer. He was obviously very nervous. He was palming his fist and swaying back and forth, but what was even more strange than that is only four months into his first real relationship, he was tackling a relationship presentation. And he began it with how a relationship will deteriorate. And this speech would prove very, very eerily close to actually what he explained happened in his own relationship. Chris actually uploaded his presentation to YouTube, which is still there today. And I will link it in the description box if you would like to see it. It's very awkward to say the least. But Shanann commented on his presentation and she said great job baby very good information it wasn't until august that shanann finally sold her home for three hundred and forty nine thousand dollars but it was at a profit of almost forty one thousand dollars that she actually paid for her home three years earlier it was bought by a man named baron falls who was an asset manager he made the comment that she was so desperate and quick to sell that she even left all of her furniture behind. And then shortly after that, Shanann just moved to Broomfield so she could start her new life with Chris. They were living in the basement of the Deets' home, her and Chris were, while they were searching for their own home to buy. Shanann got employment, actually, at Longmont Ford, the same place Chris worked. However, she was in the sales department. She was an amazing salesman, and she actually sold more cars than anyone else that ever worked there. A co-worker named Tyler said she was an amazing salesperson. Tyler said she was very friendly and outgoing with all of the customers, so she sold lots of cars. Tyler's father worked there as well. His name was Greg, and he started noticing that. He thought it was kind of odd that Shanann would always collect Chris's check. Chris would just get it, and he would hand it straight to her. Which, on a side note, I don't find that odd. You know, my husband hands me his check. I put this in the bank, you know. So I personally don't find that so odd, but maybe some people do or did. Greg went on to say, though, that he also noticed that Chris was like very, very passive and submissive to Shanann. And Shanann was really controlling and aggressive with Chris. Greg said that Shanann was just really bossy and she was always on him like, do this and do that. And she was always just telling him what to do. He said, but at the same time, Chris never complained. He never seemed resentful. And he seemed like that's just the way it was. And he was very accepting of his role of being submissive and her the dominant one. Greg said that Shanann, from what he saw, always made all of the decisions in their relationship. 
And with Shanann being so outgoing and out, you know, spoken, bubbly, charismatic, she started quickly making friends there. And of course, when she made friends, then Chris would just tag along as well and be friends as well. And one of those friends was Jeremy Lindstrom. And we pretty much all know who Jeremy Lindstrom is. Um, he was one of the people that was interviewed not only by the news channel, but also by CBI. And he had a very unpopular opinion. <laughs> I guess it's the best way to say it. Um, we do have his interview as well here on the channel, and I'm sure most of you have already heard it, but just in case there's some that hasn't, again, I will link it at the end of this video because his interview is probably the one that I have heard the very most um, negativity from. But he did know them both personally, of course. He worked with them. They, you know, had dinners together, birthday parties together, and he and his family is actually the last ones that really saw the girls before that happened to them because Chris actually took them to his house for a birthday party of his children. So, yeah. When Chris and Shannon actually met Jeremy at Longmont, he had also just moved to Colorado. He and his family came from California, and they had just moved to Colorado as well. And ironically enough, David Colon also worked at Longmont Ford, and his job there, he just, like, reconditioned cars and, you know, pretty much remodeled cars is the only way I know to put it. You know, I guess when someone gave a trade-in, he would just fix it up to resell it, whatever. But he also worked there and met Chris there. And ironically enough, later on, when Chris and Shannon moved to Saratoga Trail, all three of them ended up being very close neighbors. A very small world, actually, to say the least. So I have David Cologne's interview on the channel that they did with him. They actually did two with him. Um, he wrote a letter, and then they called him back and did a second interview with him because of the letter he wrote to Chris while Chris was incarcerated. So anyway, I will link those at the end of this video as well in case you haven't heard those. I know a lot of people haven't heard David's, so you may want to listen to that one. But anyway, when David bought his house, um, Chris and Shanann actually helped him move into it. It was like a year that they remained living with um, Gina and George Dietz in their basement while they were working lots and lots of hours at Longmont, saving their money and looking for the perfect property or place to start their own family and buy them a home. They actually just became like one big family, the Dietz and the Watts, and they spent all their holidays together. They cooked lots of Italian food together. They were, really were just like one big family. Gina actually said that Shanann absolutely loved to cook, so her and Shanann would just spend hours all night in the kitchen just cooking and just tearing the kitchen all up. And after they got done cooking and everything, then the guys had to clean the kitchen. That was their deal. Gina and Shanann was also hooked on watching The Bachelor every Monday night. So while they were doing that, George and Chris was like just playing computer games because, you know, they just really wasn't interested in The Bachelor. One thing about the dates, though, they, they often had um, company and friends just to stop by and visit, and it wasn't long before they just started noticing that Chris just was not comfortable around other people or being in an environment to where he had to be, you know, social. It just, it wasn't comfortable to him, and they could tell when he was around many people like he would withdraw. Gina said it was really to the point that she actually felt sorry for him when they had company and you know, he was having to deal with public and people he didn't know. She she really just felt sorry for him, the way he would kind of withdraw and just get real shy and go off to himself. She said that he was just extremely introverted and very socially awkward, but he was a very, very kind and gentle at the same time. It was just kind of hard to explain. Gina also said that Shannon would try really hard to get Chris, like, more involved with a company at Longmont, but it just really didn't work. So Shanann just learned that she was the one that was going to do all the talking and introducing of Chris and give him little tasks to do. And Chris was more than happy to do these little tasks because it actually gave him something to do other than having to stand around and feel like he had to be social when you could obviously tell he had no clue how to actually be social and he was so introverted, it made him extremely uncomfortable. The 1st of October, on Shanann's Instagram, she started like this countdown to the days to her wedding. And through the whole month, she would just give updates almost daily 
to her upcoming wedding. Things like uh, bridesmaids' gifts and all the way down to invitation holders she would update everyone on. And she was posting these cute photos of her bridal shower on her Instagram. And she would be holding her bridal shower gift, her new pet Dotson, that the Beats gave her that she named Dieter. Shortly after her bridal shower and she was gifted Dieter, her and Chris went and Chris signed on October the 17th a $392,709 mortgage on their new home at 2825 Saratoga Trail in Frederick, Colorado. When they actually bought the house and he signed for the loan and the mortgage, the home was actually still being built. The home was actually part of a new development that was coming up in the Wyndham Hill Estate. And Shanann posted on Instagram, she was so proud, she posted a photo and she posted, Chris will be signing his life away to build our new home in Frederick, Colorado. And then she hashtag super stoked. And then just a couple of days later, she put up her and Chris's wedding website online. Shanann was really proud of it, so she invited everyone she knew to go check out the website. She also said instead of anyone bringing like wedding gifts, that she would like for everything to be donated to the Lupus Foundation instead of bringing gifts to the wedding. But the book goes on to say that Shanann did make it clear that the Watts family were not welcome at the wedding. However, Shanann was not the only one. Chris agreed to this as well. Each day, Shanann posted a new photo of her and Chris. Um, she also showed up and was very proud of the wedding ring that Chris had already bought for her, and it was a $10,000 wedding ring. And in all of the photos, it said that she was carefully posed out, and she would pose Chris out, and he, he never complained. He actually enjoyed it, or he seemed like he did. Gina Dietz said, and was quoted saying, that Chris literally worshipped the ground Shanann walked on, and he would do anything for her, and anything she asked, he literally doted on her to an extreme and put her on the highest pedestal that he could possibly put her on. He would do anything just to make her happy and see her smile. And Chris seemed over the top and extremely happy in his role in their relationship. And I mean, she just said he just seemed like an extremely happy, doting fiance. Gina said that her and her husband even discussed how submissive Chris was in the relationship and how it just seems so odd because normally um, the male is a bit more dominant but she said either way whatever it whatever it was they were an absolute perfect match she thought and there couldn't have been anybody better for Shanann or Chris than each other the book goes on to say Gina laughed about the way her and her husband would talk about it and she said that there is no way her marriage would ever work that way because her husband's just not like that. And she said, but, you know, that worked for them. And Chris seemed to like it that way, you know, her being the dominant one and him being the submissive one. That worked for them, and that's how they both wanted it, and that's what they both needed. Shanann was dominant, and Chris was submissive. So Gina thinks that they were actually the absolute perfect couple. There couldn't have been anyone better for either one of them. She said they just literally had the perfect dynamic together. It was unreal. Perfect. On Halloween, Chris and Shanann had went back to North Carolina and they were just wrapping up um, the loose ends for their wedding. And then on November the 1st, they went and got their marriage license at the courthouse. And then the next night, they actually held a rehearsal dinner for their wedding and the dates flew in from Colorado to attend the rehearsal because of course Gina was her maid of honor. Her little son that Shanann had nanny for was the ring bearer and the little baby girl who was now walking, she was actually the little flower girl. And then on Saturday, November the 3rd, Chris and Shanann were married at the Double Tree Hotel in Charlotte, North Carolina. She had an actual beautiful fairy tale wedding. She looked like a Disney princess with her tiara. Even her shoes were rhinestone encrusted and with rhinestones going down the back of the stiletto hill saying, I do. 
and Chris just wore a very elegant evening dress suit. And the reception was lots of fun. Their their wedding cake was actually Pittsburgh Steelers themed because it was both of their favorite football team. Shanette had actually invited several many of her friends from New Jersey, but hardly any of them could make it because of Hurricane Sandy, which had just happened just a few days before their wedding. The only member of Chris's family that actually came was his grandmother that he was so close to, his maternal grandmother, and she's actually the one that he shared the groom's dance with. Shanann's brother, Frankie, said that he was actually crying because he was thanking God that Chris was in Shanann's life. Shanann really wanted Chris to do something for her at their wedding, and he did it. He let his guard down. His very socially awkward, want to stay back low-key, don't want the spotlight Chris, he done it because Shanann really wanted him to. And what he did is he actually performed the dance that Magic Mike did in the movie about the male stripper. Even though he looked super awkward doing it, they said, they said that he done it just for her because that is what she wanted. Frankie said it was so funny. He said he looked so awkward trying to do it, but um, he did it for Shanann and he goofballed it. But Frankie said it just made them all love him even more that he would do that. And then the next day, Chris and Shanann, the next day after their wedding, they went on their honeymoon and they took it at Myrtle Beach in South Carolina. They actually had hopes and planned to go to Cancun, but they realized that they just couldn't afford it, so uh, they made their honeymoon at Myrtle Beach. Shanann posted lots of pictures of her and Chris on the beach, and she was thanking everyone that came to their wedding, and she was explaining what an amazing time they had and how appreciative she was to everyone that did show up. She would caption the picture, Thank you all so much to all of our friends and family who love and support us. We had an amazing time. And then after their honeymoon, they went back to Colorado and moved back in, of course, with the Dixes until their new home was completed. Gina said they were very happy. They were newlyweds, and they were the perfect couple. It was wonderful. Rather quickly after they were married, Shanann was trying to get pregnant, but she had been warned by her doctors that she probably was going to have a hard time conceiving because of the lupus. But she and Chris were desperate to have a baby. They both wanted one so bad. So she started taking fertility drugs and downloaded some apps on her phone for her ovulation cycle so she could monitor that. Chris was quoted saying that she just did not think she was going to be able to get pregnant because they had tried for quite a while and it just wasn't happening. So, just assuming that it was never going to happen, Shanann went ahead and ordered a $7,500 supercharger for Chris as a gift for his birthday. But, as fate would have it, the very weekend that she bought the supercharger, she conceived Bella. And that ends Chapter 5, 6 now. And, in April of 2013, Shanann and Chris moved into their brand new home, located at 2825 Saratoga Trail in Frederick, Colorado. Frederick, Colorado sits right in the heart of Colorado. Its motto is, build on what matters. Mostly surrounding the Frederick area is drillers and oil batteries. It is known for its oil industry. And when Chris and Shanann moved into their home, the population of Frederick was only around 8,000. But the town had this program. It was an ambition program. And the Wyndham Hill Estate subdivision was like the key area that they were wanting to expand and to show off their properties of Frederick. So this area was just newly up and coming. The Wyndham Hill subdivision is a very upscale neighborhood. It has a park, a playground, a swimming pool, and even a clubhouse. And it, the homes inside are advertised as there is a home for every dream. 4100 and 77 square feet was a beautiful and very eloquent home at 2825 Saratoga Trail. Four bathroom, gourmet, exquisite kitchen with a double oven, hardwood floors, and granite countertops. And the basement was huge and it had nine foot ceilings, but it also came with a very pricey mortgage. 
$2,800 a month. Shortly after, on May the 16th, Chris celebrated his 28th birthday, and Shanann completely surprised him with a supercharger for his beloved Mustang. The night before, on May the 15th, she had secretly stayed late at Longmont Four, but it was because she was trying to place his supercharger beside his toolbox so he would see it the next morning when he got to work and be surprised, you know. She was always doing these little things that was just so cute, you know, like she wanted everything to be, I don't know, like a big memory like she did with, and I'm sure that's in the book as well, but like she did when Celeste was born and she had Bella in the crib and it was like, um, it was like a evac eviction notice on the crib. It was really cute. I thought it was cute. And it's like Shanann always wanted to do something just really cute and make a big memory out of it. So she done that with the supercharger as well. She stayed there late that night and put it there, fixed it up, just so when he walked in, he would just be shocked because very expensive. I don't even know what a supercharger is. Maybe some of you do, but it is a very expensive something for his beloved Mustang and it almost $6,000 something. The author goes on to say that Shanann would just do anything for Chris just to see him smile and make him happy. And that Tyler from Longmont Ford um, that worked with them said that Shanann was always wanting to make Chris happy, always wanting to see him smile. So she would go like above and beyond just to do little things like that for him just to make him happy. And she knew how bad he had been wanting this part for his Mustang. So she wanted to make it extra special. She put a wrap over it, fixed it all up. So as soon as he got to work the next morning, it would just be right there. In July of 2013, Shanann was three months pregnant. But she went to the children's hospital and applied for a job that her friend Gina was going to help her get because that's where Gina was working as well. Um, and so that she got that job there in the call center at the children's hospital. But Gina actually worked in the pediatric triage center there at that hospital where Shanann was in the pediatric call center. This job came with a pay of $18 an hour, plus she made extra on weekends and holidays if she worked those as well. Chris was still working at Longmont, but he had started having problems with carpal tunnel syndrome, and Shanann was the one that noticed he was having these issues, and she began to get really worried about him. On July the 9th, Shanann posted the first Instagram photo uh, holding a little girl's baby dress, and she captioned it, Bella Marie Watts, coming this Christmas, 2013. So excited. Shanann had chosen the name Bella Marie because Bella is the Italian word for beautiful, and Marie is her mother's middle name. And then, a few days later, Chris called his parents with the news to let them know Shanann was pregnant, and now he wanted to make peace with them. He had not even spoken to them in over two years. But then, all of a sudden, Chris just started acting like nothing had ever happened. It's like those two years didn't even exist, and he never went those two years without even speaking to or acknowledging his own parents. But Cindy said that, quote, she found out she was pregnant, so she let us back into their lives, unquote. And Cindy just said, okay, I'm going to throw up the white flag, and I'm not going to say anything anymore. And if this is what Chris wants, then I will shut my mouth. Shanann was so excited. She was putting photos of herself on Instagram showing her baby bumps. She went on a big shopping spree, buying toys and clothes, and she even found a little bikini for Bella. Her and Chris actually went to the Bruno Mars concert while she was pregnant with Bella, and Chris took a photograph of her, and she titled it, My Baby Bump at the Bruno Mars Concert. Little Beamer at her first concert, she posted photos of how she had Bella's closet all fixed up with two rails of the cutest little dresses, inside the closet just waiting on Bella to make her grand appearance. And she also had like a row of children's books and movies. Her friend Gina Dietz also said, you know, that she remembers years earlier that Shanann was already buying baby clothes in preparation for one day that she would get to be a mother. Shanann's dream was just to be a mom, just to be a wife and a mom. And she had prepared herself for it for years. Gina went on to say, before I even met her, she already had been buying clothes for her firstborn baby. 
she was always very prepared. Going on into the pregnancy, Chanel had posted photos. She had gotten Bella one of the top-of-the-line cribs, and it had like a luxurious canopy over it that was embroidered with Bella's name. Closer to the time of Bella to be born, by now her closet was just bursting with so many little dresses and outfits just waiting on her. But in the midst of all the excitement and getting ready and prepping for Bella's arrival, a dark cloud of credit card debt was slowly moving in. But it just seemed like neither Chris nor Shanann was even realizing or acknowledging this big debt that they were actually getting themselves into. Shanann controlled most of the finances, but Chris was always just content and happy and just fine with anything that she wanted to buy or wanted to go do or just anything. He just didn't ever say anything about it either way. Ronnie, Chris's dad, actually said, quote, Shanann was living way above their means, unquote. He went on to say she wanted the best of everything. Shanann and Chris went and took a Le Mans class, and they took this class together, of course. She posted a photo on Instagram, and she said, This time last year, me and Chris were getting ready for our life together. Now here we are at Le Mans class a year later, and we could not be any happier. And then Halloween of 2013, of course, Shanann was very, very pregnant. She wore like a cardboard a box with a cutout on it around her waist. And on her tummy, she wrote, Bun, B-U-N. And Chris dressed up as a chef. And on his apron, he had written, um, The Bun Maker. And on November the 3rd of 2013, which was their one-year wedding anniversary, that is when they had their baby shower for Bella. She posted a really cute picture of her and Chris where they were passionately kissing each other. Gina Dietz said she was so happy to be pregnant. And recently, Shannon and Chris had become pretty good friends with Jeremy and Jennifer Lindstrom. They had actually just moved into the neighborhood. Jeremy and Jennifer had visited the Watts pretty often, and they wondered if Shannon may have OCD, because everything was very organized. Jeremy said that they also noticed how Chris always done all the cleaning. Jeremy said that she's very meticulous with everything. Like she's got storage containers with labels in their walk-in pantry. And it's just like everything in the house is in its own special place. Jeremy said that there was one time that he had went to Chris's house to take him to the airport. But Shanann told him he was going to have to finish cleaning that basement first before he left. Okay, now I want to say something about that. Um... Jeremy don't know the whole story to that, in my opinion. Now, he may. I'm not going to say for certain he doesn't, but I don't think he does because that's really all he elaborated about that part. Here's the thing. Who's to say that before Jeremy got there, Shanann had been doing this, doing that, whatever, and maybe she told Chris a long time ago, will you please get the basement straightened up, fixed up, whatever it was he needed to do before Jeremy gets here, you know, because I'm not going to be able to do it or whatever. And he was just procrastinating around until the last minute, and then he's, he jumps down there five minutes before Jeremy gets there, and he starts cleaning it. Um, I'm not going to say that's what happened. I don't know, but, you know, it's possible. It really is. I know that sometimes I can be a procrastinator myself, so I'm not saying anything bad against him or Jeremy or whatever, but I'm just saying I've heard that a lot in this about Shanann just wouldn't let him go anywhere until that basement was clean. Well, might need to know the whole story before you start assuming that she was just being hateful and rude about that. Don't know. Don't know the whole story. See, that's the thing about this case. We don't know the whole story. So just hearing little bits from different people like this, it's kind of confusing. And you don't have really an option but to look one way or the other. At the same time, it's always best to try to be unbiased and be like, well, maybe it was because of this. We don't know. So that, that part has never actually put into my head that Shanann was just being mean and rude that day because I don't know. Maybe, maybe Chris had been saying he was going to clean that basement for the last month and he wouldn't. I don't know. Either way, um, I don't, I don't guess we'll ever know unless Chris says and it's, I mean, who's going to ask him that? Why did you have to, 
that's probably never going to be asked of him anyway, even if he does remember. But before you jump quick to think, oh, she was so hateful for doing that, well, you don't know the whole story behind that, right? So, I mean, that's my opinion. And Jeremy went on to say that Shanann had to have everything clean. Well, that's not really a bad trait, you know. You know, a lot of us just wish we could have the motivation to be that organized and clean. And, I mean, I mean, we're all clean, I'm, I'm sure, you know, we are. But I wish I could just have half of her organization motivation. I really do. Because sometimes, a lot of times, I'm a hot mess. I can't find anything, really. I'm like, okay, where's my mascara? Where did I set my purse? I mean, I'm a hot mess. So, with her organization, that's a plus, in my opinion. If it wasn't driving her crazy and it wasn't driving Chris crazy, and it obviously it wasn't, then that's a plus. And Jeremy went on to say, well, yeah, but he couldn't go to the airport until he got that basement clean. She's really controlling like that. Well, I don't know. I don't know. Jeremy knows him obviously better than I do, of course, but um, did Jeremy know the whole story? I mean, maybe that wasn't a controlling thing. Maybe that was just like her tired of telling him, and look, if you don't, if you don't get it done, I've I've already did all this, and if you don't at least do that, you're not going. I can, you know, we, unless you know the whole story, you know, you can't, you don't know if it's controlling. But, you know, Jeremy does know them, so, you know, maybe, maybe that is how he took it, that she was super controlling. Or, maybe Jeremy's the husband, and I don't know him either, and if he's listening to this, or his wife, um, I don't know you guys. I would like to talk to you, though, so um, hit me up on email, but I don't know him. So maybe him and his wife is more of the, he's the dominant, she's the submissive, as is most, you know, relationships. Um, usually the wife is the submissive and the husband is the dominant protector type, you know. And maybe that's how his relationship, you know, is with his wife. And that's good. I'm sure that works great for them, but that would have never worked for Shanann and Chris. Chris could have never been the dominant, one, because he didn't want to be. And two, he just didn't have it in him, in my opinion, to be the dominant role of the relationship. So Shanann had to take on that role. And Jeremy said, well, you know, we always thought, man, Chris has got to be a really good dude. Well, you know, that's what Chris wanted, you know. Um, you know, there's many relationships out there that is like Chris and Shanann. Not many, but they're, they are there. And I'm sure somebody listening to me right now has that sort of relationship that the wife is the dominant one. Um, and that's the way they like it works for them. It's not really to be judged. A lot of us is like an older fashion stance. Like, for the most part, our parents, the dad was always the protector, the dominant. And I don't even, I don't even like using the word dominant because it almost sounds, that makes it almost sound like, you know, they're the ruler, you know, you, they say what goes kind of thing. It, it's, it's more of an equal thing, but, you know, like when we were coming up, dad was like the protector, like if something's hurt outside, Dad grabs his gun. He goes outside to check everything out, you know. Now, you really don't see Mama grabbing the gun and grabbing the flashlight and being like, Hey, I'm going to go check it out out here. Now, y'all stay in the house. I'm going to make sure nobody's messing around out here. Everything's good. You really don't see Mama doing that. You know, and Daddy in the house with the kids. Yeah, y'all sit back. Y'all calm down. Y'all just sit back. She'll be back in here in a minute. I mean, you don't really see that. It's usually Dad doing that. Um, Old-fashioned or not, that's usually just how it is. Well... You know, some relationships are just not that way. Some, the the lady is, is the dominant one. And so, yeah. And Jeremy went on to say, she's really found the right guy that's got the right personality for her. Well, you know, good. Good. It works for them. It's, it's, it works. And that's just the way it is. Okay, we're moving into Chapter 7. And the title of this chapter is Bella Marie. In 2013, on a Monday, December the 16th, and just as Shanann was getting off work from working a night shift, her water broke. Chris rushed her to the hospital, but she was still in labor for 16 and a half hours. It wasn't until the following day, on December the 17th, that Bella Marie Watts was born. She was born at the Lafayette Good Samaritan Hospital. Gina Dietz and Chris were both in the delivery room when Bella was born. And just a few hours later, Shanann posted a photo of Chris holding Bella and Chris was just staring at her, so loving and proud. He was just, he looked like he was just over the moon with pride in his new little baby girl, Bella Marie. And Shanann captioned it, The love he has for Bella is wonderful. And then, on Christmas Eve, Shanann had Chris dress up in a full Santa Claus outfit and stand next to their Christmas tree 
with Bella's gifts, and she took pictures. And then a week later, she posted a New Year's message to all of her friends and family. But she did not tag any of Chris's friends and family in the photo. She captioned it, 2013 has been an amazing year, and I'm truly blessed with our baby girl, Bella, and my amazing husband and father, Chris Lee Watts. Chris and I built and purchased our first home together. There's just so much to be thankful for this year. And then she announced that they were already planning a baby brother or sister for Bella. And then the first week of January 2014, Ronnie and Cindy Watts flew to Denver so they can meet their first granddaughter. It was also the first time they have seen their son since his engagement party. And they wanted to establish a great relationship with their daughter-in-law, Shanann. Cindy said, we didn't want to rock the boat, but we did notice things when we were there. But we didn't want to say anything to him because we had just gotten back to a place to where we could even see him and now our granddaughter. Chris's parents bonded with Bella instantly. And from that point on, they would always visit Colorado two times a year. And they said, although Shanann continued to post photo after photo of Chris and their seemingly perfect marriage, Cindy said she saw a very different side of that relationship. She said Chris always seemed like he was so anxious. And if Shanann needed anything, he would jump and run. He wouldn't just walk, he would run. And it was very odd, he just seemed always nervous. That's what Cindy said every time she would look at all these photos, she said she could just see that he was nervous. And on the 10th of January, Shanann actually celebrated her 30th birthday. And she posted photos of Chris and Ronnie holding Bella, and Bella was now three weeks old. Cindy said, I really tried to like her. I tried to love her. And at times, I did love her, but then it would just start back all over again. Shanann always found something wrong with us. Chris loved being a father. He would change her diapers, read her a bedtime story every night before he put her to bed, make her bottles. He loved to brag on Bella, and he seemed like the perfect father. Shanann had the nursery in Bella's room just beautiful. She even painted, hand-painted, a chandelier on the wall above her crib. And then in May of 2014, Chris left Longmont Ford, and he went to work for Covenant Technologies as an oil field operator. This was in Greeley, Colorado, and Shanann actually found him the job, and he was even making more money there than he was at Longmont. He was working in the oil fields here, testing wells and doing general maintenance. And soon, the carpal tunnel he had cleared up. And then that spring, while Shanann was still working at Children's Hospital at night, her lupus flared up. Also, at this time, she was working part-time at the children's place that was in Colorado Springs. And she was also doing direct sales with custom jewelries and instant coffee companies. Chris said she's very business-minded. So all of that just kind of fell into place because she had all of this knowledge from running all these business and custom shops and cell phone sales. She was just very business-minded. And then in July of 2014, Shanann's brother Frankie arrived in Frederick to stay with Chris and Shanann for a while. He was very excited to meet his six-month-old niece, and he was even considering relocating to Colorado. And Frankie mostly just stayed there at the house and looked after Bella. Frankie said that he was very happy to help with Bella, and Shanann was a new mom. And everything was just so super clean, and everything was super prepared. And we were just having so much fun. And while Frankie was staying there, he also closely was observing Chris and Shanann's relationship. Frankie said, I was really surprised at how subservient he was. He said there was one time that Shanann even told Chris, insult me, just insult me. She just wanted to get some kind of emotion out of him. And Shanann told Frankie, said, can you tell him, just call me an asshole. Tell him to call me a bitch or something. Frankie said he was just one of those yes men. And he was in love with her. He was obsessed. And then around the middle of August 2014, Frankie really wasn't having any luck finding a job there. So he flew back to his parents' house in Aberdeen, North Carolina. But as luck would have it, an old friend of Shanann's from Pinehurst High School, they were friends in high school together, Lauren Arnold, 
she actually ended up moving to Colorado because her husband was stationed there with the Army. And it wasn't long after they arrived there that Shanann had already invited them to her and Chris's home to have dinner. And that was the first time Lauren had ever met Chris. All of Shanann's friends absolutely loved Chris. Um, they were really, really impressed by if they ever needed a hand or, you know, just called on him maybe to, to help him do something that he would always be there, no questions asked. And Jeremy Lindstrom actually made a point of saying if he ever needed any kind of help with his car, especially, that Chris would just like bend over backwards to help and never would expect anything in return. David Cullen was also another one of their friends that they had met at Longmont, and he was really good friends with Chris and Shanann as well. Dave said that he thought Chris was like the perfect father. He was great, but he also said that he was honestly surprised by their personalities because Chris is very, like, non-combative, and he wouldn't confront anyone with anything, and that really makes him perfect for her because she likes to be the one in control, and she likes to be the one to run things. And then the week before Christmas, um, Chris and Shanann signed a new lease on a brand new 2015 Ford Explorer. And the payments on that vehicle was $588 a month on top of their $2,800 mortgage. And now they were extremely in debt. Okay, that concludes Chapter 7. Going into Chapter 8 is titled, You Are an Amazing Husband and Father. On Shanann's birthday, January the 10th, of 2015, Shanann turned 31 years old, and it was on this day that she announced her pregnancy of little Cece. And Chris had recently been hired as a operator at Anadarko in the field, which is one of Colorado's biggest oil and gas industries. This job would pay him $61,500 per year. He worked out of the Platteville office in Colorado, but most of the time he was just out in the fields maintaining the different battery sites. And by this time, Bella was already 15 months old and she had already started walking. Bella was a bit of a handful in March. Um, Shanann actually posted a photo of Bella trying to eat a tampon on her Facebook page. And then just a couple of days later, Shanann went online. She announced that the new baby was a girl and they would be naming her Celeste. And her caption was, it won't be too much longer until we meet our little princess, Celeste. And a few weeks after that announcement, Frank and Sandy Rusek moved to Colorado to live with Chris and Shanann. And they lived in the basement and they left Frankie to care for their home there. Later on Dr. Phil, um, Sandy actually said that they actually lived with them for 15 months. She said that she closed up her hair salon and moved to Colorado so she could help Shanann through the pregnancy. But Chris did describe as living with his in-laws being very stressful because um, Shanann and her mom argued quite a bit. When Frank and Sandy, of course, first got to Colorado, obviously they didn't have a job and they were just always there. But soon Frank found a job in construction and Sandy found a job in a hair salon. Um, Shanann at this time was working nights at the hospital, so it helped her with her mom working days and her working nights. That way they kind of weren't right together all the time and at each other's, you know, right in each other's face. From, from what Chris said, they argued quite a bit. They just didn't get along very well, Shanann and her mother. Chris said it took a while to get used to living with them and the dogs that they had brought with them to their home because it did lead and give him and Shanann lots of tension between the two. Chris said like every day they had a clash because Sandy was trying to always tell Shanann how she should be raising Bella, and Shanann just wasn't having it. Chris said every time he came home from work, he didn't know what to expect, if Shanann was going to be pissed off or if she was going to be okay. He was just, he never knew what to expect when he got home. He said while they were living with them, it was really like he was always just walking on eggshells, not knowing what to expect. On May the 16th, on Chris's birthday, Shanann made a post with her and the girls telling Chris how great and wonderful he was. And she said, you are an amazing husband and father to me and the girls. We are truly blessed to have you in our life. And then on June the 1st, 2015, Shanann and Chris filed for bankruptcy. At this time, they owed almost $450,000. And 70000 of that was credit cards, medical bills, and some student loans. 
They filed Chapter 7, and at the time, they had less than $10 in two savings accounts and just 860 in their checking accounts. The biggest part of the 70000 came from credit card debt from different ret retail stores like there was Macy's, Sears, Nordstrom, Toys R Us. The bankruptcy paper said their 2014 income was $90,000 combined, which was a pretty big drop from their year's prior income, which was $147,200 and something dollars. Their mortgage and their car payments and insurance actually took up the biggest part of their little under $5,000 per month joint. Both of their incomes combined was just under $5,000 a month. But with their house payment being $2,800 and then their car payment being almost $600, there wasn't a whole lot left for electric, phones, you know, and food and just regular spending and need. So they were relying on credit cards to make all their other purchases. Their bankruptcy records also noted that Shanann was expecting another child and she would be working fewer hours. And then on July the 17th, on a Friday, Shanann gave birth to little Celeste. Chris was in the delivery room when Celeste Catherine was born, but Celeste was born very sick. She was born with E-O-E. That is where her esophagus was too small. It is like an allergic swallowing disorder. And for her whole first year of life, she had to be on steroids to help her breathe. And then in August of 2015, the judge agreed to discharge their bankruptcy after they both completed and passed an online bankruptcy. They both took the online credit course and they did pass in their bankruptcy. Most of it was discharged at that time. And they both earned a financial management course certificate for passing and completing the test. Shanann told only a few friends about the bankruptcy, but she did talk about it with her mom. Sandy said they, Shanann did talk to her about it and they had a lot of debt and it was mostly medical bills. Shanann also told her good friend from school, Lauren Arnold. Arnold said that Shanann really didn't seem stressed out about it and she told her that in the long run, uh, filing bankruptcy was going to help her and Chris. Lauren said that Shanann just mentioned that they had just gotten behind on some things and they did argue about it sometimes. But later on, Chris actually said that he was kind of surprised and caught off guard that they were behind on things when they had to file bankruptcy. He really didn't know what was happening because Shanann was the one that, you know, handled all their finances. He was kind of surprised by it. And he was actually feeling a lot more pressure in the marriage, especially with Celeste being on the way. But he said he just, like he always did, he just bottled it up and went with whatever she said to do. He said bankruptcy is something that I never thought would ever happen. And a lot of the debt was from the wedding because we just put everything on the credit cards. He went on to say that he never mentioned their financial problem even to his parents. And that's why Ronnie was said, I had no idea they were bankrupt. Ronnie said Chris was making decent money, but it's like Shanann wanted to have a certain kind of profile and to have just the best of everything. Okay, that concludes Chapter 8. And going into Chapter 9, it is titled Thrive. In January of 2016, Shanann signed up to be a promoter for Thrive with promises and thoughts that it was going to transform her life. It gave her new friends and an amazing new job and a powerful social media outlet. And she would get all kinds of attention that many people believed that she was craving. Thrive consisted of a capsule, a shake, and a DFT, which is a dermafusion technology patch that you do every day. The patch you could wear anywhere on the body, and it delivered all through the day the vitamins, minerals, and nutrients that your body needed. The parent company of Thrive is called Lavelle. They were founded in 2013, and now they're worth over $1 billion in sales. Later on, Shanann admitted when she started selling Thrive, she was going through a really dark period. She said, I was broke, working full-time at the hospital, and had a part-time job. She said she was working nearly 60 hours a week and still being a full-time mom. She said, I had to work all night and then took care of my babies all day. 
So she bought her first round of Thrive, and she persuaded Chris to take it with her, being that he was weighing 245 pounds at the time. On day one, she said Chris started it with her, and they both noticed a change like right away. She said Chris took the capsule, the shake, and the patch, and then he told her, Shanann, I feel like I could actually run a marathon. And then Shanann started recruiting her friends and family into Thrive. Within just five days, she had enrolled two new customers and sold over $800 in Thrive. And she earned a VIP 800 award in just five days. Amanda Aikman, who was her team leader, posted on Facebook, Big congratulations to Shanann Watts for making her first VIP 800 and crushing it. She went on to say, This girl is on fire. Way to go, Shanann. And then, just one week later, Shanann had already acquired VIP 1600. She had already recruited in another two customers and another $800 in sales. She was then hooked and started preaching and telling everyone about Thrive in a religious kind of way. Very soon, Shanann had her own parents on Thrive, and she was posting photos of her and her mom, both wearing their patches, and she captioned it, Thriving with Mama. She was now on Facebook, proudly stating how she was no longer on any of her lupus medication, and Thrive had helped her to get off all the medication, and she was feeling great. I was literally dancing around the living room, she said, having fun with Bella while Cece was taking a nap. She said, I felt amazing. I had no pain, no aches, no discomfort. It was bliss. By Shanann's fourth week of being on Thrive and starting Thrive, she had already progressed to 4K VIP. She had earned over $1,000 in commission as well as a free iPod. And again, Amanda Aikman posted, this girl is on fire. Then Shanann began contacting all of her high school friends from back in North Carolina. Many of them hadn't even heard from her in many years, but she was contacting them now, trying to get them to sign up for Thrive. Colby Cruz said she would call and text, and most of the time it was about pushing me to take Thrive. She really wanted to get me on board, but that just wasn't my cup of tea. But when she contacted another friend, Morgan Langford, she did take it, and she said she remembers she... Got her on her first month of Thrive. She said Shanann did send it to her and it did help. And Shanann was really good at promoting it. Also, Shanann's friend Lauren Arnold, she also signed her up. But Lauren did not stay with Thrive because of how expensive it was. Lauren said, I think she had everybody on Thrive. Lauren said, I gave it a shot, but I didn't stick with it because really it was really expensive. But I could see how it would be very beneficial to her because she had lupus, and it would help Shanann mentally and physically. And Shanann also enlisted Chris under her as a Thrive promoter, um, getting him to try to enlist his in a Darko co-workers. But Chris really wasn't a salesman because he was very shy and withdrawn from talking to people. So Shanann would write all of his Facebook posts, and he just went along with it. And then by April, Shanann had already advanced to 12K VIP. She now qualified for Lavelle's VIP Club, which gave her an automobile, and it would make the payment up to $800 a month. Shanann chose a white Lexus, and she persuaded Chris to go ahead and trade in his beloved Mustang on the Lexus. Ronnie Watts was kind of shocked when that happened because he said, Chris loved that Mustang, I can't. and then he ended up trading it in to get that Lexus. By this time, Chris had been working for Anadarko for 16 months. He was very good at the job at Anadarko, and people actually called him the Brain Man because of his photographic memory. And the people he worked with really didn't know what to make of Chris because he barely ever even spoke to anyone. And then in April, Luke Eppel became his main boss, and he considered Chris one of his most reliable employees. Luke said he's a little bit quiet and reserved, Sometimes I actually have to pry a conversation out of him, but he's a very good employee. Each morning, Chris and his team would meet in the office at Platteville, where they would receive their assignments and job duties for the day. Luke said Chris was closest to another one of the field coordinators named Troy McCoy. Troy was the one that originally trained Chris, 
And they said that when they were in the oil fields, that Chris's main topic of interest to talk about was oh, Bella and Celeste and the things they were doing and achieving and just a very doting father. Troy said any time he talked about the girls, his whole face would just light up. They were the center of Chris's world. And Shanann was working hard towards her thrive business, and it was paying off very well. And her success was giving her a newfound independence. And Shanann was very empathetic, so she truly believed she was on a mission to help other people and improve other people's lives. And just over her first few months of selling Thrive, she made a lot of new friends, and she adopted them in her Thrive family. They were like, they were like one big family. Eddie Maloney wrote on Facebook, I love this girl so much. There isn't another loving, caring soul more than Shanann wants. And I'm so happy this company has connected us in this friendship. In May, Shanann marked her four-month anniversary with being with Thrive on Facebook. She said, my only motivation to keep going was my husband, Chris, because on his very first day of Thrive, he was a revived person. He beamed with joy, energy, and clarity that you will hear all Thrivers speak of. And I wanted to feel as good as he was. Okay, going into part four, we're actually going to be on chapter 10 of the book, part one, chapter 10. And the title of this chapter is Daddy's Thriving. The whole summer of 2016, Shanann really focused on selling her Thrive especially on Facebook. She had jumped right into it, and she was preaching it to all of her friends, her family, and making new friends through her Facebook, which was public, and she was promoting her thrive business, and she was doing very well at it. She was posting very many photos of her and Chris and the girls, posing, showing off the product, talking about the product, showing what it was doing for them, telling them how, tell, just telling everybody how it was making them feel and how great it was. And that this was throughout the entire summer of 2016. So many of the photos was actually of Chris, where he was either drinking protein shakes or showing off his patches on his arms or wherever he may have them stuck to him at. But later on, Chris said that he actually hated being all over social media and making all these pictures and like being a poster child for Thrive. And the only reason that he did it to begin with was just to help Shanann and her business. But he said he just never did complain about it, and he just done whatever she said because she was the one that called the shots in the marriage, and he didn't want to upset her, so he just done what she said. He said she would call or text him and say, take a picture showing your patch, and so he would, and then she would, he would send the picture to her, and then she would make a big post about uh, the photo that he sent her, that she asked him to send her. On July the 17th, 2016, Shanann threw a really nice birthday party for Celeste for her very first birthday. Sandy, Shanann's mom, invited Nicole Atkinson. Um, Sandy actually worked with Nicole in a hair salon, so she invited her to Celeste's party as well. And when Shanann and Nicole met, they immediately hit it off. They, they were just like instant best friends, and they did have children the same age because Nicole Atkinson also had a little girl the same age as Celeste. And Shanann turned Nicole on to Thrive, and it wasn't very long before Nicole was also a big part of Shanann's Thrive team. Nicole said, yeah, she got me to doing Thrive with her. It gives you lots of mental clarity, and you will actually just stop craving stuff such as ice cream. She said, I don't even crave ice cream anymore, and I don't drink coffee. And during all this, Chris, he was just over in the background, and he was just trying to teach Bella how to swim. Everyone in the neighborhood knew him or had saw him. He was very familiar to them because they saw him so much pulling um, Bella in the wagon up to the swimming pool at Wyndham Hill Estates. They had a swimming pool facility there, and he would pull Bella in the wagon up there almost every day while he was teaching her how to swim. One of the neighbors, her name was Colleen Henderson, and when she was interviewed, she said he seemed like just a really doting dad. And she saw him quite regularly because she only lived like two doors away from them. When I saw Shanann walk by, I would just say hi and just tell her, you know, how cute the little girls were. And then around that time, Nate, the neighbor, he moved into the neighborhood. And as soon as he moved in, he said Shanann just went straight over there and welcomed him right into the neighborhood. 
Nate said she was always really, really friendly, and the little girls, they was just always running around laughing, and you could just tell they was, they was very happy, always having a good time. And he said, but Chris, he was really quiet. He was just kind of like, you know, really standoffish. Also, that summer in 2016, around the first week of August, that is when Anthony Brown started working at Anadarko. Anthony was 29 years old. Anthony said, Chris is actually the one that trained me. He just took me under his wing. He said that Chris would just drive him around the oil fields and he would give him some really professional and important tips about his work. He would show him how to troubleshoot all of the tanks and the wells. Anthony said, he really, he just knew everything. Every day when I was on my route, he would show me the routine. And then on the sixth year anniversary of Chris and Shenan's very, very odd and weird and awkward first date, she posted a very happy, very, very much in love photo of them at the Wyndham Hill swimming pool. And they were sporting and showing off their Thrive patches. Lauren Arnold, a high school best friend of Shanann's, she said she just thought they were like the perfect couple. Like they were always lovey-dovey and doting, and they, they were just like the perfect couple. It's like they just looked so happy together that people that didn't know them might think it was like a front or something. They were just too happy. They looked too happy. Or like Shanann was just trying to portray some kind of perfect marriage. But Lauren said there was no portraying anything. That is just how they were. They were like the perfect couple, and they were lovey-dovey, never argued. I mean, they were the perfect couple. However, even though Shanann thought and everyone else thought it was just the perfect marriage, deep back of Chris's mind, he despised being put out front and being put on camera and put all over social media because he was so introverted. Yet, he never complained. He never told Shanann that he didn't like that. But but really, deep inside, the resentment and the just utter hate of being the center of attention in the spotlight, the resentment was just growing and growing. And then, like over the next month, Shanann had posted so many photos, they said, of the picture-perfect family on Facebook. The majority of them was the girls, and they were playing together and just having fun and just showing off all their different cute little outfits. And on uh, Frank, um, Shanann's dad, he commented on one of them, and he said, oh, how they love each other. There was also one during this time that she posted of Chris mowing the front yard, but he had a baby strapped to his back as he mowed the yard. And Shanann captured that picture, Daddy's Throbbing. He got tired of chasing them, so he attached them. Also in August of 2016 is when um, Shanann enrolled Bella, who was two years old, at Primrose, the daycare slash school. Every morning, Shanann would drop her off at 8 a.m., and then she would be picked up at 5 p.m. And this was done so Shanann could actually concentrate and work on her Thrive business. During this time, when she would drop off and pick up Bella, she had started talking to the director of the school, and they chatted together quite often. And soon, she started talking to her, also, about all the benefits of Thrive. The director's name was Amanda Thayer. She talked to Amanda quite often about Thrive and would show her the patches and tell her all about it. And finally, after nine months of her talking to Amanda about it, Amanda decided to go ahead and try it. That concludes Chapter 10. Now going into Chapter 11, that is titled, Hashtag Team Rockstars. By September of 2016, Shanann had already progressed up to 40K VIP promoter with Thrive, and this took her to a whole new level with the company. By this time, she had many customers and promoters that was working under her. With her Thrive business going really well, and it's showing that she was being very successful at it, at this point, she was thinking about quitting at Children's Hospital and just going full-time to sell Thrive. She said, this is one of the biggest accomplishments I've ever done, and my next goal is 200K. Her friend Addie Maloney was just congratulating her so much on working her tail off. Addie wrote, there is no one more deserving as a leader. Shan, you make us so proud. Your dedication is abundant, and it is paying off. Shanann pulled out all the stops so she could present her and Chris as a team together with Thrive. 
She even invented the hashtag Team Rockstars. But really, behind the scenes, she was the one doing all of the work, even on his behalf. She would post on social media, and she was like, stage these photos and these photo opportunities about Thrive. But because of Shanann doing this and doing it on his behalf as well, he actually, Chris, got up to a 12K status himself. He earned his car bonus as well. But she did tell Chris, don't ever tell anyone that I am the one posting for you because this has to be you. So don't tell anyone that I'm the one doing this. Chris said she put me underneath her. He said, I'm not good like selling like she is, like she can sell anything. He said, like if I was at the pool or the mall and I tried to talk to someone about it, he said, I would just like stumble all over my words. He said, I am not a salesman. But people would never know that because on Facebook, Shannon was applauding him and being so proud of him for all of his sales and his hard work with Thrive. She wrote, I'm so excited for my husband, Chris, for earning his car bonus. I'm so proud of you, honey. But on another note, at this same time, Bella and Celeste were both constantly sick, like all the time. And Shannon was constantly having to take him for medical treatment regularly. On Facebook, she described one of the scenarios. Up all night long, back and forth, to each bedroom, just trying to help them to breathe better, soothe their coughs, and comfort them. I hate them feeling so bad and miserable. And then it was only four days later that Shannon had to take Celeste to the hospital at 4 a.m. in the morning for a blocked tear duct. And then she had to go straight to the dentist because she blessed her mouth. And then very soon after that, Bella had to be admitted into Children's Hospital with pneumonia. Shanann had posted pictures of her on Facebook with a face mask on just after they had done x-rays. Shanann's mother, Sandy, said that Bella and Celeste were just back and forth to doctors. Sandy said, I told Shanann they had asthma and she needed to find another doctor. Also, many times, Chris had to take time off work because of the doctor's appointments. His boss, Luke Apple, said that Chris had told him uh, that they had many health issues and it was causing lots of problems. Luke said both of Chris's kids has been pretty sick over the last couple of years. And he would talk to me about the stress that the girls being sick all the time did put on him and Shanann. Towards the end of September of 2016, that is when Shanann actually started posting her live Facebook videos. Pretty much all of her live videos was actually for her business about Thrive. And she would talk about things like how Thrive to help her make it through the day and make it through having sick babies and and even though Shanann was once very shy and insecure, now she had blossomed and was a natural and loved being in front of the camera. When she started doing her live videos on Facebook, that is when her business really began to pick up. And once she seen how her going live on Facebook was really making her successful in her business, there was no stopping her then. She even had her own catchphrase, and that was, I am super excited. Even her ninth grade drama teacher, Matt Francis, became an instant big fan of her Facebook lives. He was really, really impressed um, at how far Shannon had came because she was the shy, quiet, insecure teenager, and now she was a blossoming, successful woman. He said, I would really try to encourage her and let her know that I think it's awesome what she was doing. And now that he was back in touch with Shannon, he followed her Facebook lives, posts, and everything very closely. He said she turned her self-loathing into a positive. He said that she just flipped a switch and she told him that she was just going to put her life out there and let everyone see her life and how her life was and hopefully that would encourage others. In one of the videos, Shannon actually hid and secretly recorded Chris in the kitchen with the girls playing and he was singing the Mickey Mouse song, Hot Dog. And Bella and Celeste was just watching him and laughing. And in this video, you can see that Chris was wearing his favorite Metallica shirt that read, Metal Up Your Ass. And he had also recently got a giant Metallica tattoo on his back. And it reached from shoulder to shoulder. He actually got the tattoo as just a tribute to his very favorite band. And since Chris did not have a clue that Shanann was actually videoing him, he done a little dance at the end. And Shanann titled this video, Best Daddy Ever. And she put a hashtag, he's going to kill me. And because of all of Shanann's success during this time, 
they earned an all expense paid vacation to New Orleans. This is the first vacation that Chris and Shanann ever got to take together, and it would also be the first time that she was able to meet all of her Thrive friends in person. And then the big deal of the New Orleans trip, there was going to be a big fancy masquerade-like ball. So Shanann took Chris shopping to find the perfect suit for him to wear. The night before they left to go to New Orleans, Shanann took a picture of her nightstand to show a book that she had been reading. It was a book by Dale Carnegie, and it was titled How to Win Friends and Influence People. And, of course, beside that was a framed picture of her and Chris. On October the 5th, Shanann and Chris went to the Denver airport to fly out for their vacation. Shanann posted a photograph of both of them showing off their throw patches. In Houston, they had a switchover. And while she was at the airport, she also met another Thrive member for the very first time, Christy McMullen. And, of course, Shanann was posting photographs of her and Christy from the airport terminal. When they got to New Orleans, they checked into the Hyatt Motel and unpacked and got everything squared away there, and then they went out. Chris, Shanann, and Christina Meacham went out to explore the French quarters of New Orleans. Christina is an old friend of Shanann's, and she now lived in Hawaii. They went over to the Cafe Soleil and had a Cajun dinner, and Shanann posted a group shot of all of them on Facebook. The very next night was the masquerade ball, and Shanann and Chris got dressed up, and they attended. Shanann wore a beautiful purple sequined gown, and it had a side slip up the side, and she had on a very graphic, decorated mask. Chris wore his new suit, a tie, and he wore a Phantom of the Opera mask. Chris looked like he was having a really good time, and he was posing for photos with the others for group shot photos for posting to Facebook. Even though he hated the pictures and hated the spotlight, he even posed for a goofy-like picture where he was wearing a bunny hat um, right before their trip back home. By now, the holidays were getting really close, so Shanann got more intense with her lives and postings on Facebook. She was holding a lot of Thrive promotions and things like that for her customers. By now, it was like, it seemed like Thrive was just like the main focus of their supposedly idyllic and perfect marriage. And in order for her to recruit new customers, she was actually giving some pretty big incentives to these people. And she was even investing her own money just to buy competition prizes. In one Facebook Live, she actually was talking about how Chris had become a cleaning machine after he had tried this new patch by Thrive. She said, Chris actually and literally cleaned the whole house while I was out running errands. And then he went on to lift weights for an hour. Okay, that concludes Chapter 11. Going into Chapter 12, and it is titled, He completes me. By the middle of November of 2016, Shanann was so ready and super excited for the holidays. She had already put up and trimmed out two Christmas trees in the living room and taken Bella and Cece to the mall to see Santa Claus. And her friend, Addie Maloney, had told her, you need to share everything you're grateful for for the next two weeks. And Shanann immediately knew what her number one grateful for was. She wrote, my husband, Chris. He is my biggest supporter. He is an amazing father to our beautiful two little girls, and he is the best husband ever. She went on to say how she was growing as a person herself, and she became very emotional. She said, my husband is very shy, but we blend perfectly as individuals because I am very outgoing and very vocal, whereas he is shy and behind the scenes, so to speak. And he's grown a lot in the last couple of months. Not long after, by Thanksgiving, Shanann was already counting down the days to her and Chris's next Thrive vacation to Punta Conta. Chris's parents were going to come and babysit Bella and Celeste when they went on their vacation. Seeing that Shanann and Chris had never actually been abroad, they had to go apply for passports. She said that they wanted to do their honeymoon in Cancun, but they had not been able to afford that. She said, Chris and I just have not been able to travel the world together like we wanted to. We should have actually been on a couple of vacations together by now, but we haven't been able to. Shanann was busy trying to get her body back into shape so she could wear a bikini on the beach, and Chris had already asked for a time off of work to go on the vacation. I love being able to travel with my husband and kids when we're ready to go, she said. 
and to take them places and even go to Disney. Those are the memories you're creating with your family. On November the 27th, Shanann posted one of her last challenge requests of what she was grateful for. And she wrote, I'm very grateful for my in-laws. It was a rough start six years ago, but today we are closer than ever. I'm so blessed to have supporting, motivating, and encouraging in-laws. They are just amazing grandparents and amazing second parents for me. And just a few days after that, her and Chris were out buying Christmas presents at Toys R Us. And Chris actually bought himself something pretty special. Shanann thought it was absolutely hilarious, so she had to go on Facebook to tell everyone. She actually was teasing them, uh, everyone that was watching, and she was like challenging them, like, what do you think it could be? Just take a guess. What do you think it was that Chris had to have his special gift? And she was just messing with them, trying to see if someone could guess what it was that Chris found so interesting and something that he loved so much at Toys R Us that he had to buy for himself. Nobody guessed what it was. When all the guesses were exhausted, Shanann finally revealed that it was a fart blaster. And then she just got this really big smile on her face and she started demonstrating what the the toy would do. She was just pulling the trigger and it just continued to make like fart sounds. And she was like, are you serious? This is what Chris wanted? And she was pulling the trigger on it as she said that. She was just like, seriously, dude? The very first week of December, Celeste ate two cashew nuts and she had a very serious allergic reaction. She got sick all over Shanann and she just broke out in these big hives, big whelps. Shanann had to rush her to Children's Hospital and when they got there, uh, Celeste actually vomited three more times. Shanann posted from the hospital saying, this is extremely scary. She said, Chris came from work, which I'm very grateful for. They gave her an EpiPen, Zofran, and Prednisone. Celeste actually had to stay there for nine hours because the doctors wanted to keep her under observation before they would diagnose her with a severe allergy to nuts, which had caused her an anaphylactic reaction. Later on that night, Shanann posted and thanked everyone for all their support. She wrote, We're officially home and showered. Thanks everyone for the prayers and thoughts today. This was the scariest thing we've ever had to deal with. By now, Shanann was actually posting more and more and longer and longer Facebook lives from the office in her home. She would begin with her daily Thrive promotion, and then she would get on to talking about her daily life as being a wife and mother. But her recurring theme through all of her posts was her deep love for Chris. In one of her lives, she said, I could not have asked God for a better man to put into my life. He's just so supportive, and he takes care of me, and he's probably the best father I could have ever asked for for our girls. I just couldn't have asked for a better man. She said, but he completes me. I know that's a cliche, but it is the truth. He completes me. Bella turned three years old on December the 17th. Shanann threw her a Princess Sophia party, and she invited all of Bella's friends. Shanann posted, Happy birthday, my beautiful princess. These three years has taught us so much. Your love is pure and innocent. You're an amazing big sister and a wonderful daughter. Love you so much. But then the very next day after Bella's party, she had to be rushed again to Children's Hospital. Shanann posted on Facebook, Bella has an ear infection. And Celeste is throwing up. I'm hoping it's from congestion and not another virus. I have the DFT patches, though, to keep me strong and healthy for my sick kiddos. Later on, she posted that both of the girls were diagnosed with a croup infection and a respiratory infection of their upper airways. And what that does is it blocks breathing and it causes like a loud, like almost cough. And then on Christmas morning, again, Chris dressed up in the full Santa Claus outfit so he could get Bella and Celeste their Christmas presents. And Shanann was very happy with the present that Chris had bought for her. It was a t-shirt and it had three words on it, wife, mom, and boss. Okay, that concludes chapter 12. Moving on into chapter 13, and it is titled Punta Cana. On January the 1st, 2017, Shanann welcomed in the new year with a live from her Lexus, and Chris was driving. She was wearing a Pittsburgh Steelers shirt and telling her viewers about the vision board and explaining how it was going to help her 
and her family obtain their goals before 2017. A vision board is actually something that was endorsed by Oprah Winfrey. What it is, is it's like a board, and it's one big collage of like pictures and statements and dreams, desires, and what it means is so you can visualize these dreams, and if you can visualize them daily, then you can obtain them. She was explaining this to her viewers, and she was like, it really is a truly incredible thing to do. She said, when you can see your goals every day and see your dreams, then you know what you want to accomplish. And she said, I think it really sets forth a really good guide for the year. She planned to have two vision boards in her office as well as others throughout the whole house. I think the more you can see what you want to accomplish, whether it's big or small, it really kicks in your mindset and will encourage you to work towards it. It truly is inspiring. She went on to say that a decade earlier, when she made her very first vision board, that it did encourage her and she was able to build her own home. And she said, I did that at 25 years old. So I think it's very important to sit down and look at what your last year has been, what you left there and what you want to bring in to 2017. Just things that will empower yourself. Meanwhile, Chris had toned up his body pretty good and got into really good shape since he had started using Thrive. He had already started eating healthy food, joined a gym, and had took a run every morning before work. His co-worker, Anthony Brown, said he would drink water like crazy, at least two or three gallons a day at work. Also, occasionally at this time, Chris was actually joining some of his work buddies at a place called the Georgia Boys Barbecue in Frederick. They would just go after work and have some drinks and hang out for a little bit. And Chris was actually going and hanging out with them. Bill Ferry, who was the bartender there, he said that they would all just usually come in as a big group, you know, eat something, have a few drinks. Bill said the people from the oil industry actually come to this restaurant quite often. And so, yeah, I recognize his face. But another co-worker, Cody Roberts, uh, that also worked with Chris, he said that during these get-togethers, though, Chris was always pretty quiet. Cody said, really, Chris keeps most of his personal life to himself. That's just who he is. It's like when the kids were sick, he would say something. When they got a new car, he would say something. He's quiet, but he's really friendly. And also, by now in 2017, Shannon's Facebook lives, they were coming, they were starting to be more personal, with a lot of the focus being on Chris and the girls. And she would even become emotional when she was talking about and describing her perfect marriage. In late January, she said, Chris and I have an amazing relationship. She said, we just get each other. She said, I am definitely the dominant one in this relationship. And Chris, he is very sweet and kind. I'm the high strong one, she said. But there was some hints that not everything was so perfect in Chris and Shanann's home. Their neighbor, Nate, said that late at night in 2017, that he could hear Chris and Shanann sometimes arguing pretty loudly um, through their window in their bedroom. He said that he could hear that. So maybe it wasn't as perfect as it was put out to be. He said, but when he would see them together, like outside or something like that, they always just seemed so loving and affectionate with each other. But yet, he could hear them arguing at night, late at night. At the end of January, Ronnie and Cindy Watts arrived in Colorado at Chris and Shanann's home to take care of Bella and Celeste, while Chris and Shanann went to Punta Cana. Shanann posted pictures of Cindy being welcomed by Bella and Celeste at the airport. Shanann even took Cindy for a manicure and pedicure. She posted a photograph of her and Cindy getting a manicure and pedicure on Facebook. Then she signed Ronnie up as a Thrive promoter. Later on, Cindy said she tried to pump everybody full of Thrive. Cindy said she got Ronnie on it, and I even took it. And when I took it, it made me so jittery. We only did it for Chris. Then a few days later, Shanann took a photo of Ronnie, and he was showing off his DFT patch on his upper arm. She posted the photo, and she captioned it, A huge shout-out to Ronnie Watts for accomplishing 4K VIP and 4K rank. You are on fire. 
And then on January the 31st, which was a Tuesday, Chris and Shanann flew to Punta Cana. They had a stopover in Charlotte, North Carolina. While they were waiting, Shanann posted a jokingly playful photo of Chris with his teeth showing, pretending to bite her face while she had like a filter, a Facebook filter on her face with bunny ears. At 1.30 a.m., they landed at the Dominican Republican, and there they were welcomed by three merengue players. You could tell they were having a really good time. Chris even done a little dance for the video, and then they headed to the Hard Rock Cafe and Casino. And then the next morning, Shanann did a live, and she gave all of her Facebook viewers a tour of her hotel room. She pointed out that it had a jacuzzi and a fully stocked bar. She said, this place is absolutely gorgeous. It's like a paradise. And even though Chris and Shanann was having an amazing time in like a paradise, back in Colorado, the two sets of parents was not getting along very well. Cindy and Ronnie had came to watch the girls while Sandy and Frank actually lived there and they were not getting along very well. Cindy and Ronnie just decided just to stay upstairs with the girls and Frank and Sandy, they just stayed in the basement. Later on, Sandy, Shanann's mom, was com complaining and made some complaints that she hadn't even been able to see her granddaughters. Sandy said that Cindy brought them upstairs and they stayed upstairs. She said that Cindy would not even let her hold the girls or anything. She said, I found that very odd. Sandy said, finally, she just asked Chris's mother what was going on, why? And when she did, there was a argument that the screaming and hollering and it all happened in front of the girls. Sandy said she texted Shanann over and over again and Shanann just said, relax, mom, I'll take care of it when we get home. And Sandy said that is the last time she spoke to Chris's mom. She's never spoke to her again. She said, I'd had enough. And then it was only just a few weeks later that Frank and Sandy just moved back to Aberdeen, North Carolina. And they took their dogs with them. Their son, Frank Jr., Frankie, he had been living in their house since they had been in Colorado. And he was not doing well. Shanann told one of her friends back in North Carolina that her brother Frankie was having some issues and he couldn't pay the bills. The friend said that it was really quick and she said that Shanann told her that Frank and Sandy did not want to lose their home. She said, but she did know that it did bother Shanann and I think it hurt her feelings, she said. Okay, that ends chapter 13. Going into chapter 14, which is titled Fat Burning Machine. In February of 2018, Shanann invited the Primrose director, Amanda Thayer, and her husband, Nick, over to her and Chris's house. Nick and Amanda's daughter, Emily, she immediately bonded with Celeste and Bella, and they became really good friends. And Chris and Nick got along great. They actually started running together every morning. And from that point on, the two families became very close. They met up on weekends, and soon enough, Shanann had both of them on Thrive. And Amanda became a promoter as well. Amanda thought that Shanann was absolutely smitten with Chris. Amanda said all she did was just always talk about how much she loved Chris and how Chris was her rock. Amanda's husband, Nick, was really impressed about what a loving family that the Watts just appeared to be. Nick said there was just always fun and laughter with them. He said they just seemed like the happy, perfect couple. Nick and Amanda uh, hang out the, at the Watts' house quite often, or they would just go out to eat together or just sit at Chris and Shanann's and play things like board games and Uno, but they did hang out together a lot. On one occasion, Shanann posted, we had a great time last night hanging out with our friends playing Uno. She went on to say, the men cheated. And then that evening, Shanann booked an appointment with a professional photographer so she could have some family photos made for Easter of her family. And Chris and Shanann and both girls posed with a life-size Easter bunny. And then Shanann uploaded all of the photos to Facebook over Easter holiday. And she also started posting these um, little love letters and inspirational quotes and just special little things from Chris that he was actually writing with Sharpie on their little Thrive packets and different things. On one of them it said, Strive for greatness. I am so lucky to have you. 80K to 200K. 
she would take pictures of these little love notes and things that Chris would leave her, and she would caption it, I love my little love notes that my husband leaves me every day. But some of her followers actually questioned if Shanann was actually writing those notes herself, and it really wasn't Chris. Once Shanann posted a photo of her and Chris headed out for a date night, her friend Amanda Aikman commented and said, Looking fabulous, but has Chris lost weight? And y'all have that thriver's glow. Shanann replied and said, Thank you. And Chris has lost almost 40 pounds. He's at 194 again. He's wearing a shirt I bought him seven years ago, and he feels amazing. And even though Shanann wrote all of Chris's Thrive Facebook post, she always told everybody that it was Chris writing the post. At this point, he was a 12K VIP promoter. At the beginning of April, she posted a picture of him working on his iPhone in like a muscle t-shirt. And she wrote at the top of it, I love watching him work his business and helping his friends along their Thrive journey. At the beginning of April, Shanann quit Children's Hospital and she wanted to devote her whole time to her business of Thrive. And she proudly posted this on Facebook. She posted a photo of her identification card from her job and she captioned it, I am officially retired from Children's Hospital. I've turned in my computer and badge. I'm so excited and I'm so looking forward to working from wherever my girls are. And it was that same week that Cindy and Ronnie flew back in so they could spend a few days with their granddaughters. And again, there was a lot of tension and monotony between Shanann and her in-laws. Her in-laws were actually struggling financially. Cindy said it was really a strain to go up there twice a year. She said, of course we spent money on the kids, but we put it on our credit cards. It really was difficult, but Cindy said that Shanann just didn't seem to understand that. Cindy said that nothing we did just never seemed like it satisfied her. And even though Cindy said she never saw Chris and Shanann argue, she did suspect that there was problems in the marriage. She said, I have never seen her scream at Chris, but I'm sure in private there was something. Because it's like Shanann always had this angry look on her face, like she was just disgusted with Chris. And he just tried to please her, please her, please her any way he could. And then it was just a week later that there was a big explosion in Firestone, Colorado, and it destroyed a home. Two men were killed, and a woman was injured. And it was only just a few yards away from an Anadarko oil well that was very much aging. And it was only eight miles from Chris and Shanann's home. And because of the explosion, Anadarko shut down 3,000 of their oil wells during this time so they could investigate the cause of that explosion. Chris and his whole team was out looking for problems and gas leakages. Anthony Brown said, we had to shut down all of our wells. He said that their team had lots of meetings because they were having to check their procedures for safety. And during all this is when Anthony Brown became closer to Chris. Anthony said there really wasn't a lot for us to do except sit and wait for instructions. So we would just talk and hang out. We would just talk about the Rockies game and the draft picks. And Chris was just big into sports. And so we just talked about things like that. And then twice a month, the Anadarko team would have like poker nights. Chris never went to any of their poker game nights, although he was invited. Anthony said that they were always trying to get regulars to come so they could get some good games going. And then a few times, Chris said that he was going to come, but he never did. So we just stopped asking him to come because we knew he wouldn't. And then on Chris's birthday in 2017, Chris turned 32 years old on May the 16th. And Shanann surprised him with a Metallica t-shirt and tickets for their upcoming show in Denver. And Chris was absolutely over the moon, totally ecstatic about his gift. She had somehow managed to keep it a secret because she had bought the tickets when the tour was very first announced. In her post, she said, I need a gold dollar bag for being able to keep this a secret for over two months. That is huge for me. And I think this birthday gift is up there with the rash supercharger that I bought him four years ago. And then she done a live stream of Chris opening his birthday present, which she had wrapped up in a large Thrive box. And Bella and Celeste watching, and they was just excited as Chris was, it seemed. When Chris pulled out the t-shirt and the tickets, 
He was like, oh my God, you've got to be kidding me. Are you serious? Then he reached over and gave Shanann a big kiss. And that may be the only genuine emotion that he had ever really showed in one of her lives. He was almost breathless and he was like, oh my goodness, hell yeah. And in the chat, there was a comment from Frankie Rusick Jr. And it said, you deserve it, bro. You're such a great man. And then in June, on the 5th, June the 5th, Celeste started her first day at Primrose Daycare School. Nine months after Bella had started Primrose, but now Bella was in pre-K one. It was going to be very expensive for both girls to attend the daycare. It was going to come at a price at $25,000 a year. And it was going to put even more of a strain on their finances. But Shanann justified the price saying that she would be more productive and more successful without their presence at home. She could get more done. And she posted about it and she said both girls are together for the first time at school. Chris and I have accomplished so much today since we dropped the kids off. And then a week after that, it was time for the concert. Shanann posted a photo of them in their Metallica shirts and dressed up for the Metallica concert and showing their patches. And she said, we are wearing Metallica's favorite DFT patches, Black Label. And then Shanann posted a video on Facebook and wearing his new Metallica t-shirt. And he looked absolutely ecstatic. She wrote on the video, the birthday boy is happy, as he jammed to the song Creeping Death, popping his fist up in the air. She also later posted another video of Chris standing there just rocking back and forth, holding up his cell phone with an awkward looking smile on his face. Shortly after, Shanann posted a photo of Chris proudly showing off the new duo patch, two patches on his back, and they were placed right under his big Metallica logo tattoo that was on his back that he had just recently got. And this new Thrive product was guaranteeing double the energy of the original Thrive patch. And beneath it, Shanann wrote, Fat Burning Machine. And then, over the next few months, Chris lost even another 20 pounds. And he even turned the basement into a gym with weights and elliptical machine. By now, he had turned into an absolute fanatic about his daily runs and workouts. His mom, Cindy, said he was on a lot of Thrive. She said he had that duo patch on, and that is actually a double patch for losing weight. And by now, Shanann was posting videos of Chris doing push-ups, having Bella and Celeste on his back. On one of them, she wrote, The girls are really giving Daddy a workout. This is like probably his 50th push-up. Hashtag Daddy Hulk. On June the 22nd, which was a Thursday, Shanann flew out to Toronto, and this would be her third LaBelle lifestyle getaway. Chris stayed home to watch the girls, but she had actually won a all-expense lifestyle getaway for two. But he didn't go because he had to stay home with the girls this time. And Shanann briefly mentioned on Facebook that while she was gone, Chris was going to be washing all the carpets. But I will be missing Chris on this one. But it's okay. He'll be with me on the next one this fall. On the first night, Shanann attended a party, and it was a thrift shop apparel party. She wore like a long, white, carnivalistic outfit, and she had long, tassel white earrings. The top was very tight-fitting, and it had like bell sleeves, and she wore stiletto shoes. And while she was there, she went on Facebook Live. She said one of the parts of coming to a lifestyle getaway is it is like coming and going on a fun vacation. No training. Nothing to do but mingling. And then the next night, there was a VIP party in the ballroom. And they announced that their next lifestyle getaway was going to be in October in Puerto Vallarta. And she posted, oh, how I cannot wait. Chris, we are going to have so much fun. And then on July the 17th, which was a Monday, Celeste turned two years old. And, of course, Shanann and Chris threw a birthday party, and they invited all their friends, including Nicole Atkinson and her one-year-old little girl, Madison. Shanann posted, Happy birthday, my sweet Celeste. With a picture of Chris and both of the girls, she said, I cannot believe you are two already. These last two years has shined so bright. You're silly, energetic, fearless, 
happy, loving, and you have an amazing personality. I couldn't thank God enough for placing you into our family. And then, just two days after Celeste's party, Bella was admitted again to Children's Hospital with trouble breathing. This time she was diagnosed with viral pneumonitis, inflammation of the lungs, and hypoxia. She was treated with a very deep suction, steroids, and oxygen. On Facebook, Shannon wrote, she's a tough little girl. And between Celeste's hospital visit just last week for difficulty breathing, I'm going to know all the doctors and nurses around here. The next day, Shannon posted a picture showing that both of the girls are now being treated with nebulizers, breathing machines for asthma and viral pneumonitis. She posted pictures of them hooked up to their breathing mask. And then every morning after a long five-mile run with Nick Bayer, Chris would drive his company truck, Verena Darko, to the company's Platteville office. At around 6.15, he would walk into the break room and join the rest of his team members as they sat and wait on their assignments. And just recently, a young girl named Nikki Kessinger, who worked in health and safety, had been assigned to work at the Anadarko office. And each morning, she would walk into the break room to the cafeteria so she could put her lunch in the fridge. And she always turned heads. Anthony Brown said, well, she was a brunette with a good body. Anthony said Chris would like to be on his laptop, but when Nikki walked by, he would always look up. And he would just stare at her kind of awkwardly. Most of the time, most days, someone would say something about what she was wearing. Um, just basic guy locker room talk. Oh, she knows she's attractive, Anthony said. And he said she was just trying to get attention. And when we talked about her, you could see Chris, he would just smirk. But he kept quiet. Later on, Nicole Kessinger actually told the detectives that even though she did notice Chris... She said that they never exchanged words. She said, when I go in the cafeteria, him and his whole team is just sitting there. I don't talk to him. I just walk out. But, according to police records and discoveries, on August the 3rd, 2017, at 11 p.m., she Googled and searched the Internet for Chris Watts. And then, a month later, she Googled Shanann Watts. Moving into Chapter 15 of Part 1, and it is titled, A Very Active Father. In August of 2017, the Anadarko workers, they called themselves the Anadarko team, they had a competition, and this competition was to see which employee could lose the most weight in three months. Chris said there's no way he can join in the competition because he had already lost enough weight with Thrive and he could not even afford to lose any more. After Chris told Anthony Brown this, then he tried to sell Anthony the duo patches so he could win the competition. Anthony refused the duo patches because he thought of Thrive as just being a pyramid scheme. Anthony said that Chris told him, but yeah, my wife's really high up there and she even got a free car. Anthony said that Chris even offered him incentives and commission just to join Thrive, but he said that was really the only time that Chris ever really talked to him. Anthony was friends with Chris on Facebook, and because of that, and because of Shanann tagging Chris and things, and all the Thrive stuff, um, he also saw everything Shanann was posting. So, after a while, Anthony said he just had to block Shanann because of her continuous posting of about Thrive and just random things like the girls going to school and what the girls wore to school that day and what she was going to cook for supper and just random things, And but he said it was pretty much a constant flow that, you know kind of overwhelmed his Facebook page, so he eventually did have to block Shanann. Another friend of Chris is David Cologne. He also had to defriend Shanann on Facebook for the very same reasons. David Cologne actually said, well, she posted like every three minutes, so I had to block her. He said it was really just kind of crazy. Even Cindy Watts, Chris's mother, just kind of tuned out uh, Shanann's Facebook post and all the photos of Chris and everything because she said she knew Chris was just faking the smiles and looking like he was happy in all of these photos because she knew her son did not like being the center of attention. Cindy said there was just so many videos out there and I just couldn't watch my son just going through the motions and I knew he was so uncomfortable. Ever since Shanann was like just a little girl, she, she had suffered from some extreme migraines. By this time, the headaches had become so bad that she chose to have 
arthropathic neck surgery in hopes that it would help fix the migraines she had suffered with her entire life. And maybe it would repair the degenerative disc that was causing all of the migraines. In mid-August of 2017, Shanann's friend, Christina Meacham, came in from Hawaii, and she came to stay with Shanann and Chris so she could help Shanann through her surgery and help her with the girls while she recovered. Also with Christina was her daughter, and her daughter was also the same age as Bella. Christina said that Shanann's like my sister, and I'm going to be her right-hand person until she is healthy enough again. Christina had met Chris um, prior to that, but it was just like casually on some of their lifestyle getaways with Thrive. But this was actually the first time that Christina had actually ever spent any long amount of time with Chris and Shanann since they had been together. Christina said, um, I thought they were great together and I thought they had an absolutely perfect marriage. She said their relationship was very, very impressive to her and how they focused so much on their children. And she said over the two months that she was with them, she was extremely impressed at how devoted Chris was to Shanann and the girls. She said that Chris would come home from work and help the kids get showered and get them ready for bed. She said he was a very active father, very loving, very caring, and very attentive to them. She also noticed how it seemed like Chris was just bow down to Shanann. And she said Shanann, even though that was her best friend, she said Shanann was OCD, especially in the way she done things in her house and the way she organized everything. Christina said, you know, Shanann was just the person in charge and Chris was the one that just followed the rules. He pretty much did what Shanann said. But also, Chris and Shanann seemed to be very lovey-dovey and in love with each other. On a Sunday, August the 20th, Shanann cooked a meal for only her and Christina. This was just one week before Shanann's surgery and her doctors had told her to stop taking Thrive. And during this meal together, Christina and Shanann was talking about their goals as they was drinking a bottle of white wine. But Shanann, at that point, did confide to Christina that her and Chris were struggling financially. She said especially since her spinal surgery was going to cost them $25,000 and that was definitely going to put them in debt. So Christina said, I know they did struggle, but I'm not sure to what point. Chris drove Shanann to the hospital and she underwent the neck and fusion surgery, ACDF, and that is to remove a degenerative disc in the neck. She had to have a one inch incision in her neck and they removed the disc and that was what was causing all the pressure on her spinal cord. And then a graft was inserted into the incision and it fused together the bones over and under the disc and then a plate was screwed to the front of her spine until it healed. The next day on Facebook, Chris announced that her surgery had been a success. On her Facebook page, he posted, This is Chris. I wanted to let everyone know that Shanann's next surgery yesterday went well. She's going to be staying another night and she is in a lot of pain. But she's doing good. She is still strong and she's trying to help others. Thank you everyone for all the prayers and calling and checking up on her. While Shanann was recovering, she had to wear a neck brace and she hated it. It made her very, very uncomfortable and very insecure. And the surgery had also left a very visible scar on her neck. But during her recovery, she never slowed down in her thrive business. Just hours after her surgery, still in her hospital bed, she earned the airfare for their next big getaway. And even though the doctor's orders had her to where she could not take Thrive at that time, she was still putting together trial packets for future customers. And then, the third week of September, Shanann and Christina went on a road trip to Las Vegas for a Thrive convention and party. They had to leave at like 3 a.m. in the morning, and Christina said they like tiptoed out of the house so they wouldn't wake up Bella and Cece. They had to drive through Utah and Arizona, which was over an 800-mile trip, and Christina drove Shanann's Lexus. Shanann posted, I have the best hubby ever. This weekend, me and Christina took a road trip to Las Vegas for our team celebration, and Chris is taking care of all three munchkins. Frank Rusek, Shanann's father, commented on the post and said, Great job, Chris. At the party on Las Vegas, Vegas Boulevard, someone told her she should tell everyone that she had been bitten by a shark while she was in Australia. 
and that is why you're having to wear the neck brace. And Shanann said, for the rest of the day, she did that. She said, the looks I got from everyone when I told them that was really priceless. In early October, Christina and her daughter flew back to Hawaii, and Shanann was able to take a neck brace. At this time, she was planning for her next trip to Porta Vallarta, where her mother was going to fly in at that time and take care of the girls. Shanann posted, in less than 48 hours, Chris and I will be sitting on the beach, sipping on margaritas. This is our fourth trip in just the last 12 months. Seriously, pinch me. Since Chris had started wearing the duo burn, he had lost even more weight. Shanann was really proud of him, and she posted a video of him with no shirt on, mowing the yard. And she captioned the video, My Yard Guy is Sexier Than Yours. The trip they were going to go on was actually going to be themed from the 80s. Shanann went out and got Chris a 1980s glam rock wig that was styled after Bon Jovi. And then on October the 12th, they flew to Mexico. Once they were at their hotel, and you could see that it was overlooking the ocean, Shanann went live on Facebook. She said, Chris has already cracked open a beer. He is so excited. And then in the background, you could see Chris go, yeah, and he took his beer can and he just waved it in the camera. During their four days away, Shanann had made like an album on Facebook, and she had titled it, Love Traveling the World with Chris. And she was filling it with some amazing photos of her and Chris having a wonderful time together on their trip. Chris seemed like he was really having a lot of fun at the 80s party. Um, with his Bon Jovi wig and Shanann in her 80s attire. Chris held up a rock on sign with his hand and held his, stuck his tongue out and did the whole rock on thing for the selfie that she made of her and Chris at the party. And above the photo, Shanann wrote, Chris and I are having a wonderful time. And then she posted a Facebook Live video of them kissing by the pool. She titled it, Life is way too short not to be happy and feel this bliss. Moving into chapter 16, and it is titled, I'll See You Next Year. On Christmas Eve of 2017, once again, up and dressed up in his Santa suit, complete with a long beard. beard was so big, it completely, almost, had his whole face hidden. Shanann was setting up the live for Santa's annual visit, but things just were not going as she had planned. And just for a brief moment in that video, the world could actually see what was really going on in the Watts household. Celeste was just screaming and crying hysterically, and Bella looked completely confused and distracted as Shanann turned on the Christmas tree lights and she went live. But when she turned on the Christmas lights, that was actually Chris's cue to come to the front door. About that time, Shanann screamed out, Santa's here! But the kids seemed like they're literally freaking out, and Shanann opens the door and she's like, Santa, where is your phone? And so nonchalantly and without any enthusiasm whatsoever, Chris just replies casually, It's on top of your car in the garage. Shanann kind of looks at him out of the corner of her eye and just gives him like a very disgusted, disapproving look. I needed it for the picture, she said, and then she walked towards the garage to get the phone. And while she was still alive, she flipped the phone over onto her own face and she said, My husband is a genius. He doesn't listen. After she got his phone, she returned to the living room and she put her phone on the floor so she could get Santa and the tree right in focus. And then Shanann took off to find Bella, who was not wanting to meet Santa at all. And you could hear Shanann say, Come on, Bella. Santa's got gifts. And when Bella did walk into the living room, Shanann was kind of trying to coax her to walk over to Santa and get her presents. But Bella just stood there and stared at Santa and like bewilderment. Santa says, Merry Christmas, Bella. Have you been expecting me tonight? And then Shanann's parents had came online and they were trying to get Bella to at least acknowledge Santa. And in the background, you could just hear Celeste crying. As Bella started opening and looking at her gifts, Shanann went to try to find Celeste so they could do some family photos. And a few minutes later, Shanann came and she placed Celeste on Santa's lap sitting next to Bella. Santa said, Hello, Miss Celeste. How are you? Shanann took several mini photos of Santa and the girls, but then it seemed like she had just had enough. She picked Celeste up and said, Okay, let's say goodbye to Santa. Santa said, Goodbye, girls. Ho, ho, ho. Enjoy your gifts. And then Santa walked towards the front door. Before he went out the door, he turned around and he looked back at the girls and he said, I'll see you next year. And I'll make sure, I'll make sure I'll wave goodbye on the reindeer. That concludes chapter 
16. I'm moving into chapter 17, and it is titled, Such a Beautiful Couple. On New Year's Day of 2018, Shanann decided and made a resolution that she would double her 2017 sales of her team. She had sold $720,699 of Thrive in 2017, more than twice as much as 2016. I'm focused on doubling with my team in 2018, she said on a live because I want to show my two little girls how to achieve their dreams and how to inspire them. On January the 6th, she held her annual vision board party at their house. She posted a photo of Bella, and Bella was holding up her little 2018 vision board that was full of pictures. Little four-year-old Bella, her goals were to get a pony watch and gymnastics and a trip to Disney and a trip to North Carolina so she could visit both sets of her grandparents. And four days later, Shanann celebrated her 34th birthday on a Facebook Live with Chris and the girls. And as they all sang her happy birthday, her mom and dad also joined in the Facebook Live and sang her happy birthday as well. And then a couple of days later, Shanann posted a photo of her and Chris and they were sharing Shanann's birthday dinner. Their friend Amanda Thayer commented on the photo and said, such a beautiful couple, inside and out. And then only three weeks later, Chris and Shanann flew to Las Vegas for their fifth lifestyle getaway with Thrive. This time, Sandy Rusek, Shanann's mom, had flew in from North Carolina, and they met her at the Denver airport and picked her up, and she was going to stay with the girls this time. Shanann posted a photo and said, Nana is going to be with the girls this time while Pop Pop holds down the house in NC. We are blessed. Once in Vegas, they checked into the Wynn Hotel, and there they met up again with Christina Meacham. Also, more of their Thrive friends there, Samantha Paisley, Addie Maloney, and Cassie Rosenberg, and Cassie's husband, Josh. The very next morning, as part of the Thrive event, Chris and Shanann test drove a Tesla Model S. Shanann was the first one to drive, and Chris was streaming live on Facebook as she drove it. And then it was Chris's turn to get behind the wheel for his test drive. The salesman asked Chris, have you ever driven a Tesla? Chris said, I've never driven one. I've worked on cars for a long time, but never any of these. The salesman was explaining to Chris how the car would go from zero to 60 miles an hour in only three seconds. Chris just weaved straight out of the convention center and straight into the traffic as the salesman was talking to him. And then the salesman said, do you want some music? And Shanann from the back seat said, oh, he likes Britney Spears. And she laughs about it. And Chris says, no. Chris said, well, what about a little Metallica if you have anything on there? And the salesman's like, anything in specific? Chris said, well, can we do justice for all? The salesman starts the song, turns up the speaker, and Chris heads down the freeway, listening to Metallica, Justice for All. Chris said, that felt pretty good. Felt pretty smooth. It'll sneak up on you rolling down the strip. The next song in the Metallica lineup was The Unforgiven. And Chris started tapping on the steering wheel, in tune to the music. After test driving the Tesla, which starts at $78,000, Chris and Shanann both said they preferred the more top-of-the-line Model X Tesla, which is almost $10,000 more than the S. After they were back in Colorado, about three days after they drove the Tesla, um, Chris was volunteered to be the receiver of the pie-in-the-face game. He got on his knees and he put his face in the hole of the machine. Directly below the hole was a container of whipped cream, which would be launched by hitting the base plate at the bottom by Bella with a plastic hammer. As Bella took her little hammer and hit the base and filled her dad's face with whipped cream, her mom went live on Facebook along with her grandmother, Sandy Rusek. Sandy was getting a kick out of it and she was laughing and she was telling Bella, hit it down there. Shanann said, hit it hard, Bella. And little Bella hit the base plate with all of her strength sending tons of whipped cream straight into Chris's face. Bella was just laughing, and Chris was saying, Nice, nice, nice. Good job, Bella. Do it again, Bella. And she did. She did it again, and she scored a great direct hit. Nice, said Chris, and gave Bella a big high five. While they were in Las Vegas, though, Shanann had decided that she wanted to trade in her Lexus for something better. What she really was wanting to do was trade in the Lexus for something better than a Lexus, and she wanted to use 
hers and Chris's combined car allowance from Thrive, which was $1,600 per month. Shanann said she did love driving the Tesla, but what she really wanted was an Audi. And she told her followers on Facebook, I think I'm an Audi girl because they're awesome. On social media, Shanann and Chris seemed like they were living the good life. But in truth, they were absolutely drowned in debt. And even though by now Shanann was earning around $60,000 a year and Chris was earning around $62,000 a year, they were still living way beyond their means. They were paying around $25,000 a year for the Primrose Daycare School. And then there was the mountains of medical bills from Shanann's neck surgery and all of the medical bills from the girls' overnight stays at the hospitals and the various things that the girls had had to go to the hospital for. In reality, they were barely living paycheck to paycheck and owing thousands and thousands in credit card debt. In March of 2018, Chase Bank sent them a letter warning them of being three months behind on their mortgage payments. Not knowing what else to do, Shanann took out a $10,000 loan against Chris's 401k just to try to catch up on the mortgage. They also owed the Wyndham Hill Association a year of monthly dues and was facing a civil court action for that. Later, Chris explained that Shanann was really stressed out about all the debt. That's why we took out the loan on the 401k. That was the max that they would let us borrow, and we took it and put it all towards the house so we could get it caught up. However, in Shanann's social media postings and her lives and her photos, there was not one hint, one little thing that would lead anyone to think that Chris and Shanann was having any sort of financial problems, any sort of problems whatsoever. All of her social media posts made it appear that they were perfect and there was no problems and they were just living the good life, the perfect family with the good life. At the end of February in 2018, she even wrote, we're turning in the Explorer tomorrow and I can't decide on the Audi Q7 or the Tesla X. And then a week later, she was posting photos of some Audis at a dealership in Broomfield. And at the top of the photo, she wrote, coming back tomorrow to test drive some of these beauties, and then maybe we'll hit up the Tesla dealership. On February the 23rd of 2018, Shanann became an 80K VIP Thrive Promoter, and that is only one down below the very highest ranking in the MLM Thrive community, and that would be the 200K VIP level. Now she would earn a 4% commission on the eight levels of customers and promoters below her. She actually had around 200 customers below her, including 50 promoters. And even higher up was Addie Maloney, her team leader. And Addie reported to Sam Paisley. They were actually called the Rockstar Team. They actually done almost a million dollars a year in sales, Addie and Sam. And then on March the 12th, they had to return to the emergency room with Bella because she was having breathing problems. And then just two days later, Celeste and Bella both underwent surgery to remove their adenoids. The night before the girls had the operation, Shannon was posting photos of Chris cuddling and holding the girls. She wrote at the top, Celeste and Bella are ready for their biological adenoids removal and ear tubes. These girls share everything. While the girls were in surgery, Shanann updated her Facebook followers. She said, I only had about two hours sleep last night with having a lot on my mind with the girls' surgery today. And then later that day, she posted photos of Bella and Celeste on their way home. And she wrote on the photo, the girls' surgeries went well. I want to thank everyone so much for their prayers. And then that spring of 2018, Shanann had told some of her friends that her and Chris were trying to have a baby and she was wanting and trying to get pregnant again and that Chris wanted a boy. Jennifer Lindstrom said they were planning on having a third baby. She said that Shanann told her that she knew Chris was such a great dad and he would always be there to help her. Shanann was also planning to take Bella and Celeste to North Carolina and they were planning an extended vacation with her parents and Chris's parents. This would be the first time Shanann had been back to North Carolina 
since her and Chris got married. Her dad, Frank, said she was just wanting to come back and visit everyone. Frank said it went from one week to two weeks, and then she finally said, no, I'm just going to stay six weeks, and we're just going to spend the summer there. On April the 26th, Shanann flew to New Orleans for Thrive's Thrivapalooza. Chris didn't go. He stayed at home with the kids. And this was a really big weekend for Shanann. She had actually been profiled in the very first edition of the magazine Strive, Lavelle's brand new magazine. And her feature was titled Time for a Reset. There was a full page color photo of Chris and the girls and Shanann. It started out by saying, after being a caretaker for everyone else, Shanann Watts finally started taking care of herself, and she's never been happier. And during this five-day trip and vacation, Shanann actually shared a hotel room with six of her Thrive friends, including Kellyanne Burke, Cassie Rosenberg, and Nicole Atkinson. Shanann said there was six of us in a room, and we was just having fun. Just chit-chatting, you know, having girl talk. They said every morning while they were in that motel room, Shanann started the morning by waking them all up, dancing on their bed to Justin Timberlake's Can't Stop the Feeling. Shanann said, I got up super early and I woke everybody up. They loved me. The whole five days she was there, it was very busy. During the day, they were training. And then at night, there was social events that they went to. On the very last night, Shanann wore a very beautiful, yet sexy, leopard print dress, and it had a split at the side. During the event, Shanann was called up on stage to receive a blow dove copy of the magazine that she was featured in from Lavelle CEOs. Shanann was absolutely terrified. She was so nervous. She said it was really the scariest thing ever. She said it's like walking up on stage in front of 25,000 people. She said she was like, holy crap. Am I going to trip in these hills? Am I going to bust my face? But everything went absolutely perfectly. Shanann took the stage and she got thunderous applause. The CEO told her it's so good to see you as he was handing her a big, beautiful bouquet of white roses. And then she posed for pictures with the two founders of Lavelle. She posted a photo on Facebook of her holding her, the magazine, with her in the insert, and at the top she captioned the photo, Dreams Do Come True. I am beyond blessed. Okay, this is going to be going into part two of the book, and we're going to be starting on chapter 18. This chapter is titled, Oops, We Did It Again. On Mother's Day of 2018, Chris gave Shanann a very special plaque that he had made especially for her. This plaque was very beautiful. It had their most important dates, which was the girls' birth dates, their birth dates, and when they got married. And it was written all in beautiful gold lettering. And the wording on it was Shanann Catherine, 0110 of 84, Christopher Lee, 0516, 85. Our wedding, 11, 03, 12. Bella Marie, 12, 17, 13. And Celeste Catherine, 07, 17, 15. Shanann made a very special post about it with a photo of it, and she said, Chris did great. I love my mother's Day gift. Thank you, Chris. And that is the same week that Chris and Shanann started trying to have another baby. She was posting photos of Bella and Celeste and captioning them. I wonder what three would be like. By this time, Chris had lost so much weight that his wedding ring wasn't even fitting him anymore. So by now, he had already stopped wearing his wedding ring for fear that he was going to lose it. And whether he thought about it or whether Shanann even thought about it, who knows, but he never, it was never resized from when he was so heavy. It was still the same size, so he just stopped wearing it altogether. And even though Chris had told Shanann that he did want another child, he really didn't. At this point, he had fell out of love with Shanann, and he was feeling very trapped and smothered in their marriage. He really didn't even want to be in the marriage, but he couldn't tell Shanann that he didn't want to have another child. And one of the main things Chris said that 
really bothered him and really was kind of like the hair that broke the camel's back was the way Shanann would criticize and ridicule him in front of the kids and make him feel less than. And the kids had actually started picking up her words and pretty much doing him the same way, ridiculing him, making fun of him. And the kids were pretty much mimicking what Shanann was doing. And that's what did it, Chris said. He just, at that point, he knew that this just was not going to work. Chris being the passive-aggressive kind of person he was, he didn't say anything when all this was bothering him. So he just bottled it all up inside himself, and he would think about just having a new life and getting a divorce from Shanann and just starting all over. And maybe him and Shanann could co-parent, but he just was not in the marriage any longer. He could only see it getting worse from there. There was one morning, a neighbor, Melinda Phillips, she was leaving her home to go to work one morning, and she actually saw Chris and Shanann having a pretty heated argument in their driveway. They were pretty heated with each other, and almost it was like they were almost screaming with each other and, you know, with their fingers in each other's face, and they were, they were arguing for sure, Melinda said. When she was talking to People Magazine, Melinda said, as soon as Chris and Shanann saw that she seen them arguing, it's like immediately both of their demeanors completely changed. And it's like they were never arguing. They, they were just talking calmly to each other and even gave each other a kiss. But they were definitely in a heated argument until they realized I was watching them. Melinda said it was crazy. It happened like, it was like turning on and off a light. It just happened in just the few seconds that she was loading up her car, how they went from heated argument to perfect couple as soon as they noticed her looking at them. Melinda said it was really kind of incredible, just to be honest. It was almost like they were putting on a show or acting. It was weird, she said. And then on a Tuesday, May the 29th, 2018, to be exact, at 3.40 p.m., Shanann set up her phone to record. She had a really special surprise for Chris when he got home from work. The first thing she did was step in front of the camera and proudly display her new t-shirt that read, Oops, we did it again. And then in the video, you'll hear Dater, and he'll start barking, and you can hear his little feet tapping across the floor to go to the door because he knew Chris was home. As Chris walked in, he walked in nonchalantly and then stopped in his tracks when he seen Shanann. He had this real awkward look on his face and then he noticed her t-shirt and he just started grinning. He started walking towards her and with a little laugh he goes, oops, we did it again. And he walks on up to her and he gives her a hug when he was out of the shot of the camera. He goes, I like that shirt. And she's like, really? And he's like, really? When Chris was back in camera range, this time he had a pregnancy test in his hand and he was just looking at it. Chris is like, so pink means? And Shanann says, that's just the test. Chris said, oh, I know, but is pink going to be girls? Shanann says, I don't know. It's just a test. Chris says, that's awesome. And he gives her a kiss. And then he looks back at the pregnancy test and he says, and looks at the camera and he says, well, I guess when you want to. It just happens. Wow. Shanann was so excited to be pregnant, and she immediately called all of her friends and her mom and dad to let them know. But there was a few that was secretly concerned about the situation because they knew how much they had struggled with Bella and Celeste having all the health issues. Her dad said, when she told us she was pregnant again, we knew the problems that she had with Bella and Celeste, and we was worried. And even though it was Chris's idea to have a third baby, he later admitted that he was scared to death about having another child. He said, yeah, we talked about it, but it just happened so fast. It was like only once or twice, and boom, she was pregnant. I was just surprised, just completely really caught off guard. When Chris went to work the very next morning, he told his boss, Luke, Apple, that Shanann was pregnant. But he also made Luke swear that he wouldn't tell no one else. Luke said he was pretty excited, but 
He really hadn't told hardly anybody that she was pregnant. But it wasn't long before Chris told his own parents of Shanann's pregnancy. Cindy said, I was shocked. I was truly shocked. And the only thing I could think was, wow, they must be doing really good to be able to have a third child. Somehow, word got out in a dark hole that she was pregnant. And the people Chris worked with found out. And it wasn't very long at all until the day he walked into the office and he got huge congratulations on the new baby from Troy McCoy. Anthony Brown said nobody even knew what Troy was talking about when he was congratulating Chris. And we were just kind of looking and then Chris started just waving his hand, holding up three fingers. And Chris just grinned and said, we're having another baby. And everybody in the office just congratulated him, clout, and telling him, Congratulations, that's awesome. Later on that same day, Chris and Anthony Brown were working together out at one of the oil field sites, and Anthony asked Chris, said, well, how do you feel? How do you feel about being a dad again? Anthony said that Chris seemed really unemotional. He didn't seem like he was the happy, go lucky doll in the office holding up the three fingers, and Chris just looked at him, and Chris is very well aware that Anthony and his wife had been trying to have a baby, but... She had suffered through three miscarriages. And Chris asked Anthony, well, do y'all want another baby? Anthony said, I was just being honest with him. And I said, I just don't think it's in our cards to have another baby. And Anthony said, Chris just gave him this solemn, serious look. And he said, well, do you want one? Later on, when Brown was being interviewed, um, he told the detectives, he said, you know what? I believe he was implying, asking me to... I want one of his kids. Anthony said, I thought he was joking, but at the same time, he looked pretty serious, and it was a very odd comment. Okay, that is the end of chapter 18. Going into chapter 19, and it is titled, My Daddy is a Hero. On June the 1st of 2018, Chris was in the office, and he was having problems with one of the computer apps that actually control the gas monitors that are out in the field. Being frustrated with the app, he walked into the health and safety environment issues office, the office of Nikki Kessinger, to try to find some help. Even though Chris had saw her in the office and seen her put her lunch in the refrigerator and all the other guys talked about how hot she was, he had saw her, he had noticed her, but he had never spoken to her. This would be the first time he ever spoke to her. Kessinger even said, I had seen him in the lunchroom and in the office, but we had never spoken, so yeah, that's the first time we had ever spoke to each other. Nikki went on to say it was really a casual, just a casual chat, and I immediately noticed he did not have a wedding ring on. Five days after that, Nikki had to send an email to the group of Anadarko field workers as well as Luke Apple. Chris replied rather quickly, using his Anadarko email. But all he said was, Thanks, Nikki. Have a great rest of your day. And then after that, they started running into each other quite frequently in the office and in the hallway. Nikki said, It was always just hit or miss. It really wasn't an everyday thing. Thrive had just recently brand new released their new duo burn patches. Chris and Chanel were both equally very excited to try these. And on June the 8th, Chris started the Duo Burn Thrive Patches. And then pretty early the next morning on June the 9th, Shanann posted a photo of Chris wearing a t-shirt that said Super Dad. And Chris had wrote on it, I can't stand still. I cannot be still. I have already vacuumed the entryways, the living room, cleaned the kitchen, and mop. I've literally vacuumed all of the downstairs, and now I'm moving upstairs. Shanann was listing all of Chris's new accomplishments since he had started using the new Duo Burn patches. She wrote, Chris said he's been more talkative as well since he started hashtag Duo Burn. And he's even been talking to random strangers. Hashtag he's an introvert. She also posted some more photos of Chris with no shirt on, on the grass. And she captioned the photos, I love my sexy man. And then on June the 11th, which was a Monday, Shanann posted the video, Oops, We Did It Again, 
and then she went live with Bella and Cece that they were sitting on the couch. Chris was actually the one that was doing that video, recording it for her. She said, guess what, girls? Mommy has a baby in her belly. Are you guys excited? And Bella and Celeste both jumped up and started just dancing and saying, yeah. Shanann just gives them both a really big hug, and she says, oh, my goodness, I love you girls. And little Bella said, I want to give the baby a hug. And then she went and hugged her mommy's belly and put her head on her belly, and you could hear Chris in the background holding the camera, snickering. Shanann said, so sweet. Shanann set up a little prop of a blackboard, and she wrote on it, Big Sister 101, and Bella was holding like a little ruler in her hand pointing towards it, and she posed Bella out like she was teaching Celeste how to be a big sister. It's like Celeste was the pupil, and Bella was the teacher because Bella already knew how to be a big sister, so now she's got to teach Celeste how to do it. Shanann captioned the picture on Facebook, ready or not, Celeste, and then she said, here comes baby Watts number three, and then the very next morning, Chris and Nikki had their first real conversation. He was explaining to her who he was, and she wanted to know in the, that he was from North Carolina, and she was wanting to know all about that, and he was explaining it to her, and he told her that he had two daughters, and she was like, you really got really you got two kids and he's like yeah and so he pulls out his phone and to show her a picture of the girls and on his lock screen was a picture of the girls and their mom Shanann. Nikki said yeah he started talking about his kids and then he said yeah I've got a wife but we're getting separated. Nikki said she was really impressed that Chris was showing her photos of his daughters on his phone. She said I thought it was kind of cute he's a dad and it was right around Father's Day too. And then, just a few hours later, after Chris had showed her the pictures of his girls and told her that he did have a wife, even though they were getting separated, Nicole decided to go ahead and email him. And the email read, Chris, thank you for being honest with me this morning. Truthfulness is so underrated in our culture. Saludos cordialos, Nikki. And then, around an hour later, Chris replied. Chris said, Nikki. I'm a straightforward guy. Lying just complicates things. I think you're just absolutely stunning. And from what I've learned about you so far, you seem like an amazing person. I hope to continue to get to know you better since we do have a lot in common. And Kessinger replied saying, Oh yeah, it's always nice to find people you can relate to. And I enjoy talking to you as well. I feel understood. I'm looking for someone to build a beautiful life with. It seems so simple, but it is unrealistic sometimes. I want to build something similar to what you have done with your wife and those two cute little girls. I do believe in karma, so out of respect to myself, you, and your family, I think it is best if we keep that friendship at work. And then it wasn't even hardly two hours later that Chris replied again. And he said, yes, a beautiful life is hard to find sometimes in this world because people always seem to have an agenda for everything. I do believe in karma, so I agree with that as well. And any conversations that we have will stay between us. There's nothing to worry about there. And he left her his work number. He said in case she needed to get a hold of him because sometimes out in the field, the email and the service can be spotty. He said that he had an early morning meeting, and then he's going to be working with the construction crew on various sites the rest of the day. And if I don't see you tomorrow, I hope you have an amazing day. And that was the last email between those two using their Anadarko emails. On June the 17th, which was Father's Day, Shanann had had a shirt specially made for Chris from her and the girls. And it said, I'm a proud dad of two awesome daughters who love the Steelers. And then Shanann also posted several many more photos of all of them on Facebook, more family photos. She arranged them all into a really beautiful college. And then she had a very touching Father's Day message for Chris. It said, Chris, we are so incredibly blessed to have you. You do so much every day for us, and you take such great care of us. You are the reason I was 
brave enough to agree to number three. You are incredible and we're so lucky to have you in our lives. Happy Father's Day. She also made a special video of Bella sitting in her car seat in the back seat of the Lexus singing a special song for her daddy. She had worked really hard and memorized this song as a present for him on Father's Day. My daddy is a hero. He helps me grow up strong. He helps me snuggle. He reads me books. He ties my shoe. You're a hero through and through. My daddy, daddy, I love you. About an hour later, Chris added Nikki to his cell phone work contacts. He knew Shanann constantly checked his phone. He was absolutely obsessed with Nikki, but he was waiting for Shanann and the girls to go to North Carolina before he made any moves on her. Later on, Chris said, I thought it was just flirting. I didn't think that something was actually going to happen. He said, I've never been pursued by anybody before. The week before, Shanann and Chris went to San Diego for another Thrive Mini Vacay. Chris had had many very flirty conversations with Nikki on his work phone. But then Nikki told him that she that he really needed to just use his personal phone because she didn't want anyone at Anadarko to know that they were talking to each other. As they got to know each other better, Chris slowly but surely started coming out of his shell. He said he felt really comfortable around Nikki and very much unlike Shanann, Nikki seemed like she really was interested and wanted to hear the things that he had to say. Chris said they were just kind of filling each other out. And then it just kind of went to a different level. And Nikki started talking about meeting up with her after him and Shanann got back to San Diego. There was one morning that Lauren Arnold, when she got to Chris and Shanann's house, she had went over there so their kids could have a play date together. When she went in, she saw that Shanann was really preparing for her six-week trip to North Carolina. Shanann said that she was going to be finding out the baby's gender while she was in North Carolina. She asked Lauren how her pregnancy was going. Lauren said she told Shanann, well, I'm having a boy, so you have to have a boy too. Lauren said Shanann was so excited and very happy. On June the 19th, after Shanann's doctor's appointment, she posted the sonogram photo of the new baby with the baby's due date of January the 31st, 2019. And that is when she changed the passcode on her phone to 013119. She captioned the photo, Little Peanut. I love Chris. He is the best dad us girls could ask for. Frank Rusek, Shanann's dad, flew in on June the 21st to take care of the girls while Chris and Shanann went to San Diego. It was actually the first time Frank had been able to visit for some time now, and he immediately noticed the difference in Chris. Later on, he told detectives, he says, that they were going through this new Thrive stuff that she was selling, and Chris has started getting himself all kinds of built up, and he had lost a lot of weight. He also said that the normal Chris, the passive-aggressive, laid-back Chris, now seemed like he was acting even sterner with the girls. And he said he noticed that he was even yelling at them sometimes. Frank said, what was he getting mad at the kids for? Frank, Frank said when he yelled at the girls, he just looked at him. And he just looked at him like, is that really you yelling at the girls? He said he told Chris, oh, sorry, um... It just caught me off guard. Is that really you yelling at the girls? And then on June the 22nd, which was on a Friday, Shannon and Chris flew off to San Diego for their sixth lifestyle getaway with Thrive. While they were on the flight, Chris secretly added Nikki's phone number to his Anadarko work contacts as APC Health and safety department. Once they got to San Diego and they got checked in their room, they left and had dinner with Addie Maloney, Nicole Atkinson, the Rosenbergs, and Christina Meacham. This was the first time that Addie Maloney had seen Chris in six months, and she was actually blown away, shocked. 
she could not hardly believe his transformation from just looking like a dad bod to now he was buff. While they were in San Diego, Chris decided to go visit an old friend of his, Mark Jameson. Mark was actually stationed at the naval base, very close to where they were staying at the motel. Chris and Mark had actually grew up together. They knew each other since they were like eight years old. And Chris considered Mark his best friend, more like a brother to him. Later on, Chris admitted to the detectives that he did tell Mark about Nikki. He told him that he didn't tell Mark that he was going to be meeting up with Nikki, but he did tell him that there was this girl at work that he had been talking to. This San Diego trip was a four-day trip, and during the entire trip, Chris and Shanann seemed very devoted and loving towards each other. Nicole Atkinson said they were just very lovey-dovey with each other. Shanann had also posted several many romantic pictures of her and Chris while they were there, including one where she was sitting by the swimming pool, and he was massaging her shoulders. On June the 26th, which was a Tuesday, Chris and Shanann flew back to Denver, but when they got home, they found a letter that was from the Wyndham Hill Master Association. It was actually a court order for them to appear in court on August the 24th for failure to pay their fees. The fees were $683, and they were for homeowner's fees. Now the association was going to be suing them for well over $1,500, and that was including attorney's fees and court costs. That very afternoon, Chris drove Shanann, Frank Sr., and the girls back to the Denver airport for them to depart to go to North Carolina. After he took his family to the airport and he returned back home, he immediately called Nicole Kessinger. Nikki and Chris set up to meet each other the very following afternoon after work. That concludes Chapter 19. Now we're going into Chapter 20, which is titled, Electric Woman That Takes My Breath Away. Less than 24 hours after Chris had dropped off his wife and daughters, he met Nicole Kessinger at a park in North Glen near Nicole's home. And this is the first time they had met up outside the Anadarko office. Nikki asked him when he had decided to separate from his wife. Chris told her it was in late March, and since then, they had not slept together. He told her they were putting their house up for sale, and they were trying to get their finances sorted. Nikki said that she asked him why did he decide to separate from Shanann. And Nikki said that Chris told her that Shanann was bossy. And Nikki asked him, what did he mean by bossy? And she said that Chris told her that Shanann was very controlling and she was always belittling him in front of the girls. And he said it was just the final straw when Bella and Cece had started repeating Shanann's words right back to him. Nikki said that he told her that Shanann was just all about appearances in every aspect of her life. She said that he told her that she was even bossy in front of her friends, but she would then turn it around and make it look like it was a joke. She said that he told her that him and Shanann hardly ever argued, but there was one time that he did try to stand up for himself, and Shanann had thrown him out of the house all night. So after that, he always avoided anything that would upset her or any kind of confrontations that he may should have given her. He avoided all of that because he knew if he made her mad that she would just go off the hook on him. He asked Chris when things in his marriage had started going bad and she said Chris told her six years ago that he told her that the last couple of years were really the worst. Said that Chris tried to talk to her so many times but it would always just fall on deaf ears. Nikki said that Chris said that he wanted to talk to Shanann, and he tried to talk to Shanann, but she would ignore him, and she would talk to her friends on the phone or just go on Facebook and just pretty much treat him like he wasn't even there. Nikki also said that she asked Chris had they tried any sort of marriage counseling, and Chris told her that no, they hadn't. After a few hours of them being at the park, they just went back to Nikki's house. Chris had brought two 
boxes of condoms with him. One box of them had never been opened, but one box of them was partially used. She said she asked Chris why one of the boxes was open, and Chris told her that he had got them when him and Shanann were still having sex, and they had just been gathering dust in the closet since then. And Nikki said she asked him why would he be using condoms with the mother of his children. And she said that Chris told her that Shanann just didn't like to get messy. And then the next day after work, Chris went to Nikki's again, and they went to bed again. Later that night, Nikki told Chris that she was going to be leaving town for a few days, but she would be back on her birthday, July the 3rd. Later on, Nicole texted him and said, I'm still going to see you. Chris replied and said, yes, I'm still going to see you. It's not going to be as often as we like, but we're going to make it happen. Do you think you're the only one addicted right now? I am so hooked on you. Chris sent another text saying, Sleeping without your warm body next to me is not going to be fun tonight. On June the 30th, Chris was Googling Bandamere Speedway. Sands that Chris said that him and Nicole had discussed earlier in their relationship that they both loved cars, both loved races, and they talked about getting to go to the races together. Shanann had never showed any sort of interest in anything like that, and he was just excited that he had found someone that shared the same interest that he had. Chris was absolutely over the moon with Nicole. His real family in North Carolina was quickly being deleted in his mind, and he was ready to move on. On July the 1st, Chris texted Nikki, and he said, Being in your life is something that I crave. I enjoyed our conversation tonight. And Nikki replied, I hope you have a great night. Sweet dreams. July the 3rd was on a Tuesday. That was Nikki's birthday. And Chris showed up to her house with flowers and a birthday card that had a poem in it that he had written himself. The poem read, your energy is so insane. You heat me up, you make me melt, and then you cool me down like rain. He also used pink paper and wrote her a love letter, looking forward to our future together. Big things will happen this year. Dreams will come true. That smile, that stare, that laugh, that giggle gets me every time. You are truly an amazing inspirational, and electrical woman that takes my breath away every time I see you. Nikki later said that she told Chris that she wanted to take things slower until his divorce had came through. She said it was like he was in fifth gear the whole time we were together. Maybe it was up to me to hit the brakes, but he was so kind to me. Why would I push him away? Nikki had also made some rules that he would always come to her house where she lived alone with just her and her dog. She said that she always used to tell him, this is our space, and that's why we need to be at my place. And she said, Chris, for the first time in his life, he was comfortable and enjoyed being around Nikki, and he had never had that in his entire life. He could open up and be himself, he said. And with Shanann, I was just always so nervous. It's like I was always walking on eggshells, always worried I was going to say something or do something to make her mad. And with Nikki, it was just different. I was more in control when I was with Nikki. And then the next morning, on July the 4th, Chris, when he woke up, he was in Nicole's bed. He looked at his phone, and he saw he had a dozen missed calls from Shanann. He jumped up and went outside to call her back, and that's when Shanann told him that the girls wanted to talk to him. When he told her he had been asleep, she screamed out at him, screw you, and she slammed down the phone in his ear. That's when he went back inside and told Nikki that he had to go home. She was actually in the shower, and she told him, I thought we were going to spend the day together, and he said that he had to go, and Nikki was not happy. She was very pissed off that he had to leave after they already had plans to spend the day together. Chris said, I had to calm her down. There was nothing I could do. She was mad. So I had to calm her down. But 
Nicole said it did make her take a step back and wonder what she was doing. She said Chris said just because he has to leave, it really doesn't mean anything. After Chris got back home, he did call Shadan and the girls. He then called Kessinger back and she was talking about a fitness app and he told her she could come on over and help him set that up. When she got there, she found that he was busy doing the housework and shampooing the carpets. She said all the furniture was in the way of the front door. But while she was in the house, she saw a picture of Shanann holding Bella and Celeste. And Nikki went on to say, oh my God, she's so beautiful. And the little girls are so beautiful too. She said she asked him, why wouldn't you want to fix your marriage? It's like you've got a perfect life. And Nicole said that Chris said, I don't really want to. It's just not working out with us. Chris actually took Nicole on a tour of his house, and Nicole said she remembers thinking and wondering, how could they afford such luxurious things? She said everything in the house was very nice. It's like everything in there came with a very expensive price tag. While they were upstairs, Nikki said that she looked in the master bedroom and saw the four-poster bed. Chris also took her into the basement where he had all of his exercise equipment, gym things, and a bed. And Nikki said that's where Chris had been sleeping since him and Shannon had separated. Nikki went on to weigh him so she could put it into the fitness app. And he said that it was because of Thrive for his super weight loss. And he suggested that Nikki try it. Nikki said, I never wanted to try that. She said, I was just very uncomfortable with it. And I even went to the website and I still didn't even completely understand it. She said every time her and Chris was together, she never saw him without at least two patches on his either biceps, triceps, or on his lower back. Never. He always had at least two on him at all times. And she said even though she never really questioned Chris about why he always had on two, she does remember that he told her that one was enough. She said she remembers thinking that he told her you only needed one, so she always wondered why he always had two on. And then she finished setting up his My Fitness app and helped him set up a fitness regimen. Later that night after they had dinner, Nikki left. She went to see a baseball game, and Chris met up with Nick and Amanda Thayer to watch the fireworks show. And Nick asked Chris how he was doing in the bachelor life. Chris just said, well, it's weird being in an empty house. But to keep his mind off Shannon and the girls being gone, Chris told Nick that he was just working out all the time. Nicole had actually set herself up two different dates on the eHarmony app for that night at the baseball game. But neither one of those dates actually showed up to the baseball game. So as she was leaving, she called Chris and invited him to come to her house. Chris immediately accepted Nicole's invite and went straight to her house, but he was a little bit concerned and confused that she was still out in the field dating. And from then on, Chris spent every night for the next five weeks at Nicole's house, watching movies, having sex, and just being together. The only time he even went home was straight after work, and that was only to change clothes and eat dinner. Now, most any time Shanann would try to call Chris, she barely ever got an answer from him. And when she did, and they did the nightly FaceTime calls so he could see the girls, he always seemed distracted and like he wasn't even paying attention to the girls or Shanann while they were on the call. Shanann knew something was up, and she knew something was going on with the relationship, but she just couldn't put her finger on it or pin down exactly what was happening, but she knew something was. Frank Rusek, Shanann's dad, said every night Shanann would FaceTime with Chris for the girls. And there was a few times that Frank caught Shanann saying, what is going on? What are you doing? Are you not going to pay any attention to the girls? It was like he was just in another world. The morning of July the 6th, Friday, Cindy Watts went and picked up Shanann and the girls to spend the weekend with them. Before even going to North Carolina, Shanann had gave both sets of grandparents a list. This list consisted of the pre-approved foods that her girls could eat so they could have these foods in their home when they got there. Shanann did this just to be on the safe side that nothing they had in their house would trigger any of the girls' allergies, and she made a big stipulation that there would be absolutely no nuts inside the homes. 
Frank Rosek said that Shanann had two EpiPens that she had to carry with her everywhere she went because little Celeste has severe allergies to tree nuts. And Frank said that she told them all, everybody, get rid of anything in the house that has anything to do with nuts. Frank said that was no problem that Sandy went through the house and cleaned the whole house out. However, her brother Frankie Jr. did have a bag of pistachios in his bedroom, which Shanann did find, and they had a pretty decent little argument about that. But it didn't get out of hand, and it didn't blow up, and Frankie got rid of the nuts. He had just, I guess, forgotten he had them in there. When Cindy and Shanann and the girls got back to Cindy and Ronnie's house, Shanann went through the house making sure that the list she had sent was there. And they had went and got some things, but Shanann did not approve of what was there. So, Cindy took her back to the grocery store, and they spent another $375 on the foods that Shanann would allow the girls to have that would not set off any of their allergies. And on that same night, Chris took Nikki out to see the new Jurassic Park movie in Westminster, Colorado. And seeing that the 7 o'clock movie was sold out, they went ahead and bought tickets for the next showing, and they just walked around the mall until it was time for the next showing. Nikki said, really, that was their first date. Also that night, July the 6th, marked a new stage in their life. That is when Chris declared to her that he loved her. He said that she made him feel comfortable. For the very first time in his life, he felt comfortable around someone. And he wanted a loving relationship. Nikki said, he really just enjoyed talking to me. She said, around me, Chris felt like he could just finally come out of his shell. She said that he told her that when he was with her, he felt like he could just start talking about things that excited him and he was in, interested in. And he didn't feel like he was going to be ridiculed or laughed at or talking about things, and he wasn't ignored. And Nikki said, though, even though he had said all these things and she thoroughly enjoyed being around him, and he was so kind to her, and all that said, she said she was still hesitant about thinking about any sort of future with him. And she said she told him she was straight up, and she just gave him the ultimatum. She told him, if we're going to try to build a relationship together, you are going to get a divorce. She said she told him that she is not ready to meet his kids, and she said she didn't know for sure when she would be ready to meet his kids. The very next night, on July the 7th, they had a date for dinner at the Rusty Bucket Restaurant. While they were on their date, Shanann called back to back. She left many messages. He never answered the phone and never replied to her messages. He was so sucked up into his date with Nicole. And it would not even be until 5.15 p.m. Sunday, the next day, that he would even text Shanann back. And when he did text her back, he was still at Nikki's house. He said, I'm sorry, boo. I fell asleep as soon as I got home. That heat killed me yesterday. I love you so much. Chapter 21, Nutgate. After spending the weekend with Cindy and Ronnie Watts, Jamie Lynn, the Watts' daughter, Chris's sister, she brought her two children by to see their grandparents and to see both the girls and Shanann Jamie has two, age 10 and 7. Bella and Cece were having so much fun playing with their cousins, and everything was just going just great until Dylan, the oldest one, the 10-year-old, went to the refrigerator to get himself some ice cream. When Shanann walked into the kitchen, she was absolutely horrified. She seemed that Celeste was fixing to eat some of the ice cream as well. It was vanilla ice cream, but Shanann was very, very up front and forthcoming saying that that ice cream contained extracts from tree nuts. She was so beside herself she looked at Cindy and screamed, you are trying to kill my children. Cindy insisted that it was just plain vanilla ice cream, but Shanann was not having it. She grabbed both of the girls and called her father and told him to come and get her immediately. Frank Rusek remembered her saying, I've got to go because they've got nuts all on the table. As Shanann was waiting for her to get there, she was on Facebook and furious and venting about what her in-laws had just exposed her children to. She said, oh, I'm not coming back and I don't have a car here since I flew here. So I'm having to wait for my dad to get here and come and pick us up. This is the last time my kids will ever step foot in that house. My heart is still racing 30 minutes later. 
As soon as Shanann got back to her parents' home, she immediately called Chris to tell him what had happened. Chris promised he would take care of it. And then that night, Shanann was back on Facebook. She said, my 2.5 is severely anaphylactic to almost all tree nuts. And we were visiting in-laws, and I had specifically said we cannot have any in the house when we stay there. And my mother-in-law stated we don't buy them. And when I arrived, on the floor shelf was a bag of pistachios, big bad ones. I removed them immediately. Today, she lets another one of her grandchildren eat ice cream that has all tree nuts in front of my 2.5-year-old that can't have them. I said, I don't appreciate it, and I removed my daughter. I am beyond furious. And she's telling me I'm overreacting when my child's life is at risk. And then a few hours later, Shanann added an update to her post. This time, she let everyone know that Chris had confronted his mother about putting their daughter at risk. And her response to my husband is, well, this should be a learning experience to my two-year-old to learn that she can't always get what she wants. F you. F you. Shanann had texted Chris very strict instructions on just how he should handle his parents. Well, you should just call your dad and tell him you do not appreciate his mom putting your daughter at risk today. And nor that she teased our girls and saying that she should not always get what she wants. After Shanann had sent Chris those texts, he texted her back and he said, I will call them and tell them what I think about this. It's not fucking cool at all because it is the kids. I will set this right. When Ronnie and Cindy continued to see all of Shanann's very angry and ruthless posts, they just blocked her on Facebook. And then the next day, Shanann called Chris after work, and she told him again he needed to confront his parents again about Nutgate, as she had now named the incident with the nuts at his parents' Nutgate. But Chris was evasive. He's like the non-confrontational kind of person, and he didn't want to have to call his parents about it again. And so that actually just put more distance between him and Shanann. So now he was pretty much just avoiding all of her phone calls and just communicating with her through text. Later on that night, Shanann texted him and said, Are you okay? It's like you don't even want to talk. I kept trying to talk, but I had to dig it out of you. Chris texted back and said, I'm fine, baby. The last few days of work has just put a lot of extra responsibility on me with the new people. I didn't mean to seem short. I love you to the moon and back. Meanwhile... While Chris was texting Shanann, he was also exchanging nude pictures with Nicole back and forth with each other. And just to make sure Shanann never found the pictures, Chris had downloaded a secret calculator app on his phone that Nikki had told him about. A secret password had to be entered to reveal the secret photos and videos. On Saturday, July the 14th, Chris and Nikki visited the Shelby car museum in boulder colorado but this wasn't just any car museum this was the shelby mustang museum and this museum celebrated the famous race car driver and entrepreneur carol shelby carol shelby is also the one that designed chris's beloved mustang they toured all the exhibits and took several mini photos of the mustangs that they had on display there chris and nikki were there about two hours and during that two hours, Shanann had already tried to call Chris four times, all of which went unanswered. And it was only just a few minutes after they actually left the car museum that Shanann called once again. But this time, Chris did answer, and they did have a brief conversation. When he got off the phone with Shanann, Nikki just drove him back to his house. But on the way back to his house... Shanann was calling back to back to back. Later on, Nikki told the detectives that Shanann calling him back to back like that made her feel really uncomfortable. And then when they got back to Chris and Shanann's home, she said she really felt uncomfortable because she felt like she just didn't belong there. When she seen all the photographs in the front room of a beautiful family perfectly all posed together, looking extremely happy, she said once again she wondered why would Chris want to trash all of this? And she said it just didn't make sense that he would want to walk out of such a life that looked perfect. She said, that is when I took a step back. She said, this guy has a beautiful house, beautiful daughters, an awesome job, a beautiful wife. Why would he want to leave this? And that same night, Chris spent almost two hours looking for a very special gift 
for his mistress. He searched a very high-end mineral dealer, Dave Bont Minerals, and was very interested in Dioctase, which is also known as the Gem of the Congo. It is actually a healing crystal, which helps build confidence, and it is also said to stimulate memories of past lives. On July the 15th, which was a Sunday, Shanann threw a birthday party for Celeste, and she even invited all of her old friends from North Carolina. Although the most noticeable absent parties was Chris's parents, they were still upset about the way that Shanann had blasted them to everyone publicly on Facebook. Cindy said she just pounded and pounded every day about the ice cream and the allergies. Cindy even said that she told Ronnie to go if he wanted to, but she just could not be around Shanann's family, not with them thinking that she had intentionally tried to kill her grandchildren. Cindy said that she just did not want anything to be started and anything to make Cece's birthday party not perfect. Ronnie was going to go, and he was planning to go, and he had a load of birthday presents for Celeste. But the morning of the party, Shanann posted yet another attack towards them on Facebook. And Ronnie said when he seen that, he said there's just no way in hell he would show up there in everybody's eyes staring at him because everybody would think that he tried to kill Cece. Ronnie said, I just ended up sending the birthday gifts to Colorado by UPS. During the party, Shanann did FaceTime with Chris so he could wish her a happy birthday as well. Chris did the very best he could to put on a good show, but you could tell his heart just was not there. After the birthday party, Cassie Rosenberg, Shanann's friend, texted her to see how the party had went. Shanann said, oh, it was great, but in-laws, no show. They're lost, not mine. They're out of my kid's life, now, and I don't ever want to see them again. One night, Shanann was there, and she visited with an old friend of hers named Sandra Gironda. Her parents owned like a little pizzeria, and Shanann worked there when she was in high school. Shanann appeared to be pretty happy. So, you know, that is what Sandra said. She was absolutely just glowing in her pregnancy. But while Sandra and Shanann were having dinner, Shanann was complaining that her in-laws had never, ever accepted her. She said that Cindy Watts had always tried to undermine her as a wife and mother. Sandra said she asked Shanann how Chris handled that and how did he take that the way his parents was. And Shanann told Sandra that Chris was her rock. She said that Chris was always very supportive of her and he had always put her and the girls first over anyone. And that was the problem between her and her mother-in-law. And Sandra said that Shanann had told her that her mother and sister-in-law had said that Shanann would never be good enough for Chris, and they still blame her for taking Chris away to Colorado. Sandra said that she suggested to Shanann just to let Chris lead the way and let Chris figure out a way to handle with his own family. Shanann said that her heart just breaks for Chris, but she has seen firsthand how they hurt and affect their marriage. On Saturday, July the 21st, Chris and Nikki went to watch drag races at the Bandemir Speedway. Right before they left to go to the racetracks, Chris transferred his next large batch of nude photos of Nikki into his secret calculator app. After he got the photos put into the app, he then texted Shanann, and he said, I'm headed out to the track, boo. I will text you when I get there. On the way to the races, Chris and Nikki stopped off at a little restaurant called the Rooftop Tavern, and as usual, Chris paid for their meal with a gray and a Darko gift card. He'd done this so there would be no record, and Shanann couldn't see it because she was the one in charge of their finances and kept a close check on their banking. When they got to the races, they watched the Mile High Nationals, and they stayed until the very end of the races. Chris thought he was literally in heaven. This was the first time he had got to go to the races since he was younger, and 2008 when he went with his dad. Okay, that concludes chapter 21, going into chapter 22, and it is titled The Bachelor Life. On Tuesday, July the 24th, at 1.17 p.m., Nikki Kessinger was very busily and intrigued into some very interesting Google searches, including, man I'm having an affair with says he will leave his wife. 
So now, for some reason, she had now started to believe and have hopes that her relationship with Chris could possibly end in them getting married. And then, she spent the next several days online, randomly searching for wedding dresses. Also, by now, Shanann was coming really suspicious of Chris because he would never answer his phone. Shanann even had her mom, Sandy, to call Chris over a dozen times, and when he didn't even answer to her, she called him to see if he was okay. She was beginning to wonder, was he even okay? Finally, he replied to a text and said that the tire light had came on his dash when he was leaving King's Supers last night. He said, I got the tires aired back up. Shanann texted him back and said, you could have at least answered or text back. I thought something might have happened, you know, but you don't care about somebody else's feelings. Or were you with another girl? Or worse, you have no consideration of others. Chris didn't even reply to those texts because while she was texting him that, he was very busily Googling the Victoria's Secret website. While he was still Googling Victoria's Secret, Shanann came back with another text. And she said, I've realized during this trip what's been missing in our relationship. And it's only one way, emotions and feelings. You don't consider anybody's emotions or feelings at all, nor even think about others' feelings. Finally, Chris replied, and he said, I'm sorry, I love you. Shannon replied back, and she said, I've tried to give you space while you were working and living the bachelor life. She said, I'm carrying our third. I'm fighting with our other two kids daily, and I'm still trying to work and make money. She said, it's really easy for you to text me and say I'm sorry and you love me, but if it's a lie, we need to talk. I mean, I kept looking at my phone all night, and I got no response from you. Like, seriously, we didn't just start dating yesterday. I mean, we've been together eight years, and we have 2.5 kids together. A few hours after the tags, Shanann decided to go to dinner again with her friend Sandra, and they once again went to the pizzeria. They talked about Cece's birthday party and how Cindy and Ronnie wore no-shows to the party. Sandra said that she told Shanann just to stay positive and don't let them ruin her trip. Sandra said that Shanann told her that she just wished her mother-in-law would just get over it already. That they need to just accept that they have a great marriage, two beautiful little girls, and a new baby on the way to look forward to. Meanwhile, back in North Carolina, Nikki mentioned to Chris that him and her should go on a camping trip to the Great Sand Dunes. And Chris was very excited because he had never been camping, but he had always wanted to. And... This was Nikki and Chris's very last weekend together before Chris had to leave for North Carolina to go be with Shanann and the girls. Nikki took care of a few random items as far as paying for the trip, but Chris did the majority of the paying with the Anadarko gift cards. On Saturday morning, they took off really early because it was a four and a half hour trip to Alamoso, Colorado, where they were going to spend the weekend camping at the sand dunes. To cover his tracks with that, Chris had told Shanann that he was going on a weekend hiking adventure with one of his co-workers and where they were going they would be no cell phone signal. Nikki said that after they got done setting up their camp they went to the national park and it was really really windy and she said the sand was hurting very bad. She said that it started raining but they didn't care they just toughed it out. They took many photos of themselves kissing in front of the sand dunes. Chris also took like and recorded like a little video of their yellow tent. But while he took this video in the background playing in Nikki's Forerunner was the song Forever Girl by John Langston. And for the rest of the night, they just stayed in the tent. Nikki said that he was just always telling me he loved me. She said, and I told him I loved him and I'm in it. It was really just all very new to me. When they got up the next morning, Sunday morning, they took off to go sandboarding at the sand dunes, and on their way to the dunes, Chris actually replaced his home screen photo of Shannon and the girls to a photo of the sand dunes. And then, over the next few hours, Chris took many photos and videos of Nikki sandboarding at the dunes. You can hear him in one of the videos saying, so damn sexy. And then, he videoed Nikki telling him what a great weekend she had had. So he could have it to remember. To remember what a great weekend they had together at the sand dunes. 
Thank you so much for coming out here with me, Christopher. I'm having a wonderful time. You mean a lot to me, and I'm glad you're having a blast. Then she blew a big kiss at the camera. They began their long drive back in the morning of Monday morning, but they stopped off for lunch at a place called BJ's Brew House. And while they were there, Chris texted Shanann, and he said, Well, we've finished the hiking. We're packing up now and heading home. And then, all the way back, he ignored back-to-back -back calls from Shanann. But he finally texted her back that afternoon. He texted her back because she had sent him a text saying, Well, I'm assuming you're safe since it's been three and a half hours since I heard from you. He texted her back and said there was a car fire. And then the festival that was in Colorado Springs. The traffic's crazy. I'm headed home. Shanann continued just to try to call him, but it was another two hours before he would even answer one of her calls. They had a very short one-minute conversation, and then after hanging up, Shanann shot him another text. She said, sorry you're so tired, but I had a hard weekend, if you even care. And then finally, ten minutes later, he responded. He said, I'm sorry you had a hard weekend, boo. I will make it up to you, I promise. I'm sorry I'm just out of it tonight. Shanann replied and said, well, it would have been nice for my husband to show any interest in me and the girls or to even ask how, how the baby's doing. I'm written with begging you to talk to me. I'll see you Tuesday. Monday was, was Chris's last day at work before going to North Carolina. And right before leaving to go to Nikki's to spend one last night with her before he had to go to North Carolina, he texted Shanann. He said, I'm letting Dieter out, and I'm going to bed, boo. I love you. He then left, and when he arrived at Nikki's, he had flowers, a card, and a love letter. The letter read, July the 30th, 2018. Nikki, wow, where do I even start? The first day I saw you, you took my breath away. The first day I had the guts to talk to you, I got lost in those stunning green eyes. The first time we went out in the park together, I knew I was addicted. And the first time we kissed, I knew I had met the most unique, amazing, and electric woman ever. We have had a lot of firsts together, Nikki. And I want to keep having them with you. Love, Chris. That concludes Chapter 22. Moving into Chapter 23. And it is titled, Worst Summer Ever. Early the next morning, Chris arrived at the Denver International Airport. He dropped off the Lexus at the long-term parking lot. He texted Shanann the photo, and he wrote, at the airport. But while he was waiting at the gate, he was transferring dozens and dozens of photos and videos of him and Nikki at the sand dunes into his calculator app. He also deleted his contact for her in his phone that he had listed under the Health Environment Safety of Anadarko. And then at 4.46 a.m., he texted Shanann. He said, I'm on the plane. Love you, boo. She immediately texted him back. And she was very much complaining that leaving the Lexus part at the long-term car park was going to cost them $16 a day. You never, ever listen to me. That's going to be $130 that we can't spend at the beach now. Five hours later, Chris's plane landed at the Raleigh-Durham Airport. And then he texts Shanann. She was already there waiting with the girls. Let me know when you're coming down the escalator so I can record the girls, she replied. And although it had been five weeks since Chris had even seen his family, he seemed very cold and distant when they reunited. Frankie Rusek said that Chris was acting very cold and just standoffish. Frankie said that he said, I bet you guys missed each other. And he said they were both like, yeah. That night, they went out to dinner at the pizzeria. It was the first time that Shanann's friend, Sandra, had ever met Chris. Sandra said during their dinner that Chris hardly spoke and he seemed distracted. And she said the girls were obviously very happy to see their dad, but Chris was very quiet and he really didn't say much at all. But when we talked about the possibility of maybe it was a baby boy on the way, then he just lit up with a big smile. When they got back to... Shanann's parents' house, her and Chris went out on the back porch just to talk. Shanann had immediately noticed that Chris had replaced the photo of her and the girls on his phone screen with a photo of the sand dunes. And when she asked him why he did that, he was very evasive. 
And then later on, he even refused to have sex with her. He said he just didn't feel like it. Then he just got up, left Shanann in the bedroom, went back outside so he could call Nikki. It was around 2 a.m. that Frankie said he heard some noises coming from Shanann's bedroom. So he got up to go back there to check on her. Since the light was on, he peeked in the room and he saw that Shanann was throwing up and he asked her if she was okay. And he asked her, is that just like pregnancy stuff or what? And she just answered her brother and said, yeah, probably. Shanann's mom, Sandy, also went in there to help. And Sandy said that Shanann had threw up all night that night. And Chris never even got up, even to see how she was. I mean, this was his pregnant wife, and he never even went to check on her. Early the next morning, Shanann posted on Facebook for the first time in several weeks. Since Shanann had been in North Carolina, she had barely even posted anything on social media. She had scaled it back to where she hardly even posted one post. But on this day, she said, I am so excited about August. The girls and I fly home on August the 7th. And then on August the 10th through the 12th, I get to fly to Scottsdale, Arizona for an amazing weekend with my Lavelle family. And then when I return, we're going to have a gender reveal for Baby Watts number three. Lots of excitement and lots to be thankful for. After breakfast that morning, Shanann, Chris, and the girls headed out to go to downtown Aberdeen. They visited the hair salon where Shanann's mom, Sandy, worked. Also working at the salon was Stacy Fowler. Stacy Fowler was a really good friend of Shanann's. She had even went to high school with her. And Stacy said Shanann was just glowing. Shanann was very excited, and she told me she was pregnant, and she told me that they were going to be having a gender reveal party. And then, another stylist that worked in the shop said that Chris said nothing during the visit, and he did not even seem like he wanted to even be there. She said, I even said hi to him, and he just kept his head down. He was, like, very standoffish. Later that morning, after they had gotten their hair cut and got back to Shanann's parents' house, Frank drove Chris, Shanann, and the girls to Myrtle Beach in South Carolina. They had two condos to have a five-day vacation. The plan was actually for Frank to stay there with them for a couple of days, and then he would go back to Aberdeen. And then Shanann's mom would come out, and she would join them for the rest of their time there. And Ronnie Watts had taken out the entire week off of work, so him and Cindy could also join them at the beach with the granddaughters. But Shanann refused to allow that. Chris had really been looking forward to spending some time with his parents, and Chris really did feel like Shanann was punishing him and his parents for Nightgate. It was Bella and Celeste's very first time to ever go to the beach, and they were so excited. But Chris, he just really was not into it. The whole time through the trip, he was just kind of standoffish and cold. But deep down, he was simmering. He was furious, saying that he felt like Shanann was putting a ledge between him and his parents. When they got back to their condo that night, Chris decided he wanted to go for a walk. So he left the condo to go for a walk, and he spent over an hour on the phone with Nikki. And while Chris was talking to Nikki, Shanann stayed in the room, and she called Christina Mitchum, her friend. And she was complaining and very upset and saying that she no longer even knew Chris. He was acting so differently. She told Christina that he even refused to touch her, and he was just pushing her away. The next morning, Shanann sent Christina Meacham a text, and she said, I think Chris might be mad at me. She said he's been so closed off, and all he focuses on is his food. I mean, he's only kissed me once since he's been here. No grabbing my ass, hugs, or anything. I want to cry. And even though Christina was a big Thrive person herself, promoted it, sold it, and used it, she was very curious if the new burn patch that Chris was using could have changed his attitude and demeanor. And Christina also told Shanann that she really should just tell Chris how she felt. Shanann just replied to Christina and she said, Chris says nothing's wrong. She said, five weeks away from me and then doesn't touch me. That doesn't really make me feel good. He got me pregnant. I just want to cry. Shanann told Christina that her and Chris were, now they were just sleeping apart. They didn't even sleep together anymore. Shanann thought that maybe Chris was just turned off because of all the weight she had gained since she had been pregnant. She told Christina, she said, he wanted this baby, so that means I'm going to gain weight, but I'm not feeling wanted. 
Later, Chris just walked off by himself and went shopping to look for presents and souvenirs for his mistress and girlfriend, Nikki. He took a photo of a necklace, and he immediately transferred that photo into his secret calculator app. Chris and Nikki were continually communicating with each other through the calculator app, sending nude selfies to each other, and then that same night, leaving Shanann in the bedroom very angry and upset. Nikki and Chris spent nearly an hour and a half on the phone, and once again, he refused to have anything to do with his wife. Again, he refused sex of her, and instead, he decided to just do push-ups when he was in the bedroom. Shanann was so frustrated and confused. She texted her friend Christina again, and she said, I took a shower tonight. That means I want sex. He knows that. And he's over here doing a push-up challenge instead of discussing anything or even effing me. And I'm over here just crying in silence. Christina replied and said, girl, stop him. Don't cry in silence. That's not good for you. Shanann replied saying, I can't do this. Not three alone. He's never been like this. 5.5 ducking leaks with no sex unless he's getting it somewhere else. That Friday, August the 3rd, Shanann's dad, Frank, went back to Aberdeen, and her mom, Sandy, arrived to stay for the rest of their vacation. By now, Shanann had already confronted Chris about what was wrong with him, and she begged him to talk to her about it. He finally opened up and said what was really making him upset at that point was his parents had been banned from coming to Myrtle Beach. Shanann told Christina he looked up to his dad. His dad is his hero, and Chris is hurt. He does not understand why his dad would delete our whole family from his Facebook. Not only was Shanann texting Christina, she was also texting her friend Nicole Atkinson, who lived in Colorado, and she was also asking Nicole for some kind of feedback or advice. Later on, Nicole said that Shanann didn't know what was going on. Nicole said, well, she hadn't seen him in five weeks, and he was not even sleeping in the same bed with her, which I found very odd. Nicole asked Shanann if Chris had been affectionate before she left to go to North Carolina. Shanann told her that everything had been fine. Nicole said Shanann told her that they were screwing like rabbits before she went to North Carolina. And Chris couldn't get enough of her then. And they were even doing it in the pantry while the girls was in another room. And Nicole said for them to go from that extreme to he doesn't even want to touch her, that's odd. Later on that day, Chris kind of got up some nerve. And he was going to invite his parents to Myrtle Beach so they could see the girls as well. When Shanann found out what he was going to do, she was furious. So Chris backed down immediately, but that made him even angrier with Shanann. Later on, Shanann told Christina, she said, I told Chris over my dead body, would they ever see our kids or him again? They're not going to get to disrespect me, him, and our kids and expect to get rewarded for it. She also said that Chris had been way too weak to his parents about Nutgate. She told Christina, she said, Chris is so submissive and he gives in so easy. It's like he just brushed this off. I mean, what if Celeste had died? That night, Chris finally just called his parents and he told them he wanted a separation. Cindy said that Chris told her, said, she just won't let me see you guys. She will not allow me to see y'all. And she doesn't want me to let y'all have anything to do with Bella and Celeste. When he got off the phone with his mom, he immediately called Nikki Kessinger. And even though it is unclear and unknown exactly what they talked about during this call, as soon as she got off the phone with Chris, she spent two hours again googling wedding dresses. And while Nikki was googling wedding dresses, Chris decided to have a talk with Shanann, and he told her he was tired of it. He was tired of her alienating and isolating him from his family. His words to her started a bitter argument between the two, so they separated in two different bedrooms. Shanann texted Christina again, and she said it got ugly. Truth came out. Christina was actually six hours behind Shanann's time zone at this time because Christina lives in Hawaii, so she didn't get a reply from Christina, so Shanann wrote a text to Chris, and she expressed exactly what she thought to him. She said, the truth came out last night. I did not create a dagger between you and your dad. That was done by your mom and your dad. And I won't change a thing. My daughter's life is way more important. She went on to tell him that 
His parents' home was not a safe zone for Bella and Celeste. You can let them tell you what you want. You can believe I created this dagger, but I didn't do that. These kids are my world, and I have to protect them from the evil of the world. I shouldn't have to protect them from evil family. Then she decided to go ahead and confront him about his behavior recently to her and the kids. She said something changed when I left. You may be happier alone, and that's fine. You can be alone. She chastised him as well for failing to care about her pregnancy or her feelings. She told him the first trimester is the scariest and most dangerous. We can lose this baby at any point until delivery. And I'm not going to be treated this way for having the balls to protect our family and our kids. I should actually get a gold ducking medal for handling it the way I did. And then a few hours later, Shanann texted him again and said, if you want to go hang out with your parents today, by all means, do so. But without us, don't put it on me why you can't go. You are your own person. Even though Chris and Shanann were actually staying in the very same condo room, they were only communicating through text because they didn't want to argue in front of the girls or Sandy. Chris replied to her, and this was early Saturday morning, and he said, these girls mean the world to me. I'm sorry for the way I've been acting. It's just been in my head, and I'm, it just hasn't been right at all. Before she replied, she screenshotted his message and sent it to Christina, and she said, he's feeling like shit. Then she takes Chris back, and she said, I did not deserve to be treated the way you treated me. I have defended our daughter. Chris then wrote back and said, thank you for protecting Cece a million times a million. And then he immediately texts, but my parents still want to be in the girls' lives. He said, I'm not used to not having a relationship with my dad. I should have called him before it got to this point, but I didn't, and that's my fault. And then, Shanann demanded that Cindy and Ronnie needs to apologize for not Cece's birthday party. She went on to tell Chris that his parents did not appreciate him the way she did. So maybe he should just move back and live with them. No one ever protected you from your mom. And someone should have before me. I'm done with being the bad guy in all this. Especially when I had more balls to stand up to them for you a long time ago. By lunch, Chris still had not replied to Shanann's text. So she sent another one. She said, oh yeah, and while it's on my mind, you not standing up for me and the girls is not cool. You make it to where they feel like they didn't do anything wrong and just brush it under the rug. When she still didn't get a reply three minutes later, she sent another text. She said, I'm not asking you to choose who to be with. I shouldn't have to ask you to choose right from wrong. If you're not happy, you know where to go. Worst summer ever. Chris still wasn't replying, so Shanann just started texting Christina again. She was actually providing Christina with updates back to back on her battle with Chris. She continued to tell Christina how Chris was so weak and why wouldn't he challenge his parents and talk to them and be strong and stand up to them for his daughters about Nutgate. She said, I am tired of him not having balls enough to stand up to his family. He's so worried about what his dad thinks. Christina replied and she agreed with Shanann and she said that Chris should protect his family no matter what. Shanann then told Christina that her in-laws had ruined everything, starting all the way back with Chris's proposal, the engagement party, and their wedding. She said, I'm sick of it, and Chris is going to have to toughen up and stand up for me and the girls. In her next text to Christina, she said, this is the worst that it's gotten, and he's going to have to stand up and do something. I can't do this, and I can't fight my own husband. I'm 14 weeks pregnant, and he hasn't even once touched my belly or even asked me how the pregnancy's going. He wanted this pregnancy. Several times that week, Shanann had texted Christina and told her she felt physically terribly ill, but she just didn't know why. Several times she complained to Christina that she was having chronic constipation, which can be caused by opioids. On the very last day of their Myrtle Beach trip, Chris and Shanann took Bella and Celeste back to Pavilion Park. Both of them were putting on a happy, cheerful face, acting like nothing was wrong. They made some videos and took some photos of the girls playing on trampolines. And Shanann posted a photo of Cece just smiling and having such a good time wearing a little blue bikini on Myrtle Beach. And she captioned it, The older she gets, the more scared I get. To let her out in the real world. The world of evil. 
the world of hate. The world is a very scary place. Chapter 24 You fell out of love with me. That night, Chris and Shanann drove back to Aberdeen in complete silence. While both the girls were fast asleep in the back seat of the car, as soon as they arrived back at Frank and Sandy's house, Chris went straight outside to call Nikki. While Shanann texted Christina, her friend, giving her updates on the terrible situation, Shanann told Christine, said, we drove three hours in silence. I told him to find a place when we get back, and I'm putting the house on the market. And he said nothing. Shanann was now preparing herself for a future without her husband. She said, I need to move out of Colorado. It's too expensive to live alone there with three kids. And I'm not moving to North Carolina. Christina replied, and she was like, oh my God, and he said nothing? What the is wrong with him. He needs to wake up. Shanann said, all he said was, I love the kids. This is not the man that I married. On Sunday afternoon, Shanann texts Chris and she said, before you go see your parents, do you still plan to go see Mama? Chris's grandmother was 94 years old, Margaret Watts. It is his paternal grandmother and she was 94 years old and she lived in a nursing home and she does have dementia. Shanann said that the girls could accompany him to go see his mama, but they could not go to his parents afterwards. She told Chris, I'm going to stand strong with your family. I mean what I say. You can use the truck to see both of them, but I just need to know, because I'm not going to be the reason that you don't get to see your mama. Chris texted her back, and he said that his mama would love to be able to see Bella and Cece for just one last time. And seeing as they only had the one car, he asked Shanann, could he... Or did he need to find someone to pick him up to take him back to his parents after his visit with his mama? Shanann told him that she should he should just have his parents bring him there, but she was not going to take any chances of running into them herself. She said, I'm not kidding, Christopher. I've been having bad experience these last few days with the pregnancies and I'm spotting. I'm not dealing with it. Just have your parents pick you up and then just do what you need to do. That night, Shanann sent Chris a quote by Isaac Cope Bruno. It read, Husbands, stand up for your wife and protect her from people that are close to you. From the time you said, I do, your wife replaces your friends, your parents, and your siblings. Apart from God, your wife now occupies and assumes the privileged first place of honor in your life. Two hours later, she sent another text saying, I don't know how you fell out of love with me in five and a half weeks. Or, if this has been going on for a long time, but you don't plan another baby if you're not in love. Kids don't deserve a broken family. When I left you, you couldn't take your hands off of me. And then when you do show up, I have to practically ask for a kiss at the airport. Chris received that text when he was in the middle of a 90 minute phone call with Nikki. He did not respond to Shanann, so she sent another text. Being away from you, I miss the smell of you and you touching me when I'm cooking. You touching me in bed. You touching me, period. I missed holding you and snuggling with you. I missed eating with you, watching TV with you. I miss staring at you. I miss making love with you. I missed everything about you. She told him she had been looking so forward to him getting to North Carolina so they could celebrate their eighth year anniversary of their very first date. She said, if you are done and you don't love me and don't want to work this out, and if you're not happy anymore, and you're only staying because of the kids, I need you to tell me. By midnight, she still had no response from Chris. She sent him one final text. I just don't get it. You don't fall out of love in five weeks. How can you even sleep? Our marriage is crumbling right in front of us. And you can sleep? A few hours later, Chris drove Shanann, Bella, and Celeste to visit with his mama at the nursing home. Mama was having a good day, and they all spent time together just walking up and down the halls. She recognized Chris immediately, and she just lit up when she saw Bella and Celeste, her great-granddaughters. After the visit, Shanann immediately drove the girls back to Aberdeen, and Ronnie came and picked up Chris and took him back to their house for a family reunion. When they got there, Chris seen his sister Jamie and her husband and their children. This is the first time Chris had seen his whole family together for very many years, and he wished that he could have let a lot of them meet Bella and Celeste. Cindy said, well, we finally saw the Chris that we love. 
the old Chris, he just seemed happy and not so nervous and anxious. He talked a lot about the girls, but he really didn't mention the baby very much. He told his family that he was going to be separating from Shanann, and he was going to try to get Shanann to go with joint custody for the girls. He seemed like he was very optimistic about the future, like a big weight had been lifted off of his shoulders. Ronnie said, yeah, he was ready to move on. Ronnie said that Chris told him, Dad, she already knows that I also want a divorce, and the house is up for sale. Ronnie said he actually talked like he was excited, and he was talking about getting like a two-bedroom apartment and get some bunk beds for Bella and Celeste. Ronnie said he had his game plan, and he said that Chris looked at him and said, Dad, I don't need that big-ass house and making those payments all the time. Jamie actually said that was the first time she had seen her brother that happy in many years. She said he just seemed strong, and for once, he seemed normal. Jamie said he was just talking about being so excited about being able to take Bella to the races and just to be able to do things with the girls that he had never been able to do before. Throughout his time at the reunion, many times he would walk off to himself, and when he'd done these things, he would text Nikki and transfer very erotic nude photos that she was sending him into the calculator app. Jamie was watching him do this, and so she knew. Every time he walked off like that, and he came back, and he walked off, and he came back, she said, I knew something was going on, but I didn't ask him. I just kept quiet. But Jamie said, it did make my radar go off. She said she wanted to just ask him, I know you're not texting Shanann this much, so who are you texting? She said she wanted to ask him that, but she didn't because she just didn't want to rock the boat. That night, there was a terrible storm in which caused power outages all over the state of North Carolina. At 6.45 p.m., Chris texted Shanann and told her that Ronnie really didn't want to drive the 60-mile round trip all the way to Aberdeen in such bad weather, at which point Shanann offered to come and pick him up herself. Chris replied to her saying, well, that's it's up to you, but he's cool with bringing me back first thing in the morning early. Shanann was really furious. She said, we fucking leave tomorrow. I need help. I will be there in an hour. Chris told her not to do that, that he had already talked his dad into bringing him back. When Chris got back to the road six, Shanann got Chris to go outside on the porch because she was curious what his family had said about her. The conversation was very strained, and when Shanann tried to hug Chris, he walked away. And then he just called her and told her, he didn't even want another baby. At that point, Shanann just burst into tears. And then a few minutes later, Shanann texts Chris. She said, I was trying to get you to fucking hug me. Make me feel safe. This is much deeper than just lack of conversation. Make me feel like everything's going to be okay. Chris texts her back and said, it will be okay. This will all get fixed. Shanann replied and she said, no, I don't need words, damn it. You just told me you don't want the baby. Something changed in the last five weeks. Something you won't say. Chris replied, I'm scared, okay? You wanted the truth and I told you how I felt. At 5.17 a.m. the next morning, Shanann texted Addie Maloney, telling her that Chris said he no longer wanted the baby. Addie tried to give her some reassurance and tell her that he was probably just scared. Shanann said, no, he has changed. I don't even know who he is. He hasn't touched me all week or kissed me. What if he doesn't even love me anymore? Addie asked Shanann, did she think that maybe Chris might be resentful that she spent so much time in North Carolina with the kids? Shanann said, well, he was totally on board with it. We decided it together. Quality time with everyone. She said, I just want to cry. We have never had a problem in a relationship like this. No joke. Never. This is total left field. Shanann also texts Christina Meacham to tell her that Chris had also changed his mind about the baby. She told Christina, Chris does not want this baby. Said he's scared to death. And I said, do you want me to abort? Before they left for the airport that afternoon, Shanann actually had second thoughts about even going back to Colorado. She was still trying to find out what was really going on. She texts Chris and said, something else is going on that you're not saying because lack of communication does not cause you not to be present or touch me or love me. This fucking sucks. I really don't want to leave here. 
And while Shanann was texting Chris and pouring her heart out to him, not even wanting to go back to Colorado, Chris was texting Nikki, telling her that his divorce would soon be finalized. He told Nikki that Shanann had spoke to a realtor about getting their home sold and that she was already looking for a new place to live. So Nikki said that she would help him find a place to live in Brighton because it would be near his work. She even discussed the nearby gyms with him. Later on, she actually told the detectives that Chris was gung-ho about moving on. And just a few hours after Chris told her that, she finally went more public about her and Chris's relationship. She sent a picture of Chris to her best friend, Charlotte Nelson. And just before they walked through the security at the airport, Shanann took a video of Frankie saying goodbye to Bella and Celeste. Frankie says he remembers giving Bella one last hug and kiss before they were gone. He told her, make sure you slow down on getting so big. And Bella said, I love you, Uncle Frankie. Why are you crying? Frankie told Bella, because I love you and I'm going to miss you guys. Frankie said Bella just didn't want to let him go. And neither did I. At 11 p.m. that night, Chris and Shanann arrived back at their own home. After they put the girls to bed, Shanann texted Christina, telling her that she wanted sex tonight. But she was feeling really insecure and feared that she might get rejected. She wrote to Christina and she said, He's in the shower. I just got out. And I'm so horny. And even if he does hate me, sex is sex, right? Christina told Shanann, Well, just stay naked and just go for it. Shanann says, How do I approach him? Christina said, Just go jump in the shower with him and go wash his back. Shanann said, okay, he's getting out. Pray I get sex tonight. And then a couple of hours later, Shanann texts Christina again, telling her that Chris shot her down, that he rejected her, and she had been bawling her eyes out for the last hour. She said, I am still trembling, but I just went and woke his sorry ass up. I woke him up and I asked him who he was sleeping with, and he denied anyone. And that is the end of chapter 24. Going into chapter 25, titled, Nico what? On Wednesday, August the 8th, Chris went back to work, and Shanann posted on Facebook for the first time in over a week. There was absolutely no sign that anything was wrong, and Shanann had just appeared her usual happy, bubbly self as she was just raving and talking about the great effects she was getting from the new Thrive Patches. But it was only a few hours later that she started pulling out and talking about her trophy to an old friend named Sarah who she used to work with at Children's Hospital. She texted Sarah and she said, Chris told me that he doesn't want this baby. I'm so sick to my stomach. I mean, I tried to have sex with him last night and he rejected me. She said she was gonna go try to have an ultrasound that night just to try to find out the baby's gender. And she told Sarah that Chris wanted her to abort. Sarah asked Shanann if she thought Chris may be having an affair. Shanann said, honestly, no. But I, I honestly don't know what else could make him do an absolute 360. I mean, we couldn't get enough of each other before I left to go to North Carolina. When Chris arrived at the Anadarko headquarters that morning, he just walked straight into Luke Apple's office and he shut the door behind him. He told Luke, whom was his boss, that him and Shanann was having some issues. He told Luke that if he seen anything goofy on the Anadarko truck's GPS, that it could be because he was going to be going to stay with a friend, Luke said. Chris also asked Luke if he could have Friday off so he could take Shanann to the airport because she was going to Arizona for a Lavelle training weekend. That afternoon, when he got off work, instead of going home, he drove straight to Nikki's house. It's the first time he had had a chance to see Nikki in over a week, and they immediately had sex. When Chris went back home and him and Shanann left to go to the ultrasound to find out the gender of the baby. While they were at the ultrasound, Nikki was Googling, Man, I'm marrying, marrying her mistress. Shanann's ultrasound appointment was at 6.45 p.m. Nicole Atkinson stayed at their house to watch the girls, and she got there a little early. When Chris got home that afternoon after leaving Nikki's, they said he was very cold and standoffish and really wasn't even communicating. He wasn't excited at all about going to the ultrasound to find out the gender of the baby. Nicole said he didn't even acknowledge me at all. It's like I wasn't even there. And that's not normal for him. I mean, usually he always like gives me a hug or say, hey, how you doing? And then he'll go on his merry way. But that night, he didn't talk to me at all. 
During the ultrasound, Shanann reached for Chris's hand, and he did not even respond. As they left the office, they were handed a sealed envelope with the baby's gender inside. When Chris and Shanann got back home, Shanann handed the sealed envelope to Nicole Atkinson, and she was going to hang on to it and open it at their upcoming gender reveal party. And then, later that night, Shanann had a really big argument with Chris, and she called Nicole and she said, I've canceled the gender reveal party. She asked Nicole, can you just tell me what I'm having? Nicole said, she said, I, I need some happy news. Nicole said she told her, well, yeah, I can. Are you sure? Nicole offered just to drive over and just tell her in person. Shanann told her, no, we'll just wait till tomorrow morning. While Chris was in the basement talking to Nikki, Shanann made a group text with Cassie and Josh Rosenberg and Nicole. They actually talked about the Rosenbergs are going to be moving into 2825 Saratoga Trail with Chris and Shanann because Shanann said she would no longer be able to support three kids alone in Colorado. Cassie told her, we've got this girl. Nicole told Shanann, believe me, you're going to come out of this stronger and better. You're not alone. Shanann replied, I love you ladies. And then Shanann pointed out that the mortgage was in Chris's name. Cassie Rosenberg replied and said, fuck him. You get the kids. You can't go without a home. Everything will work out right. On Thursday morning, just after 6 a.m., Shanann sent Chris a text. She told him that she still wanted to repair their marriage. She was trying to get him to open up so she could figure out what caused his sudden change. She asked him, do you want to find out with me tonight, together, what the baby's gender is? Chris replied, yeah. Shanann replied and said, well, please take five minutes today and write me and tell me how you're feeling. I love you, Chris, more than you know. It was that same morning that Chris deleted his Facebook account. He was trying to get everything together because he knew he was going to be starting a new life with Nikki Kessinger. When Ronnie, his dad, asked him if he had really deleted his Facebook, Chris replied saying, yes, sir, liberated. At 11.45 a.m., Chris sent Shanann a very odd photograph of one of the girls' life-size doll laying on a sofa. And the doll had a sheet covering it, like it was some kind of a burial shroud. Shanann, being very puzzled about the picture, she immediately posted it on Facebook, and she said, I don't know what to think about this. After posting the very odd photo of the doll, Shanann then sent an ultrasound picture to her friend, Sarah. She also sent a photo of a letter that she had written to Chris, and she told Sarah that she hoped that he would reply. My dearest Chris, I don't know where to begin. I'm so lost for words. I can't even explain how hard this pain is. The last five weeks has been the hardest. I miss everything about you. I missed your morning breath, your touch, your lips and kisses. I missed holding you and I missed smelling you in the sheets. I missed talking to you in person. I missed seeing you laugh and play with the kids. I love that so much about you. And I miss seeing you naked and on top of me making love to me. Oh my God. I missed having you around when I felt alone and upset. I just flat out missed the hell out of you. We haven't been away from each other that long since 2012. I really don't know how we even fell out of compatibility or if it's someone else's words. The only thing that changed this was everything going down with your family. I can't change what happened, but I can try to work things out with you and them. But there's got to be a mutual respect with everyone. I definitely deserve an apology because of Celeste. I can suck up her saying everything I go against about our kids, but our daughter's life? After Shanann wrote the letter, she went on Amazon and she ordered a book by best-selling author Sue Johnson. It was a best-selling self-help book titled Hold Seven Conversations for a Lifetime of Love. She set it up to where it would be delivered to Chris on Saturday while Shanann was in Scottsdale, Arizona. She also bought an ebook of it for her phone so they could read it together and they would be on the same page. On Thursday afternoon, Shanann made arrangements and set everything up for Bella to start back to school on Monday. Bella had missed almost all of the summer semester and she was really looking forward to going back and seeing her friends again. 
Although Chris usually left early for work on Monday mornings, the Nan asked him could he be a little later getting to work on Monday because she wanted him to be there too for Bella's first day of pre-K kindergarten. Chris texted her back and said, oh yeah, I can make that happen. That night, Chris and Shanann had their very own gender reveal party, which she did record, and later she posted it on Facebook. Shanann seemed very upbeat and positive and happy for the first time in weeks. Nico Lee Watts, Shanann texted Cassie Rosenberg, but we're not going to tell the world until Monday. Tonight has been the best talk yet. At around 10.30 that night, Shanann's friend Sarah texted her and said, how did Chris react to the letter? Shanann replied back to her and said Chris had now agreed to try to work things out. Shanann said, we talked. We had a really great talk, and he told me he loved me. He loved me back. He's still acting a little cold, but not as cold. He even gave me a kiss before he went to the basement to go to sleep. Once Chris got in the basement, he called Nikki Kessinger, and they talked for more than an hour. When he got off the phone with Nikki, he Googled, the prices for an Audi Q7 car. After he Googled the Audi, transferred his next big batch of nude selfies from Kessinger into the calculator app. That concludes chapter 25. Going into chapter 26, it is titled, Sweet Dreams, My Sexy Empanada. On Friday at 4.30 p.m., Nicole Atkinson picked up Shanann to take her to the airport for their training weekend in Scottsdale, Arizona. For Lavelle. Before she left, she went into the basement to get a hug from Chris, and then she came back upstairs and left a handwritten letter on the kitchen counter for Chris. And then she rolled her suitcase out the door where Nicole was waiting in the car. While she was waiting to board the plane, she texted Chris. She said, thank you for everything last night. I miss and love you so much. I'm still in shock that we're having a little boy. I'm so excited and happy. I really thought it was another girl. And thank you for letting me hold you this morning. It felt good. Your letter is on the counter. Instead of reading Shanann's letter, Chris called Nikki, and they set up a date for Saturday night. He told her that Shanann was out of town on a business trip, and he was going to get a babysitter for Bella and Celeste. When he got off the phone with Nikki, he called his friend Jeremy Lindstrom, and he asked him if his 17-year-old daughter would be available to babysit for him Saturday evening and Saturday night. He told Jeremy that he had won a raffle for tickets to go to a Rockies game Saturday night. The flight to Phoenix, Arizona was two hours, and during that two hours, while Shanann was on the flight, she read the book, Hold Me Tight. She told her friend Nicole Atkinson that Chris would be getting his copy of that book tomorrow. When their flight landed, they took a taxi and went to the Embassy Suites Hotel, which is where their training sessions was going to be held. When all of her friends from Thrive seen her, they were all shocked by her state and the way she looked. They said she looked a wreck instead of the usual ray of sunshine that she always was, and she wasn't eating or drinking properly. And all of her Thrive friends spent the whole weekend trying to coax her to eat and drink. Shanann was sharing a room with Cassie Rosenberg, and once she was in there, she took a selfie of her baby bump, and she put a little photo on it, and it said, a 15-week baby is the size of an orange. Also from the hotel, Shanann messaged her realtor, Ann Meadows. She told her realtor that her and Chris were thinking about moving to Brighton or to Fort Lupton. Shanann said, hey, love, Chris and I would like to talk to you about possibly selling the house before I paint the baby's room and more. I think it's better to see where we're at and the options. She asked if maybe they could all meet somewhere early next week. But Anne texted her back and told her that first they would need to get pre-approval for another loan. It was around lunchtime and Shanann actually got a confirmation that Chris was delivered the book, Hold Me Tight. She then sent Chris a text and said, check the mail. And he did, but he took the unopened package that contained the book and threw it straight into the dumpster. Not long after that, Ronnie Watts, Chris's dad, sent Chris a text, and he was asking if him and Cindy could maybe text or FaceTime with Bella and Celeste after a little bit, since Shanann wouldn't be there that night. Ronnie said, do you think that'll be a good idea? I mean, I don't want to get anything started. Chris replied to his dad saying, I don't think so, because Bella would probably tell her mom. Ronnie said, yeah, that's what I'm afraid of. 
And if she finds out that they seen us or we talked to them, then she would probably have a fit. Ronnie said, well, I don't want to make things worse. Just after 3 p.m. that same day, Chris pulled into the Safeway parking lot in Fort Lupton to meet up with Troy McCoy. Troy said that he had agreed to show Chris how to work his new Amazon Fire Stick. Troy said, yeah, Bella and Cece was in the back seat. They were happy and laughing. While Chris and Troy were talking, Troy received a call from Cody Roberts. Cody was also an operator at the Anadarko company, and he was part of the Anadarko team. He told Troy that there was a leak on a bypass line on the Survey 319 oil well, but it could wait until Monday to be fixed. Chris overheard their conversation, and he immediately just volunteered to go out to the Survey 319 oil well site and repair the leak first thing Monday morning, even though he had already promised Shanann that he would go with her to take Bella to her first day of pre-K kindergarten at Primrose Daycare and School. That night, Shanann had dinner with her Thrive friends at a place called the Yard House in Scottsdale, Arizona. Cindy Derisette, who was over that weekend's training, just could not believe the change in Shanann, and she told them about the problems that she was having in her marriage. Cindy said she was just so distraught and close to breaking down. She did not want to lose her marriage. Back at home, Chris fed the girls before he put them to sleep, and then he went online to plan his date with Nikki. While he was Googling which shows was up and coming at the Comedy Works in Denver, Shanann was searching Groupon for hotel deals in Aspen. She was hoping her and Chris could use this vacation to work on their marriage. She went ahead and booked a room for two the following weekend at a snow resort, and then at around 9 p.m., Chris called Nikki, and he told her that his divorce was proceeding very well, and that now him and Shanann had planned to split everything 50-50. He told Nikki that him and Shanann's transition was going to start on Monday when she returned from Scottsdale, Arizona. Nikki said it was like a sealed deal, getting everything finalized. They're splitting everything right down the middle on Saturday morning at 1240 a.m. Chris texts Nikki, I hope you had a great night, beautiful. Miss you. Get home safe. Sweet dreams, my sexy empanada. Early Saturday morning, Shanann messaged Chris. Good morning, baby. Are the girls up? Chris told her that they were in the bed watching cartoons. He then went on to text Shanann what his plans were for that night. He said, McKenna is coming to watch the girls tonight for a few hours while I go to that Rockies game. And then, at 9.30 a.m., Nikki started preparing heavily for her upcoming date with Chris. Nikki spent 45 minutes googling anal sex and how to prepare for it. Then she went over to Pornhub and she was looking for threesomes and double penetration and interracial porn. In Scottsdale, Arizona, Cassie Ro Rosenberg and Nicole Atkinson looked closely after Shanann all weekend. Shanann was complaining with dehydration, constipation, and bad migraines, which could have been all possible side effects of the oxycodone that Chris claimed he gave her. Shanann was taking Imitrex for her migraines, and Nicole Atkinson carried the water bottle around, trying to coerce Shanann into staying hydrated. Cassie was also a nurse, and she was very worried that Shanann's blood sugar might be dropping because she was not eating properly. Nicole said she would only just take like a couple of bites of her food and say she was just full. She can't eat no more. Nicole said normally we would just go out and, you know, check out the town, do things, but not that weekend. We just stayed in the hotel the entire weekend. Although Shanann did go to all the training sessions that weekend, she spent the majority and most of the time in the hotel room by herself reading the book Hold Me Tight on her phone. And she was writing another letter to Chris about how they could mend their marriage. Saturday evening at 4.25 p.m., Jennifer Lindstrom dropped her daughter off at Chris and Shanann's house so she could babysit Bella and Celeste while Chris went out, supposedly, to the Rockies game. When the babysitter walked in, Chris gave her a little tour of the house and told her where everything was at if she needed anything, and he already had Bella and Celeste in their PJs, and he went ahead and gave them their medication 
and told the babysitter to make sure and put them in the bed by 7 p.m. He also showed her the baby monitor, and they were hooked up to the cameras that were in their rooms, so she would be able to keep an eye on them while they were asleep. And then Chris ordered a pizza from Papa John's. McKenna said that Chris told her to distract the kids from seeing him leave while he did, so they didn't get upset and start crying and screaming for him when he left. All through the evening and night, Shanann texts McKenna, keeping a check on the girls. She even had McKenna take a photo of Celeste, which she then posted on Facebook. She also asked McKenna if she would babysit the following Friday, because her and Chris were going to Aspen for the weekend. When Chris left his house that night, he drove straight to Nikki's. That night, he was just dressed casually with a white t-shirt and jeans. He apologized to Nikki that he couldn't spend the night with her that night. He had to explain to her that the babysitter he had did not do overnight stays. After they had sex, Nikki weighed Chris so she could enter it into his fitness app that she had set up for him. Chris had lost 13 pounds since the beginning of July. He was now down to 180 pounds. Nikki said, I was really concerned because he was losing so much weight. She said it was kind of fast, and she said, it's like, oh my God, I think it's because he's doubling up on all that Thrive junk. Over dinner that night, they had a discussion about Chris renting a two-bedroom apartment when he moved out of his and Shanann's home. Nikki said she had already found a couple of really nice ones that was in his price range. But now Chris was telling Nikki that he could not afford a deposit. Nikki said, well, I was just trying to find a place to get him that would be nice and it would be close to where his ex-wife would be staying so he could have a good working relationship with her and the kids. When it was time to pay for the bill of their meal, Chris paid for it with his light blue credit card. Nikki said it was the card that was linked to his joint account with Shanann. She said that was the very first time that he hadn't used one of the Anadarko gift cards to pay for their dates. And he had to have known that she would see that charge. After their meal, they went back to Nikki's apartment and had sex again before he left to go home. He told Nikki he was sorry, but he had to be home by 10 p.m. because of the babysitter. That is when she would be leaving. Meanwhile, in Scottsdale, Arizona, Shanann in the hotel room, reading Hold Me Tight, she received an alert on her phone from her bank about the charge for the meal that Chris had just purchased on his date. And when she seen that Chris had spent $68 for his dinner, she thought that seemed really unusually high for just one person's dinner. A little after 10, Shanann texts McKenna to find out that Chris still wasn't at home, and Shanann had seen that Chris had had his dinner at the Lazy Dog restaurant earlier. The Lazy Dog restaurant, she knew, was only 15 minutes from their home, so she was wondering why Chris still hadn't gotten home after 10. So Shanann just called Chris, but by now Chris was already on his way home. Shanann asked him, what did you eat for dinner? And Chris told her, salmon and a beer. She went straight to the Lazy Dog website and looked at their menu, and she found out that a salmon and a couple of beers would actually cost less than $30. That made her immediately suspicious. And then Shanann sent him a text and asked him to keep the receipt from Lazy Dog so they could write it off of taxes. 